a pretty lovely, lovely good evening once again from here in Delhi and hope as always each one of you are fine, happy and of course in joyful mood. So coming directly to the business end, we are going to take up this particular formidable chapter, India's 102 and corresponding to International Financial Reporting Standard 2, Accounting for Share-Based Payment. Now as far as accounting for share-based payment is concerned, this happens to be a pretty formidable chapter, needless to add that, because since last four attempts, what we have seen that questions are striking, are striking every year with what we call almost great ferocity. So on such count, we take up this particular chapter, although this is not a very tough, but at the same time something where you need to pay a little bit of attention. So first of all, we need to understand what we mean by share-based payment transaction. What exactly share-based payment transaction? Many a student I have seen actually confused because their version of share-based payment is like where payment is only actually given by way of shares. No, nothing like that. What exactly share-based payment transactions are? First of all, pay attention over here. For example, we presume E1 is an entity and it enters into an agreement with a party, other party. Whensoever during the entire length and breadth of this particular chapter, I would say other party, you presume that I am referring to either a trader or a supplier or a manufacturer or simply an employee, an employee. Is it clear to you or not? Other party encompasses either a trader or supplier or a manufacturer or an employee. Another important aspect is that this entity enters into an ag agreement or arrangement with the other party whereby this particular entity is going to receive either goods or some services. Is it clear to you? And as per the agreement, other party is going to receive some payment, some payment from us. Now, if the payment, and this is the critical point, if the payment is in cash, because payment could be made in cash, that means this entity can make the payment in cash or this entity can make the payment by way of some other asset. It can deliver some other asset also. Or this entity can make the payment through equity instrument or simply what we call equity share. In whatever mode payment is being made, in whatever mode payment is being made, important point is that all these modes of payment must be based, must be based, must be based upon, must be based upon, that is very important, must be based upon current prices, upon current prices, upon current prices of the shares, of the shares of the entity itself. That means this entity can make these payments on the basis of current prices which are prevailing in the market of its own share. Correct? Or these payments must be based upon the current prices of the shares of the shares of the group to which this particular entity belongs. Correct? Of the group to which this particular entity belongs. That is the sole criteria. That being a uh, that means a transaction is considered as share-based payment transaction only when the other party is going to receive what we call some payment and I have been telling now and I have already told you so many times that payment could be either in cash or could be by way of other asset or, or could be what we call by way of equity instrument or simply what we call shares. But important criteria is that that payment must be based upon the current prices of the shares of the entity or of the group to which this particular entity belongs. Is it clear to you or not? Further, you also under, you must understand. So this is share-based payment transaction. Now you know the meaning of share-based payment transaction, SBT as we call it. Further, you should also know what we mean by share-based payment arrangement. Share-based payment arrangement, SBPA, share-based payment arrangement. What is share-based payment arrangement? Again, it is an arrangement or agreement between an entity, between an entity or between an entity of the group. It could be an arrangement between an entity of the group and other party or it could be an arrangement between the shareholder of the entity or of the group and the other party. So it could be an agreement between entity and the other party. It could be an agreement between entity of the group and other party. It could be an agreement between the shareholder of the entity or shareholder of the group and the other party. But the important point is that as per this agreement, the other party becomes entitled to receive some payments from you and that payments must be based upon the current prices of the shares 
of the entity or of the group to which this particular entity belongs. This is what we mean by share based payment arrangement. Is it clear to you? After what we call having a look over these basic aspects, further important point which you need to understand is that there are some transactions which are not covered by India's 102. Prominent among, although they look like what we call share based payment transaction, the prominent among one is, prominent among them is transaction with shareholder as a whole. When an entity actually, let us say there is an entity and it offers rights shares, rights shares to all the shareholders, to all the shareholders, including employees, because some of the employees may be what we call shareholders. So even though in this particular case, entity is going to offer shares to the employee, no doubt about that. And obviously, we must have received some services against the, uh, from the employee. So logically, it looks like a, what we call share-based payment transaction because in this particular case, entity is offering them equity shares. Correct? But problem is that this time, this transaction is not employee-specific. It is not employee-specific. This time, entity is entering into an arrangement with the shareholder as a whole. So that is why it will not be considered as a share-based payment transaction. And second important point is that transaction in which actually entity receives goods as a part of the net assets that are acquired under a business, business uh, combination. For example, let us say entity 1 acquires the business of entity E2. Entity E1 acquires the business of entity E2. Now, obviously, in this case, entity is going to receive some net, net assets. And in the net assets, there will be several asset plant, machinery, stock, etc. And this time, entity is going to make the payment. And generally, the payment is made by way of shares. But the important point is that this time, we are getting goods and services on, as a part of net assets. And this transaction is because of what we call taking over the business of E2. So that means in this particular case, entity is acquiring goods as a part of net assets which are being acquired through a business transaction, business combination. So that is why, again, it will be not considered as a share-based payment transaction. These are the points which you need to understand first of all. Now, coming over to the important aspects of this particular chapter now, obviously, because when we are going to do this particular chapter, we need to understand the, another important aspect of recognition and measurement. Actually, what you need to recognize, first of all, you need to understand that whenever we are going to say that we are going to do recognition. So logically, under share based payment transaction, we have already seen that one party is going to receive the goods and services while the other party is going to receive some consideration against the same. Isn't it or not? So when we say recognition, it means we are talking about recognition of goods and services received and obtained. And at the same time, we are talking about the recognition of corresponding corresponding consideration which the entity is transferring to the other party. Isn't it? Now, important point is that which I just told you earlier, that payment could be payment or consideration could be in cash or other assets or it could be by way of equity instrument. This is the important point which you need to take care of. The payment by an entity to the other party could be either in cash or other asset, or it could be by way of equity instrument. So <clears throat> after this, now we are going to take into account types of plus. Basically, based upon the payment, there are two types of share-based payment plans. There are two types of share-based payment plan. Obviously, one plan will be based upon the fact that when the, when the payment is being made by way of cash or what we call other asset. If you are making the payment by way of cash or other asset, it is known as cash settled plan. It is known as cash settled plan. Here I have written also when payment is made in cash or other assets, in that case, it is known as cash settled plan. And likewise, if the payment is in the form of what we call equity instrument, it will be known as equity settled plan. Is it clear to you? Obviously, under cash settled plan, we will see that generally the entry which we are going to pa pass will be goods and services account debit because we are receiving goods and services account debit to liability account. And ultimately, this liability will be settled by way of cash. That means under cash settled plan, we are, at, we are under an obligation to pay cash or what we call deliver cash. Is it clear to you? That is why it is considered as liability. While under equity settled plan, under equity settled plan, we are going to write entry for receiving goods and services. We are going to debit it. And now we are going to write here to equity because equity generally is not considered as a liability, although we are under an obligation to issue the equity shares. Is it clear to you? So basically two types of plans are there. Accordingly, this particular chapter is fanned into two broad categories, equity settled plan and what we call cash settled plan. 
First, we will take up equity settled plan. As I've already told you, under equity settled plan, basically the payment is made by way of equity instruments. Correct? So we pick up one question to just understand the intricacy of this particular plan. Here it is given to you that 9X Limited granted 100 shares to each of its 300 employees on 1-4-2020. On 1-4-2020, on X Limited is granting what we call 100 options to 300 employees, provided that they stay in the organization for the next three years. So they will, and there is a condition stipulated in it, as you know that generally under such situations, some condition is attached. Here the employee are being asked that you need to actually stay in the organization for three years. And after that, we are going to offer you what we call 300. We are going to offer each employee 100 share and the total there are 300 employees. Further, it is written fair value per share is rupees 20. Fair value per share is 20 and this is the point I have seen most of the student actually do not know quite exactly the way they should have understood it. That is the point is. In order to comprehend this particular point, first of all, pay attention here. In this particular case, what is happening on 1-4-2020, isn't it? That's the date actually. On 1-4-2020, we presume that this here is the date on 1-4-2020. So it is the date on which entity enters into an arrangement with the employee correct or an agreement with the employee that you are going to you are going to be offered some shares correct you are going to be offered some shares but these shares will be offered to you only after completion of three years that means you will have to stay in the organization and you will have to serve the organization for the next three years that with one two and three so for three years you will have to serve the organization and once you will have served the organization for three years, after that, we will, entity is telling to its 300 employee, as we have already seen that there are 300 employees in this particular case. An entity is telling that each employee will be granted 100 options or 100 shares. Read options as shares. As you know better than I, because most of you have already done this particular chapter by now, we call it option simply because of the fact that employees are having a prerogative, a choice, whether they want to take up these shares or not. So that's why it is known as option. So here option stands for shares only. So company has entered into an agreement with the employee whereby employee are being asked to stay in the organization for three years. And after the three years would be completed, then employee will become entitled to get what we call promised 100 options per employee. That means each employee will, will get what we call 100 option. This scheme was granted on this particular date. As you know, this particular date is known as grant date. I need not require to remind you. This is known as grant date. The date on which entity enters into an agreement with the employee or the date on which a scheme is announced. As per this particular scheme, you have already seen that uh, employees are going to stay in the organization for next three years. You also know that this three year period is also known as vesting period. It is known as vesting period. It is known as vesting period. And, the, and in between the date of, in between the grant date and the end of the vesting period, we will have in this case three accounting years. Correct? Three accounting years. Accounting year one will end at the end of year one, two will at the end of year two and accounting year end will also end at the third year. So that means in between the vesting period, we are having three accounting year. Important point is that at the end of each accounting year, we have to do some accounting. What sort of accounting do we need to do? But before that, you need to understand actually the meaning of fair value. What we mean by fair value? This is the point which you need to understand and many a time I have seen actually do not know exactly the meaning of fair value and that's the reason actually they commit a lot of mistake. Fair value. First of all, you need to understand that entity is entering into an agreement with the employee. An entity is, entity is telling to the employee that you stay in the organization for the next three years. If you are going to stay in the organization for the next three years, we are going to offer you 100 options. Correct. And 100 options or 100 share will be given to you at a fair value of 20. What does this fair value means? It means, it means after the end of the vesting period, after the end of the vesting period, whensoever these employees are going to exercise, exercise their rights, that means whensoever employee are going to purchase these options. So whatever may be the market price on that particular date, let us say these 300 employees have completed the service. Let us say for a while, correct? 
So and each employee is getting 100 options. So total 30,000 option entity will have to provide them. Now entity is telling them that if you are going to stay in the organization for three years, which they have already done as we are presuming. Now after that, they will become entitled to actually purchase these options. Now entity had promised them that whensoever you are going to purchase these options, we are going to actually give you a fair value of 20. What does it mean? It means actually whatever may be the market price, whatever may be the market, market price, we are going to give you this much of compensation. Let us say market price is 150 for simply simplicity's sake the day on which these employees are going to exercise the what we call option presuming that on that date in the market the price of the share is 150 so as per the as per this agreement employee need not require to pay 150 to buy these option they need to pay only 130 and this 130 which would be paid by employee will be termed as exercise price and this 20 is considered as fair value. So fair value basically here stands for the discount for the concession. You may say so. Is it clear to you? No. So basically fair value is nothing but it is the difference between the market price and exercise price. Exercise price is the price which would be paid by the employee to actually get the option. Is it clear to you or not? So first of all, you need to understand very, very deeply the meaning of fair value before you are able to understand the entire complexities which are associated with this particular chapter. So having thorough with this particular aspect, now we move further with it in this particular case. So, so far, the storyline of this particular question is that on 1-4-2020, the scheme was granted. Employees are being asked to stay in the organization for three years. Is it clear to you? Now, further, it is given in the question that at the end of the second year, 30 employees left their scheme. So, sometime it happens that some employees feel that they may not be able to cope up with the terms and condition. So, though, so they simply actually leave the scheme. 30 employees left their scheme. That means it is not given at the end of the first year how many employees left. It is not given, but it is definitely given that 30 employees left at the end of the second year. How many employees left at the end of the second year? 30. 30 employees have left in the second year. Further, it is given in the question that 20 more employees left by the end of the third year. 20 more employees left at the end. That means by the end, actually 50 employees have left because 30 left already and not 20 more employees left by the end of the third year. Now, under share-based payment transaction, we have to do the accounting. What sort of accounting we have to do? Because in this particular case, what is happening that entity, in simple words, is entering into an agreement with the employees to serve the organization for the next three, next three years. That means directly or indirectly, entity is receiving the benefit in the form of services. And entities compensating the employees by giving them giving them some shares at a concessional value this is the point which you need to understand that mean the crux of the story is that entity is receiving some what we call benefits entity is receiving some benefits in the form of services number one an entity for the same is actually offering them some what we call options some shares you may say so this is the important point and in order to issue the options, entity will have to incur some losses. You can say so losses, actually we will not call them losses as we will see later on. Correct? Because on each share company which going to issue, because company is going to issue 100 options to each of the employee. And on one particular option, entity will have a loss of rupees 20. Because company is offering the option at a concession of rupees 20. So, all in all, I want to say is that whenever company, whenever an entity actually offers such a scheme, ultimately entity has to incur some losses. But instead of calling them losses, we'll call them as expenses. Because here company against this particular concession is receiving the benefits. So it should not be called as a loss. It should be considered as a sort of what we call expense. Is it clear to you? Ultimately, we have to recognize the expense. So how we have to recognize the expense, that's the area where you need to focus upon. In order to recognize the expenses, first of all, what we have to do, we'll have to make a table like this. End of year one, end of year two, end of year three. And first of all, you always presume that now you have reached the end of the year. At the end of the year, you will have to visualize actually what will be your total expenses. I mean to say, 
even though you are going to do the accounting at the end of the first year but at the end of the first year you will have to actually visualize the future scenario so you will have to visualize how many employee would ultimately complete the scheme because unless and until you would not know how many employees would complete complete the scheme you will not know how many options you will have to issue how many total options you will have to issue and unless and until you will not know how many options which your entity need to actually issue you cannot compute the total expenses and total expenses will be total option issued into fair value so that is the reason basically what you are doing as under the accounting at the end of the first year first of all you need to visualize how many employees are going to complete the scheme so because at this moment you are at the end of the year one so and you are having 300 employees and it is not given in the question that at the end of the at the end of the first year how many employees are going to leave the what we call organization so quite obviously as a human being you are going to visualize that all the 300 employees are going to complete the scheme so in your opinion at the end of the one year because at this moment second year is not in front of you isn't it or not so at the end of the year one you may think actually that ultimately 300 employees are going to actually complete the scheme and you will have to offer them 100 options and on each option you are going to have a loss of 20 so total expenses which this entity will have to incur on this particular scheme will be equal to 6 lakh this is how we have to visualize the total scenario so once you have visualized that total expenses will be equal to 6 lakh now you will write here proportion what we mean by proportion when i say proportion it means the proportion of the accounting year out of the total accounting year i already told you the total accounting year will be equal to 3 because this time the storyline is for 3 years and you have already reached the end of the first year that means 1 by 3 will be considered as the proportion then you will write here cumulative expenses recognized cumulative expenses recognized means how much expense out of the total expense which you would recognize at the end of the first year because total expenses for three years will amount to rupees six lakh so and accounting year one is having a proportion of one by three so quite obviously by the end of the first year you must recognize an expense of rupees two lakh Actually, I have written here previously recognized because this is your first year. Nothing has been recognized earlier. So that means expenses which you are going to actually book in the current year will amount to rupees 2 lakh. This is how you need to present your answer. Is it clear to you? Now you will come into the, at the, now you will reach the end of the second year. At the end of the second year, now you come to know that out of 300 employees, 30 employees have already left because you have already reached the end of the second year. Now the correct and actual picture and actual facts are before you so now you know actually there are only 270 employees so if there are only 270 employees you are visualizing that that mean we will have to issue shares to 270 employees only and per share loss will be equal to 20 so total expenses will be equal to 5 lakh 40 thousand so this 5 lakh 40 thousand will be considered as expenses of three years not of second and third year don't don't be under this confusion is it clear to you or not in your first year you thought that total expenses will be equal to six lakh but at the end of second year now you have re-estimated your expenses in the light of what we call latest facts now you presume that total expenses will be equal to five lakh forty thousand so total expenses will amount to five lakh forty thousand for three years ultimately because now you have to offer hundred shares 100 shares to 270 employees, 100 into 270 and on one share you are having a fair value of 20 that means your total loss or total expenses will be equal to 5,40,000. So total expenses for 3 years is equal to 5,40,000 now. Now because your second year has already gone by so you are going to find out how many how much of those actually you must recognize by the end of the second year you simply multiply it by 2 by 3. So you will get at 360 is the amount of expense which you should recognize by the end of the second year. 
by the end of the second year. That means out of 5,40,000 total expenses, you must recognize 3,60,000 by the end of the second year. But out of 360, 2 lakhs already you have recognized in the first year. That means in second year, you are, you are going to book an expense of rupees 1,60,000. This is the point which you need to understand. Is it clear to you? Now, when you reach the third year end, you found that actually out of 350 employees have left, 30 in the second year, 20 in the final year. Ultimately, that means now you will have to offer shares to 250 employees, 250 into 100 options, and per option fair value is 5 lakh. Fair value is nothing but the concession or the discount which is being offered by the entity. So, ultimately, now you figure out that total expenses of three years coming out to be 5 lakh only. And out of 5 lakh, entire 5 lakh must be recognized by the end of the third year and out of 5 lakh we have already recognized 3 lakh 60 thousand worth of expense 2 lakh in the first year 1 lakh 60 in the second year that means total 360 is already recognized so in the final year we are going to recognize an expense of 1 lakh 40 thousand this is the point which you need to understand what will be the entry then that means when we say we are recognizing an expense of rupees 2 lakh, that means at the end of the first year, obviously, we are going to recognize an expense of 2 lakh. And here I am going to write two share based payment reserve account. And in bracket, I am going to write equity because we are at the end of the first year. And at the end of the first year, we know that we are supposed to issue what we call equity instruments. But these shares will be issued only at the time of what we call when employees are going to exercise their rights. Isn't it or not? So till then, it is a, till then, this equity instrument are actually, uh, you can say, a sort of what we call reserve. They are kept in reserve because we have to issue them later on. That is why we never write straight away equity. We directly write share based payment reserve account. That means it is the equity in reserve which we are going to issue later on. And similarly, in the second year, you are going to pass the same entry, but the amount will be this much. And in the third year, you are going to pass out this particular entry. Is it clear to you or not? This is how you have to pass the entry. And ultimately, when you are going to issue the shares, then your an entry, then your entry will be what? Because then you will write share base payment equity account debit to equity account. That means all those equity which was kept in reserve now has been issued. Is it clear to you? This is the way you will have to uh, go through. Now, study case study. 5.2 T1 Limited granted to its employees share option with a fair value of rupees 5 lakh. This time it is given actually total employee compensation expenses are already given to you. Question is telling T Limited granted to its employees share options with a fair value of 5 lakh. That means all the option which entity is granting to the employee all the options which entity is granting to the employee it is having a total fair value of 5 lakh total fair value of 5 lakh means the total concession given on these options is equal to 5 lakh that means indirectly employee compensation expenses are already at your disposal in this particular case correct further it is given a scheme is granted on 1 for 2018 and shares shall be offered provided employee remain with the organization up to 31st of 3 2021 as you must have noticed that in this particular case also because the scheme was granted on 1 for 2018 correct your first year will end on 31st of 3 2019 and your second year will end on 31st of 3 2020 and finally your third year will end on 31st of 3 2021 isn't it or not? So that means again the storyline is extending for the three years. This vesting period will be actually three years in this case. Further, it is given in the question on 31st of 3, 2019, that is end the end of the first year, entity is expecting that only 91% of the employees are going to complete the option. Now it is as simple as 10. It is as simple as that because ultimately your total options is given to you as 5 lakh. Total employee expenses are already given to you. This time you are. it is not given in the question how many employees are there. And per employee options, it is not given in the question. You are directly given that total option will be, even, that, even total option is not given. But let us say total option is equal to X. So multiply it with fair value. So their value is given to you. 
So that means we are more concerned with the value. So total value, that means total employee compensation, that means everything is given to you, number of employee into per employee into fair value, in total, total expenses amounting to actually 5 lakhs. So it is given to you already in this question. Now it is given that only 91% employee are going to actually complete the scheme. So quite obviously, because if 100% employee would have completed the scheme, in that case, expenses would have been equal to 5 lakh. But now you visualize at the end of the first year that only 91% employees are going to cover the scheme. So quite obviously that means total expenses for three years will be equal to this much. So that is how you are going to actually do the solution. So in this case, total employee expenses are already given to you as I told you 5 lakh. But since it is given that at the end of the first year, entity finds that only 91% employee are going to actually complete the scheme. So all in all, it means the total employee compensation expenses of the scheme would amount to actually 4,55,000. And out of that one third, you are going to recognize correct cumulatively at the end of the first year. We generally first write cumulative expenses recognized. Of course, nothing has been recognized prior to that. So that means in the current year, we are going to actually recognize 1,51,667. Likewise, at the end of the second year, when I'm going to reach, again, I will, I will think this way around. Now, because it is given to you that at the end of the second year, entity thinks that only 89% employee are going to complete the scheme, only 89%. So that means when I'm going to reach the end of the second year, now I will visualize that because only 89% employees are going to actually complete the scheme. So quite obviously, entity will have to incur in total 4,45,000 as expense. So these are the expenses for three years period. Don't be under an impression that these are the expenses only for second and third year because you are visualizing at the end of second year that total expenses of the scheme will be equal to 4,45,000. So by the end of second year, you are going to recognize this much of expense and whatever you have recognized in the previous year, you are going to subtract the same and you will be left off with 145. Quite obviously, this is the amount which you are going to book as an expense, correct, in the what we call second year. And likewise, at the end of the third year, it is given in the question, only 82% employees remained in the organization. So by the end of the third year, now actual facts are before you that even though total employee expenses are 5 lakh, but since 82% employees are covering the scheme, so entity will have to incur total expense of 4 lakh 10,000. So entire 4 lakh 10,000 must be recognized by the end of the third year and out of that 2 lakh 96,667 already recognized. So quite obviously, this is the amount which you are going to recognize at the end of the third year. As far as entries are concerned, I've already told you, your entry only will be at the end of each year, employee compensation expense account debit to share base payment reserve account. Of obviously, the amount will differ. So these are the entries you are going to pass. And at the end of the third year, because your total expenses are 4,10,000, so entity will have to deliver whensoever, whensoever these options would be exercised, correct? After the end of the third year, when options shall be exercised, that means whensoever employees are going to exercise the option, at that time entity will deliver this particular entry. entity. Uh, entry, a share based payment reserve equity account debit because whatever equity which we had kept in reserve is now being delivered to the employees. Is it clear to you? This is what we mean by cash uh, equity settled plan. Coming over to the next plan. Now, next plan is cash settled plan. Cash settled plan. Under the cash settled plan, what we are supposed to do, I already told you what is the cash settled plan. When and there is an agreement between the party and the what we call entity that payment will be delivered by way of cash. So in this question, it is given to you 101 limited issued 11,000 stock appreciation right. Actually, stock appreciation right is nothing but simply options. Correct. It is known as option or share. But why it is called as stock appreciation right or in short form SAR? A stock appreciation right, that means the option which entity is offering to the employee, these options are appreciating in appreciating in the sense that whensoever actually market price will increase, some benefit will be delivered to you. That is why it is known as stock appreciation rights. All the cash settled plan, to be honest with you, are nothing but stock appreciation rights. You must understand this. So it is nothing new. You read stock appreciation rights simply as shares. So 101 Limited issued 11,000 stock appreciation rights on 1-4-2021. 
and these rights shall waste in cash it is clearly given in the question so it is needless to add that it happens to be a cash settled plan further it is given fair value of the sar on the grant date is actually 100 now this time the difference between equity and cash settled plan is that under cash set under equity settled plan generally there is no change in the fair value once the fair value is decided it remains same throughout however under cash settled plan because these under cash settled plan directly or indirectly actually it is nothing but stock appreciation rights and here the entity simply is telling directly or indirectly or impliedly correct that some benefit of the rise in prices will be passed to you so that is why this stock is appreciating in nature so that means here under cash settle plan we will have different different fair values for different year for example uh, first of all let me actually explain here on 1 4 2021 scheme is granted number one it is also given to you that fair value on the grant date so on the grant date fair value is given to you as 100 on the grant date fair value is 100 further it is also given it is expected that out of total employees 94 percent shall stay in the organization correct till the end of 31st of 3 2024 so that means our first year will end on 31st of 3 2022 our second year is going to end on 31st 31st of 3 2023 and finally our third year will end on 31st of 3 2024 so instead of telling that storyline is of three year question is simply telling you that this are is going to actually waste upon the employee only at the end of 31st of 3 2024 is it clear now it is also given it is expected that out of total employees 94 percent shall stay in the organization that means when entity reach the end of the first year at the end of the first year entities of the opinion that only 94 percent employee are going to actually only 94 percent employee are going to complete the scheme this is the opinion of the entity also it is given in the question however expectation got revised to 94 per 91 percent at the end of the second year so at the end of the second year now this estimation is revised to 91 percent so now entity thinks that only 91 percent employee are going to actually complete their scheme and finally further on 31st of 3 2024 it is expected that only 85 percent employee would be there so finally on this date we may say that 85% employee completed the scheme because now third year has gone by. Now, as you must have noticed, actually, in this particular question, which was not given or which would never be available in case of equity settled plan. Under cash settled plan, generally, you will be given fair value. So here, different fair value is given. And this fair value is given because of changes in the market prices, which will not be given in the question. Correct? Obviously, now fair value is changing at the end of the because when we announce the scheme, at that time, we promised to the employee that we are going to give you a concession of 100. But now, at the end of the first year, this concession has gone up to 132. That means some benefit is being passed to employees. Similarly, now the concession has gone up to 139 at the end of the what we call second year. And by the time we reach the third year, this concession has moved up to 141. That means, ultimately, employee will get a concession of 141. Even in this particular question, we are simply given that company is going to issue 11,000 options. Generally, how we get the figure of option? We multiply number of employees. We multiply number of employees with options per employee. With options per employee to know how many options entity is going to issue. Actually, instead of all these two figures, entity has directly given that it is going to issue 11,000 stock options or stock appreciation rights. So that, that means how many option entity is going to issue that is already given to you. So you need not do any computation. So at the end of the first year, at the end of the first year, I know that ultimately entity has to issue 11,000 options. Entity has to issue 11,000 options. But these 11,000 options would have been issued by the entity only if 100% employee would have completed the scheme. Now, because it is given in the question only 94% employees are going to cover the scheme, that means 11,000 into 94%. 
So this much of option ultimately entity will have to issue. And at the end of the first year fair value is 132. So this will be the total expenses. Correct. So that is how you are going to compute the amount of total expenses over three years period. Remember one thing you are at the end of the first year. Now you have visualized that ultimately we, we will have to issue 11,000 into 94 percent option. And on each option, since fair value is 132 at this particular moment, correct? Because you are at the end of the first year. So at the end of the first year, you may think that by the end of the third year, this much of expenses entity will have to incur. And out of that, cumulatively, you are going to recognize this much of expense. And even this figure, you are going to book as what we call expense in the current year. Correct? In the current year, you are going to book an expense of 4,54,960 along with the liability. Now you will reach the end of the second year. And when you are going to re when you are going to reach the end of the second year, now you will find that actually 91% employee are going to uh, complete their scheme. So you are going to multiply it with 91%. So that means at the end of the second year, you are under an impression that only this much of what we call option entity will have to offer to the employee. And each option this time will have to uh, be issued at a concession of 139. So ultimately total expenses will amount to this much, correct? And out of these, this much of expense must be recognized by the end of the second year. And since we have already recognized 4,54,960 at the end of the first year, so that means this much of the amount which we need to recognize actually at the end of the second year. Likewise, we move into the third year because now it is clearly given in the question 85% employees are completing the scheme. So you are going to simply write 11,000 into 85%, which means this much is the amount of option which the entity will have to offer. And since fair value at the end of the third year is 149, you will have to multiply it with that to know what exactly will be your total expenses. So ultimately, now you come out with the facts that total expenses of the scheme for three years period is this much. So quite obviously, at the end of the third year, you need you need to recognize this much of what we call amount. But out of that, 9,27,594. This is nothing but total of the expenses which you have already recognized by the second year. So you have already recognized. So ultimately, you are going to recognize this much of expense. In this case, the entry will be, say here, entry will be employee compensation expense account debit to share based payment liability account in case of cash settled plan we have to write this entry each year of course with the amount which you have already booked and whensoever these shares or whensoever actually these options will be exercised at that time entity is going to pass an entry share based payment liability account debit to cash account because ultimately entity will have to actually issue cash against the same is it clear to you or not? After having done that, now we come over to the important part of this particular chapter. And these are the questions from your latest uh, examinations. And uh, I've included here all the examinations which have conducted under new syllabus so far. So all the questions. So first I will begin off with NSQ June 2024, because most of you are more fam interested in this particular question. But before we attempt that, first of all, let me allow me to have a break of break of seven minutes seven minutes after seven minutes i will meet you in the meantime i will take up my tea and recontinue so welcome again now we are going to pick up first of all nsq june 24 examination question is it clear to you so as far as solution of this question is concerned needless to add now i have started giving you the solution so soon you will have lots of what we call solution videos of the same anyway let's have a look over here Z Limited grants 200 options to each, 200 options to each of its 100 employees conditional on their continuing in the service for three years and fair value of the option on the grant date is 60. So, so far, this is the storyline of the question. So, 200 options are being given to 800 employees and fair value is actually 60. Now it is stated in the question during year one. Now, at the end of year one, it is given to you at the end of year one, 36 employees leave the organization. How many employees have actually left? 36 employees have left. Now entity revises its estimates of total employee departure over three year period from 20 to 16%. That means in the beginning of the year, when entity announced the scheme and at that time entity announced the scheme for 800 employees and each employees will get 200 options this was the scheme originally 
this was the scheme originally is it clear to you or not <clears throat> now in the beginning of the year when entity announced the scheme the scheme is for 3 years it is also given and at that time the fair value in the beginning of the fair value is actually 60 <clears throat> So, in the beginning of the year when entity announced the scheme, that when indirectly it told to employees that whensoever you are going to exercise the option, we will grant you a fair value of 60. Correct? Uh, we will give you a concession of 60. Now, when entity reached the end of the first year, uh, during year 136 employees leave and the entity revises its estimate of total departure over the three period from 20% to 16%. What does it mean? That means initially when entity announced the scheme, it was, it was under the option that perhaps 20% employees would leave. Generally, it happened when an entity actually announces the scheme, entity tried to estimate actually exactly how many employees would be there by the end of the what we call vesting period. So at that time, entity might have visualized that only 20% employee would leave the what we call scheme. But when entity reached the end of the first year, at the end of the first year, entity found that actually 36 employees left the organization. And now what is happening, entity is estimating that 16% employee would complete the scheme. Only 16% employee would complete the scheme. First of all, you need to understand this point very carefully. This, this is vital task. This is the most important task. What does it mean that entity thinks that only 16% is going to complete the scheme? How many employees are there? Sir, 800 employees are there. If suppose I am going to ask you, compute 16% of this. You are going to compute 16% of this. What will be the figure? The figure will be equal to, I will have to compute it that will be equal to 800 i'm not taking live today so that is the problem 800 into 16 percent that comes to 128 as per my calculation my calculation may be wrong sometime sometime it happens because i have to simultaneously do the calculation in case if sometime there is misprint or some miscalculation you correct it by yourself you don't require to send me messages for the same so 128 employees entity thinks would leave the organization at the end of the first year come Entity is estimating that only 16% employee at the end of the first year entity thinks now that only 16% employee would leave the organization by the end of the third year. So that means out of 800 employees entity is of the opinion that 128 employees would leave the organization. Indirectly it means if I am going to subtract from 800 128 I think it will be equal to 672. It will be equal to 672. That means entity thinks that 672 employees are going to complete their scheme. So that means you can also understand it this way. At the end of the first year, actual employee left 36. So you can also write it this way, expected to leave. How many more employee entity thinks would leave the organization? Because you have just computed that out of 800 employees, only 62 employees would would be there by the end of the third year because entity is estimating that out of 800 employees 128 more employees uh, ultimately 128 employees would leave the organization you are not getting my point there are total 800 employees at the end of the first year at the end of the first year entity thinks that by the time we are going to actually reach the third year by the time we are going to reach the third year 16 percent employee would leave that mean total 128 employees would leave at the end of the first year, we are opining this. Is it clear to you? That means entity is of the opinion that 800 minus 128, 672 employees are going to complete their scheme. That means we are of the opinion that out of 800, 128 employees would leave the organization. But actually out of 128, 36 employees have left. 36 employees have already left at the end of the first year. We are at the end of the first year. And we are thinking that ultimately 16% employee will leave. That means total employee who would leave the organization by the end of the third year. At the end of the first year, we are visualizing this scenario that 128 employees would leave. But out of 128, which we are thinking that would leave at the end of the first year, six, it is given in the question, 36 employees have already left, have already left. That means if I am going to subtract 36 employees from 128, I can say that 92 employees 
I am expecting more will leave the organization because at the end of the first year, 36 employees have already left and 92 employees, I am expecting more to leave. If I am going to add 36 and 92, it will be equal to 128 only. Is it clear to you or not? So, this is how your calculation should be based upon, which I have done it over here also. See here, at the end of the first year, there are total 800 employees. I have written here number of employees who would leave by the end of the vesting period. So at the end of the first year, I will think that total 128 employees would leave. But at the end of the first year itself, 36 employees have left. That means at the end of the first year, I would say 92 more employees would leave. So that is why ultimately 672 employees are going to complete the scheme. Is it clear to you or not? Is it clear? If it is clear, it is nice, then we move over to the next part. Under the next part, it is given during year two, 40 more employees left the organization. 40 more employees left the organization. But point is that entity revises its total employee departures over the three year period from 16% to 13%. That means when entity reach this third year, First of, sorry, reach the end of the second year, it is given that 40 employees actually left the organization. So entity thinks actually we have to revise the what we call our departure rates. Now entity thinks that over three year period, 13% employee are going to leave the organization. What does it mean? It means that at the end of the second year, when we would reach, first I will compute 800 into 13 percent. That means now I am thinking that in total over three years period 104 employees would leave the organization. In total, total 104 employees are going to leave the organization. This is what exactly I am going to think. Are you getting my point or not? At the end of the uh, at, at the end of the what we call second year. 104 employees. That means ultimately there will be uh, 800 minus 104, that, mean, that means 696 employees would leave the organization. This is what I will think. But problem is that at the end of the second year, we have seen that 40 employees have left. And now I am thinking 104 employees in total will leave the organization. That means 64 employees you can say are expected to leave or you can directly compute it this way. Because there are total employee 800. An entity is thinking that 13% employee will leave over the three year period. That means at the end of three year, 13% employee will leave the organization. That means at the end of the three year company, at the end of the year, company is thinking that 696 employees will be over there only. Is it clear to you or not? So this is how you will have to do the computation. And finally, during year three, a further 28 employees left. If further 28 employees have left the organization now, now at the end of the third year, further 28 employees have left because further 800 employees have left. So you need to understand it this way around. Actually left 36 in the first year. In the second year, actually left 28, uh, 40. And in the third year, it is given to you 28 employees have left. Now you have the complete picture before you that out of 800, actually 104 employees have left by the end of the third year. So that means ultimately by the end of the third year, we may say only 696 employees have completed their scheme. And this you can find out also this way from the total employees, you will have to subtract total employees actually who have left the scheme. Is it clear to you or not? So this is how your working should be. Further, it is given all the continuing employee exercise the option to subscribe equity shares of 10 each at rupees 100 only when market price is 160. This is also given to you in the question that all the continuing employees that mean whosoever were there who completed the scheme actually, they ultimately subscribe the share when market price was 160. Now, in this case, how to do the calculation of expenses? Now, in this particular case, first of all, as we have already seen and calculated that at the end of the first year, 670, we are of the opinion that 672 employees are going to complete the scheme. Ultimately, 672 employees, which I have computed here, 672 employees. 800 minus actually left minus expected to leave either you can do this way or simply you can do this way there are 800 employees <coughs> it is given to you that total 16 percent employee would leave the organization you simply subtract 16 percent of 800 from 800 you can still get 672 directly straight away 
is the clear to you ultimately 672 employees are going to complete the scheme you are going to offer them what we call 200 options and because it is given in the question i think fair value was 60 yes fair value 60 was given to you in the question so you are going to multiply it with 60 so this will be the total expenses over three years period of time so by the end of the first year you are going to recognize this much of expense is it clear to you or not by the end of the first year you are going to recognize this much of expense and obviously in the first year because nothing has been recognized in the earlier year you are going to recognize this much when you will reach the end of the second year 696 employees have completed the scheme which i have computed here and you can compute it also in a straight manner because now at the end of the second year entity thinks that there are 800 employees and out of 800 ultimately 13 percent employee will leave the organization if you are going to compute 13 percent of 800 and you will subtract it you can still get 696 696 is it clear to you? You can directly get also or you can do it in this manner as I've done over here. So ultimately 696 employees are going to complete the scheme. You will have to, you will have to offer them 200 option, fair value 60, two third. So by the end of the second year, this much of expenses must be recognized. And that means in the second year, we will have to recognize this much of expense. And by the end of the second year, again, Total expenses which we would recognize will be equal to 83,52,000. Is it clear to you? Cumulative expenses I am talking about. Is it clear to you? Cumulative expenses into 3 by 3 I have written. Because out of these expenses we have already recognized some expense in year 1 and 2. Then in the third year we have to recognize 27,84,000. So this is, all answers are correct actually. In this case, generally your institute hardly gives correct answers. And both these questions I have done in my regular classes. And if you want to do these questions, I will do it for you. I will take a first of all, an issue December 2021 paper. On 1-4-2027, OM Limited granted 50 option each to 2,100 employees at the rate of rupees 70 when the market price was 110. Correct. So, so far in this particular question, what is given to you that on 1-4-2017, 50 options are being granted to each of the 2,100 employees at a rate of rupees 70. At a rate of rupees 70 means employee will have to pay 70. Actually, this is your exercise price. This is your exercise price. At a rate of 70 means employee will have to pay 70 when the market price at the time when this scheme was granted was 110. Now further it is given the vesting period date is 31st of March 2020. Generally after the end of the vesting period, some time period is given to the employee to exercise the option. The period which starts from the end of the vesting period. Now your vesting period will end after three years on 31st of March 2020. But your exercise date is 31st of March 2021. That means in this case company has given one year exercise period to the employees. The period which starts what we call from the end of the vesting period. Correct is known as vesting period. So generally in practical life some more period is given after the end of the what we call vesting period to the employees so that they can take that what we call decision discernly discernly means after thought great thoughts at the end of year one company found that 100 employees had left an estimated expected annual forfeiture rate of 10 percent difference between last question and this question you must notice even in the last question, it was given that some employees had left in the organization. Even in the last question, this was also given that some employees have left the organization. And it was also given that an entity estimated departure rate at so and so percent. But in the last question, in June 24 examination, it is given that over three year period of time, you must understand over three years period of time. But what is given here? This time it is given that at the end of year one, actually 100 employees have left. Actually 100 employees have left and estimated annual forfeiture rate at 10%. Annual forfeiture rate this time is given. Annual forfeiture. That means company is thinking that each year 10%, 10%, 10% employee would leave the organization. Difference between these two languages you must notice and notice very carefully. In the question which we did over there, it was written 
16%, 13% over three years period of time. So you directly applied the percentage 16% or 13% to know actually how many number of employees would actually complete the scheme. But in this particular case, you are being given and in most of the questions generally we are given this way around that annual forfeiture rate is will be this much. So this time entity is of the opinion after 100 employees had left, entity now think actually that 10% employee each year are going to leave the organization. And here, when this question is struck in the examination in December 2021, I was the only faculty who gave the answers to all the questions because none actually got the guts to give the solution for the same. To be very honest with you, and why I'm saying so, because such lines were given in the question, earning per share and price, earning per share and price, earning per share and price earning ratio. EPS is also given and price earning ratio is also given 26 and 5. So at the end of the first year, you are being given earning per share and price earning ratio. In this question, at the end of the first year, you are being given earning per share and price earning ratio. Price earning ratio is also given in the question. And because this was given, an institute never supplies the answer as you know, actually complete answer I mean to say. And that's the reason actually uh, none got the solution at that time. And that is the reason actually we started this past paper analysis series and since then it has become very, very famous because of your love and affection at the same time. Earning per share and price earning ratio is given. What does it mean? It means first of all you need to understand here this way around. As you know better than I actually. Why I'm saying better than I because you are also studying financial management or SPM whatever it is. Price earning ratio, you know better than I, is market price divided by earning per share. Number one. Now, in this question, we are being given earning per share and we are also given price earning ratio. So, by multiplying price earning ratio with earning per share, price earning ratio with earning per share, I can derive the market price, isn't it or not? So, that means we will use this information to compute the market price. That means at the end of the first year, this will be our market price. And because we are having the market price at the end of the first year, quite obviously this price will be different from the market price which was on the grant date. And from this market price, I will subtract the excess price, I will subtract the exercise price to know the fair value at the end of the first year. So at the end of the first year, I will derive my fair value in this manner. Is it clear to you? Similarly, in this particular question, it is given to you at the end of year two. Now it is given that company found that actual four feature rate is 4%. Now company finds that actually employees are leaving. So remember one thing, generally how many employees have left actually, generally it is given in absolute terms. Generally it is given in absolute terms. But in this question it is given that actual four feature rate is 4%. Actual four feature rate 4% means actually employees left at the rate of 4%. And therefore, entity re-estimated the expected annual forfeiture rate at 5%. Important point is that at the end of the second year, now entity thinks that employee at the rate of 5% will leave each year. Now in this question, earning per share at the end of the second year, earning per share and Earning per share and price earning ratio is 27.5 and 4. By multiplying 27.4, you will easily get what we call market price at the end of the second year. And I have been telling you, from there on, you are going to subtract 70 your excess exercise price to know the what we call four feet, uh, know the fair value. At the end of the third year, company found that actual four feature rate is 10 percent. This actual four this was very tough question at a time. For those who haven't actually bought our material at that time, at the same time, because we covered this question in our, our regular classes already, we had covered this one. Anyway, so again this time, actual four feature, actual four feature rate stands for actual number of employees who left the organization. Earning per share and price earning ratio are 18 and 15. So it will be used for computing fair value and market price. Now question says only 1,700 employees left the organization sorry, exercise their option on 31st of March 2021. Face value of the share is 10 per share. And lots of questions are being asked. Calculate the expenses to be recognized by fair value method. Cal 
calculate the expenses to be recognized by year two, year three, and calculate the value of the option forfeited. So lots of questions were asked in the examination. So in order to solve this particular question, first of all, you need to understand this way around. See here, employees in the beginning at your disposal is 2,100 less actual employees left at the end of the year. At the end of the year, now 100 employees have already left. So now I'm computing expected to leave. 100 actually left. And I'm now computing how many more employees are going to leave so that ultimately I'm able to find out how many employees are going to complete the scheme. See here. In order to compute how many more employees are going to leave the organization, how I will do that? Because here I have written, first of all, expected to leave in the next two years because one year has already gone by. And at the end of the one year, out of 2,100 original employees, 100 employees have already left. That means now we are having 2,000 employees. And it is given in the question employees expected to complete the vesting period vp stands for vesting period so how many employees now who will complete the scheme so out of 2000 because it is given in the question entity is estimating that annual four feature rate will be 10 percent 10 percent that means entity is estimating that in the next year out of 2000 10 percent will leave and again 10 percent will leave at the end of the third year so in order to know how many more employees are going to leave in the next two years, what I have done here, first of all, from 2,100 employees, I have already subtracted 100 employees who have actually left. Now I'm left up with 2,000 employees and I want to know how many more employees are ultimately going to be there till the end of the year. So 10%. That means you multiply it with 90%, 90%. If I'm multiplying it with 90%, 90%, it means 0 0.90, 0 0.90. It means I'm arriving over this figure and this figure is telling me that ultimately 1620 employees will be there out of 2000 employees. Out of 2100, 100 employees have already left. And I am now estimating that ultimately 1620 employees will be there till the end of the organization. So out of 2,16,20 employees will be there. That means now I am feeling that out of 2,16,20 employees will leave, will be there till the end. That means indirectly I am expecting 380 employees to leave the organization. So that is why here I have written actual employees who have left the organization 100 and 380 more employees are going to leave the organization. So ultimately 100, 1,620 employees will be there. And to these employees, I will have to offer 50 options. So this will become total option. Now the important point, I will have to find out the fair value at the end of the first year. As I told you, in order to find out the fair value at the end of the first year, first of all, you need to compute the market value. And in order to compute the market value, you multiply your earning per share, which is given in the question with the what we call market price, which is also given in the question at the end of the first year, because earning per share and what we call price earning ratio, it is given in the question and it will give you the market price at the end of the first year, as I told you earlier. Now from 120, from 130, sorry, the market price, now you subtract your what we call exercise price, which is 70 given in the question. So that is the reason your 60 will become the fair value. Actually, in this question, this was the head of a task to compute what we call fair value. So once you have fair value at your disposal, now you can find out the total expenses and rest of the steps you can easily manage by yourself. Similarly, now when we'll reach the end of the second year, originally we are having 2100 employees, but by the end of the second year, if you will notice, it was given in the question that 100 employees left in the first year. And it was given in the question, you must pay attention here, there were 2,100 employees. Actually, it is a pretty confusing question. That is why I'm doing it over here. 2,100 employees were there and 100 employees have already left, actually left. So 2,000 employees were there after actual employees left. Now the question says, Although you are expecting 380 more employees will leave, but the fact is that there are 2000 employees still there. Are you getting my point? That's a different matter that you are expecting 380 more employees will leave. Expectation is different thing, but at this moment you are still having 2000 employees. 
Now the important point is that in the second year it was given to us that actual four feature rate is four percent. Instead, see in the first year they have given in absolute terms the number of employees who have actually left, who have actually left. It is given in the question. But in the second year, it is not given. It is in the second year, what is given that actual employees who would leave will be 4%. So how to compute that 4%? First from 2100, because actual employees 100 have already left. So you are left off with 2000 employees. And now you think that actually 4% more employees will leave in the second year. So 80 employees actually who will be there who would leave the organization because your actual rate actual employees who have left the organization is given actually in percentage terms. So that's the reason you will have to be very careful in this particular question. So in the second year, you must have noticed out of 2100 total employees who have actually left hundred in the first year. And I just told you 80 in the second year. So that means total 180 employees have actually already left, have actually already left. So if you are going to subtract from 2100, 180, Obviously, I think 1920 now at this moment, there are employees. But important point is that you will have to subtract employees who would, who you think that who would leave the organization at the end of the second year. Now, how many employees will leave at the end of the second year who are expected to leave? At the end of year two, remaining employees are 2100 employees originally and 100 employees left actually left 80 left in the second year. So that means you are left off with 1920 employees. You are actually left with 1920 employees only. Now it is given. It was given in the question that at the end of the second year entity revised the four annual four feature rate at 5% at 5% means out of 100 5% will leave indirectly 95% will complete the scheme. So that is the reason what you are going to do simply multiply 1920 by 0.95 or by 95% to know how many employees ultimately will complete the scheme till the end of the third year because you are now at the end of the second year and you are now under an impression that 5% annual for feature is there. So after second year, there will be only third year. So 1930 into 0 0.95, 1824 employees will complete the scheme. That means you have driven out the figure how many more employees will leave because now you have actually 1920 employees. How you computed 1920 out of 2100 actual employees who have left the organization till the second year is 180. So 1920 total number of employees are there at the end of the second year. And now you have computed that out of what we call 1920 employees, these many employees are be, will, will ultimately be there 1824. 1824. Out of 1920 actual employees now you are having only 1824 will be there till the end. That means 96 more will leave. So that is why 96 you have subtracted. That means out of 2100 at the end of the second year 180 employees have already left actually and now you expect that 96 more employees are going to leave. So ultimately 1824 employees will be there who would be who would complete the scheme. So to these employees you will have to offer 50 option. And again, you will have to compute the fair value in order to compute the fair value. First, you will have to compute the what we call market value. And in order to compute the market value, you will have to multiply as I, am, I have been telling earning per share with the price earning ratio, you will get 110. And from 110, you subtract what we call 70, the exercise price, which is given to you 40. So 40 will become what we call your fair value. And again, rest of the process you can manage as I have already told you. Now the important point again, now we will reach the end of the third year. At the end of the third year, all I need to do is that I have to subtract the total employees who have left the organization. 100 employees left in the first year. In the second year, 80 employees left. And I have written here 192. How I have computed this 192. See here, there were originally 2100 employees. 100 employees left in the first year. 80 employees left in the second year. So actually 1920 employees are there, but it is given in the question in the third year, your actual four feature rate is 10%. That means actually 192 more employees will leave. So that is why till the end of the third year, total 370 employees have already given. Now in the third year, because you, are, you have reached the end of the vesting period, it is not given how many more employees you are expecting to leave. 
So ultimately it will be zero. So 1728 employees finally will complete the scheme and you will have to multiply it with 50 and ultimately 20. Uh, 20 will be your fair value. How you have driven this fair value? 18 is your earning per share. It is given in the question. 5 is the price earning ratio. By multiplying these two, you get the market price. From the market price of 90, you will have to subtract the exercise price to get 20 as the fair value. So this is your fair value. So this is how your process will be there. Now, important point you must have noticed. Actually, 1728 employees have completed the scheme. But it is not necessary that those employees who have completed the scheme, all these employees ultimately are going to actually exercise the option. So 1728 employees are there, but out of that it is given in the question only 1700 employees have are exercising the option. So that means 28 employees will not get another chance. That means their options have la lapsed. It is called as options forfeited. They have forfeited their options now. So question has also asked to compute the value of these 28 forfeited. So how much of expenses you are book, you are going to book? Actually, this you can do it this way around. Since options vested on 1728 employees while 1700 employees are exercising the option, that means options forfeited will be equal to 28. But what will be the value of 28? 28 employees into 50 option into fair value. So this will be the value of what we call uh, options forfeited. So this is how you are going to do this particular question. Besides, there is another question and it came in uh, December 2022. Again, this happens to be a pretty strong question. On 1-7-2028, Amla Giloy Tulsi granted 100 options to each of his 2,100 employees at Rs. 60. At Rs. 60. Market price is given to you at 200. The vesting date is 31st of March 2021 and the exercise date is 31st of March 2022. Now it is given to you. At the end of the year, 100 employees have left the organization and fair value of a share issued under ISOF was 93. When this question is struck in the examination, two things which and some of you might feel actually I'm sounding arrogant. But the fact is that actually I was the only only faculty who gave answers to such tricky question because I spent nearly myself 10 hours to solve these questions. I'm telling you very honestly at that time, correct? You, if you look the way, if you look into the what we call um, solution series, which we started way back. So ultimately, at the time, none gave any solution, and none actually developed this courage to give the solution. Why I'm saying so? First of all, two things were there in this particular question. Generally, we are given on one four, or generally the beginning date happens happens to be the real beginning date. But in this case, you must have noticed that date is 1 7 1st of July 2018. And second point is that here it is given fair value of a share issued under ISOP was 93. And many students thought actually this is the fair value. No, this is market value. This is market value. Whenever in the question it will be written fair value of a share, fair value of a share. Always presume it is the market price. This is your market price. It is not your fair value. There is a difference between fair value per share, fair value per option, and fair value of a share. There is a difference between these two. Generally, when we say fair value, generally we are referring to fair value per option. Correct? But here it is clearly given fair value of a share. So fair value of a share generally is referred to as the market price of the share. So most of us actually got confused at that time and quite obviously the student fraternity too. So you need to understand this particular point, although this particular point I had had mentioned in my regular classes. Correct. So those who had uh, kept this into the memory, they were able to solve the question and the and those who didn't, they were not able to solve this question. So you need to be very careful in this particular question that this is the market price of the share and this is not the fair value of the share. This is the point which you need to take care of. Similarly, at the end of the year, 250 employees had left 
and fair value of a share issued under option is 104 again this is what we call market price is given to you at the end of the year 3 it is found that 192 employees have left the organization and fair value of a share issued fair value of a share issued always stands for always stands for market price so this is your market price is it clear to you and similar to the last question even in this question it is given 1700 employees left the organization so important point in this ca case your beginning date is 1st of july and your first year will end on 31st of 3 2019 you have to note down the time period because the time period is nine months correct that mean after the nine months your accounting year in accounting year will end and similarly your second year will end over here so again you will take into account the time period from the grant date till the end of the second year it comes to 21 months and similarly your third year will end over here and from the beginning till the third year time period is 33 months first of all this point is important why later on i will tell you now on the grant date it is given in the question 2100 employees are there and per employee option is equal to 100 and first thing is that you need to compute the fair value in this particular question. I have already told you, actually, you are being given the market price. You are being given the market price. And you are also being given in the question that exercise price is 60. So from the market price, if you are going to subtract the exercise price, exercise price is given in the question. So you are going to get 33 as the fair value. Similarly, at the end of the second year, the market price is 104 and fair value obviously is 60. So 44 will be the fair value and so on. So this is the tricky point in this particular question. Now at the end of, it is also given at the end of the first year, 100 employees have left the organization and 80 employees have left the organization in the second year. Is it clear to you or not? And 192 employees left in the organization. This line unnecessarily got printed here. I am very sorry. This paragraph, you, this paragraph is not related to this particular question. Correct? This paragraph, only this much is, this much you have to study. Actually, employees left 100. 80 and 192 because this is the information given in the question. Now, how to do the computation with respect to recognition of expenses and liability? In this particular case, employees in the beginning, obviously 2100. And it is given to you in this question, you are being given only actual number of employees who have left. So 100 employees have left. So ultimately, 2000 employees will be there who would complete their scheme. So you will multiply it with 100 options because in the question it is given 100 options you are offering and fair value which you computed in this question it was the most important task to compute the fair value. You will multiply it, it. then second important part is that in order to know the proportion see here total proportion from the start of the story till the end of the vesting period is 33 months and out of 33 months 9 months are belong to the first year so on in this proportion you are going to recognize the expense is it clear to you and rest of the question now you can solve it because i have given you entire story for example in the second year when i am going to reach originally 2100 employees are there 100 employees had all have already left in the first year in the second year 80 employees have left so we are remaining this much of employees we are going to offer 100 and 44 will be your fair value total expenses will be this much and in the second year you your proportion will be 21 by 33 in the third year your proportion will be equal to 33 by 33 so this is how you will have to solve this question and after having done this particular question now you will be able to do nsq june 223 question easily is it clear to you so on such count, we take leave of you of elevation of goodwill under CFR final post series. This happens to be your revisionary session 40. Now, as far as valuation of goodwill is concerned, what we have noted in the examination since last four attempt, actually, there is a combined question from valuation of goodwill and valuation of share, wherein you are asked to do the computation of the goodwill and, of course, value the share. That means you are not going to get question directly straight away from goodwill or straight away from valuation of shares. In fact, you need to have a very good knowledge of both these chapters, valuation of goodwill and valuation of shares, so that you can attempt the question. But at the same time, valuation of goodwill and valuation of share combinedly are going to make a very formidable combo because from, as I just told you, since last four attempts, what we have noted, a question is striking and striking with great regularity. So, this should work as a motivating factor why you need to actually pay a greater attention towards valuation of goodwill. 
Now, as far as valuation of goodwill is concerned, right from what we call your beginning to the accounting journey, you have been studying goodwill, correct? So, as far as basics are concerned, you are very well jet with it, no doubt about that. But in spite of that, as you know, we always start with the what we call scratches. In your earlier phases of education, you have already noted that how to value the goodwill. You have gone through what we call various method, methods and methodologies of computing the goodwill. For example, you used to actually adopt average, uh, average profit method, the super profits method, then capitalization method. Isn't it or not? In order to compute goodwill under average profit method, what you used to do? You simply used to take the what we call average profit. You used to multiply it with years of purchase to find out the amount of goodwill. And similarly, under super profits method, you used to take the actual or average profit. Then you used to compute what we call normal profits. Then you used to subtract normal profits from the average profit to arrive at super profits. Then you used to multiply it. So this is how you used to actually compute the goodwill. However, at this particular level, correct, especially at professional level, whichever method we would take upon to, cal to calculate the amount of goodwill under the first step, under the first step, it is of paramount importance that we need to know how to arrive at future maintainable profits. This will be the starting point. It is very important to understand whatever method you are adopting to value the goodwill. As a first step, you need to find out the future maintainable profits. Now, the question is how the future maintainable profits is computed. But before I come over to that, let me also remind you actually why you need the valuation of goodwill. The valuation of goodwill is needed generally in case of partnership as you know at the time of admission retirement or change in profit sharing ratio or at the time of death of a partner. But at the same time, in case of corporate field, generally we see the value, need for valuation of goodwill arises when two companies merge or when, com when one particular company takes over the business of the another company and sometime when actually government nationalizes a particular corporate entity and in order to compensate that, even at that particular time, valuation of goodwill is needed. But more often than not, what we have noted actually in practical life, valuation of goodwill is needed when one particular business is selling its business to the another entity. Most of the time, valuation of goodwill is needed over there. So keeping such things into your mind, now we come over to this particular point, how to compute, as I told you, whatever method we are, we are adopting for the valuation of goodwill as a first step and as a general rule at this particular level, you need to know how to compute the future maintainable profits. In order to compute future maintainable profit, what you are supposed to do, the point number one is this. First of all, you are going to take into account the profits which are given in the question. For example, in the question, you are being given profits of year one or so and so, profits of year two, profits of year three, and we presume four years profits are given to us. All I need to do is simply add them. So I will add all the profits. After adding the average profits, sorry, after adding all the amount of profit, then what I am going to do, I will check whether there is any abnormal loss or not. As you know, while arriving over these profits, you must have debited the abnormal loss, isn't it or not? Obviously, when one party which is selling its business to the other party and both these parties are mutually deciding upon what we call, let us say, valuation of goodwill, the selling party will tell to the purchasing party, actually there was a particular, in this particular year, there is an abnormal loss and I want it to be added back. The purchaser would ask why you want to add it back. The seller will simply simply tell because it is an abnormal profit. It will not take place in future. So that is the reason actually I want to add it back for the purpose of goodwill. So that is the reason if there would be any abnormal loss, correct, in that particular case, you are going to add it to the total profits. Actually, we are trying to eliminate the impact of the abnormal loss because while arriving over these particular profits, I must have debited abnormal loss to the debit side of the profit or loss account, isn't it or not? So in order to eliminate the effect, now I will have to put it towards the credit side. It means now I will have to increase the profit and increasing profit means I will have to add it. So if there is any abnormal loss, you will have to add it. And when we are adding it indirectly, it means we are eliminating the impact of what we call abnormal loss. Similarly, if there would be what we call any abnormal incomes, correct? Abnormal income could be in the form of what we call de certain decrease in prices correct certain decrease in prices of raw material also and similarly such government policy which is favorable to you 
or what we call there are any non-trading incomes like dividend received, interest received. So in this case, the purchasing party will insist that your profit is inclusive of what we call such abnormal profits or non-trading or non-operating profits. So this profit accrued to you, but it is not necessary that once I am going to acquire your business, such profits would accrue to me also. So that is the reason abnormal profit must be subtracted. So, what I mean to say is that when two parties are mutually deciding upon at the time of sale and purchase of the business, both the parties will try to take their interest into account. The seller has added the profit and similarly the purchasing party will point out to the selling party that your profit is inclusive of abnormal gains. So, such gains have accrued to you, it's okay, but there is no surety that such gain would accrue to me too. So, that's the reason actually you need to subtract the same. So that is why actually if there would be any abnormal profits or for that instance, if there would be any non-trading incomes like dividend received, interest received, we are going to subtract it from the total profits. The main idea is somehow to compute the total adjusted profit, correct? So we will compute the total adjusted profit. How to compute the total adjusted profit? First of all, you are going to simply add all the given profits. After summing them up, you will just note down if there are any abnormal losses, you are going to add. If there are any abnormal income, you are going to subtract if there are any non-trading or non-operating incomes you are going to subtract. So after adjusting the total profits obviously now the profits which we have would be termed as or would be tagged as total adjusted profits. Once you are done up with this particular step now the next step is simply average them. Because we have taken in our example four years profit I will divide it by four to arrive over average adjusted profit. What does average adjusted profit signify? Average adjusted profit signify the profit earning capacity of this particular concern till up to this particular stage per year by eliminating the what we call abnormal uh, impacts. What my point is that how much this entity was earning in the past per year under normal circumstances because we have already eliminated the abnormal impacts. This is what average adjusted profit suggests. Average adjusted profit is simply signifying that this entity is earning per year under normal circumstances this much of profit. But how much this entity would earn in future because that is what we are more concerned. Suppose I am purchasing your business, I am more concerned with this particular fact that how much per year profit your business would actually fetch me. So in order to know that both the parties will take into account if there would be any future gains then such gains will be added. Similarly if there would be any future losses and expenses I will explain future savings gains expenses later on correct. If there would be any future gains and what we call savings such item will be added likewise if there would be any future losses or expenses you are going to add it. At the same time, if there would be any opportunity loss, that too will be subtracted. So if there would be future, future gains you are going to add, if there, are, there would be any future expenses or losses you are going to subtract, if there are any opportunity loss, you are going to subtract. So after, <clears throat> after having done some adjustment with respect to what we call futuristic uh, situations or scenarios to the average adjusted profit, we arrive over future maintainable profits. Now what does future maintainable profit suggest? Future maintainable profit suggests that how much this particular entity under normal circumstances would maintain, sustain profit per year in future. Is it clear to you? So this should be your first step. Once you are done up with this particular step, now presuming that you are computing the goodwill through average profit method. If you are computing the goodwill through average profit method, then first thing which you need to have at your disposal is future maintainable profits. Correct? future maintainable profits. Remember one thing, even future maintainable profits are also average profit because you must have noted while arriving over this particular figure, we have averaged the profit. So future maintainable profit, first of all, you are going to take into account. Obviously, then you are going to multiply it with given number of years of profits to arrive over the figure of goodwill. This is how you are going to compute the goodwill under average profit method. I have already told you, whatever method you are adopting to compute the goodwill, you need to compute, first of all, future maintainable profits. Similarly, under super profits method, suppose you are valuing the goodwill of a particular concern on the basis of super profits. In that particular case, first of all, again, you will have to find out the future maintainable profit. After having computed the future maintainable profits, then you will compute normal profits. In order to compute the normal profits, you need capital employed and you will have to multiply it with normal rate of return, normal rate of return, as you know. Then obviously you are going to compare normal profits with what we call your future maintainable profits and then you will get what we call super profits 
and then super profits will be divided with number of year of, number of years of purchase to arrive over the goodwill now the point here is that in the examination when you are computing the normal profit sometime you are going to confront a bit of problem because sometime capital employed will not be given and most of the time at this particular level capital employed will not be given to you directly so you will have to compute the capital employed and some of you might think oh so we can easily compute it no it is not as easy because most of the time i have seen student fraternity are committing lots of silly mis lots of silly mistakes correct simply because of the fact you are not very well aware of the concept of capital employed in the context of goodwill under normal circumstances barring goodwill wherever i would compute capital employed i will simply subtract the liability from the assets to arrive over the amount of capital employed but in the context of goodwill when we are talking about capital employed we are technically talking about operating capital employed what we mean by operating capital employed or capital employed in the context of the goodwill that you need to understand very thoroughly just pay attention in order to compute capital employed in the context of what we call goodwill suppose you are computing capital employed in the context of the goodwill you need to take care of two three items this is very vital area this is where exactly i have seen students are committing lots of mistakes obviously if i am going to ask you how you are going to compute the capital employed most of you would simply tell me sir we will take into account all the assets obviously you are going to take account all the assets no doubt about that however when you are going to take into account the assets you will not take such assets correct exclude that mean you are not going to consider this these assets which i am going to tell you you will not include valueless assets as you know valueless assets basically the term we use for fictitious assets like deferred expenditure miscellaneous expenditure preliminary expenses underwriting commission discount on issue of shares to venture etc correct such items you are not going to take into account is it clear to you when you are going to sum up all the assets for the purpose of computing capital employed in the context of goodwill you will never ever consider valueless assets number 1 you will never ever consider non trading investments non trading investments non trading investments you will not consider non trading investment what we mean by non trading investment and why non trading investment will not be considered the point is this the reason being is that first of all you need to understand the meaning of investment suppose if i say this is the balance sheet of x limited and in the balance sheet of x limited let us say it is written investments 10% investments 15% investment in shares or bonds or so whatever it is in shares or bonds if it is written towards the asset side in the balance sheet of x limited could you tell me actually just by having a look over this particular item whether this is a trading investment or non trading investment so it is not easy to answer it unless and until you have gone through our regular classes if i am going to ask you a very simple question how you are going to classify whether these are trading investment or non trading investment so how will you answer me so answer is very simple these are non trading investment why these are non trading investment because when i am investing let us say x limited has done these investment in purchasing the shares and bonds of y limited correct these investments have been done by x limited in acquiring shares and bonds of y limited so logically what is happening the funds of x limited are being utilized by y limited that mean your own funds are not being utilized by your own company such funds are being used by other entity are you getting my point or not so that is the reason actually the funds of your company are being utilized by other entity that mean this item is not contributing to your operations so that is why while computing capital employed in the context of goodwill i am not going to include non trading investment so these will be considered as non trading investment in the question how you are going to actually first of all find out whether these are trading or non trading if nothing is mentioned simply it is given in this manner always presume that investments are non trading investment correct but more often than not you it will it is very clearly written in the question whether investments are trading or non trading but just for on rare occasions suppose in case if nothing is mentioned in the question 
then you should be in a position to know actually whether it happens to be trading investment or non-trading investment. So in this particular case, this happens to be non-trading investment. Reason being is simple because investment suggests that our funds are being utilized by the other entities. So quite obviously, it is not helping in the operations. This item or this asset is not contributing to the what we call operations of our entity. So that is why it will be treated as what we call non-trading investment. Is it clear to you or not? So in this particular case, this you should consider as non-trading investment. Number one. Number two, suppose if in the question it is given this way round. Let us say this is the balance sheet of Jet Limited. And in the balance sheet of Jet Limited, let us say simply word investment is written. So is this trading or non-trading? Again, it will be traded as non-trading. Correct. Now, suppose this is the balance sheet of W Limited. Now, in this balance sheet, it is written this way around investments investments in so and so entity but in bracket it is also written for the purpose of replacement of particular plant and machinery or for redemption of devention it is written in the bracket investments are given and in the bracket it is given that investments are meant for replacement of plant and machinery and for redemption of debentures now, if it is mentioned in the question that your investments are meant for the replacement of your plant and machinery and for the redemption of debenture or for the distance for the redemption of debenture, quite obviously in this in this case, it will be treated as trading investment. Why it will be treated as trading investment? Because this time, ultimately, these funds will be used for the purpose or, or for the operations or for the well-being of the operations of the business because ultimately you are going to get the funds to replace your machinery or for or to redeem your deventure so this time investment will be treated as trading so investment will be treated as trading only if in the bracket it is mentioned it is for the purpose of replacement of machinery or for the purpose of redemption of deventure is it clear to you or not similarly Non-trading investment will be excluded as I have already told you. Similarly, you will never ever take into account work in progress. You will also not take into account assets under construction. Assets under construction. Assets under construction. You will never ever consider these items correct as asset for the purpose of valuation of capital employed in the contest of goodwill. I'm talking about only in the contest of goodwill. Is it clear to you or not? Obviously, valueless asset will not be taken. Non-trading investment will not be taken. Why work in progress and assets under construction will not be taken? Again, because these items are being reflected towards the asset side. But because work is still in progress or assets are under in construction, these items are not contributing to the operations of the business. So that is the reason we are not going to take that, take such items. Is it clear to you? Remember one thing. We are basically interested in finding out operating capital employed. And that is what we mean by operating capital employed. We are going to exclude, exclude all such items, correct, which are not contributing to the operations of the business. So under assets under construction. And last but not the least, that is your goodwill. If there is goodwill in the balance sheet, because you are going to do the valuation of the goodwill. So that is the reason you are going to exclude goodwill also. Is it clear to you or not? So these items you will never ever consider and you are going to subtract all the liabilities, including the debenture. Because many a time I have seen a student fraternity is asking, so should debenture be deducted or not? Obviously, debentures should be also subtracted to compute the what we call uh, your capital employed. All assets, except these assets, you are going to take into account and you are going to separate all the liabilities to arrive over capital employed. This is one area. Another important point is that sometime question will in the question it will be stated that your normal profit should be based upon average capital employed. Sometime in the question it is also mentioned this way round that that, that your normal profit should be based upon average capital employed. Indirectly, it means in order to compute the normal profit this time, you will have to multiply normal profit with average capital employed, with average capital employed. Indirectly, it also means that now you need to compute average capital employed. How to compute average capital employed? There are basically three methods of computing the average capital employed. Method number one, under this you will have to take into account the opening capital employed OCE plus closing capital employed. Correct? Suppose my opening capital employed is 100 and my closing capital employed is equal to 150. Correct? 
So what will be the average capital employed? I will simply average it and I can easily get 125 as my average capital employed. What I am telling, pay attention. You will never use average capital employed for computing normal profit. Normal profit means capital employed into normal rate of return. But sometime, as I told you, and many a question, many a student ask this question when to use average capital employed and capital employed. You will always consider cap capital employed only for computing the what we call normal profits. However, if in the examination question very specifically states that your normal profit should be based upon average capital employed or is or if there is a clear hint in the question which suggests that we have to actually take average capital employed. So obviously under such circum circumstances we need to compute average capital employed. Now I am telling you how average capital employed can be computed. Average capital employed can be computed either through what we call by adopting this particular method. But problem with this method is that you will never be able to use this. The reason is very simple because in the examination you will never be given the opening balance sheet. You will be given only the closing balance sheet. Normally when we use the word capital employed it always means closing capital employed because from the balance sheet we are extracting the figure to find out what we call various assets and we are subtracting liabilities. So obviously the capital employed means closing capital employed. Although this is the most simple method of computing average capital employed, but we cannot use it simply because we will never have full fledged information in the question, especially of the last year. So we cannot and never be in a position to use this particular method. So if we cannot use this method, then how we are going to compute average capital employed in case if it is required. There is another method. In this particular method, what you are going to do, you are going to take into account your capital employed. Capital employed means closing capital employed minus one half of future maintainable profit. One half of future maintainable profit. One half of future maintainable profit. For example, if I take into account this particular figure, closing capital employed is 150, correct? And my opening capital is 100. The difference between the opening capital and closing capital is nothing but profit. So one half of 50. So I am getting the same results. Although here I am getting the same result, but in practical life, both these methods cannot give you absolutely similar similar result, but they will be quite close. No doubt about that. So if we are not in a position to use this method, the nearest possibility is to use this method. That is closing capital employed minus one half of future maintainable profit. Is it clear to you or not? And most of the time we are going to use this method to compute average capital employed in case if it is demanded by the question. Although there is yet another method to compute average capital employed. You can use this method also. Under this method, what I am going to write capital employed minus one half of current year profit. When we say current year profit, it means current year's profit after tax. Uh, one half of current year profit. This is yet another method of computing the capital employed. When you should apply this method in case if you are interested in computing the capital employed out of these two, which method you are going to utilize. If profits of past years are not given and only profits of current year is given, then we have no alternative but to use this method. If in the examination questions of past profits are also given, then we, sh we should always use this method. Is it clear to you or not? So after having a look over the computation of capital employed and average capital employed, there is another method of computing the what we call goodwill through capitalization of super profits. Under capitalization of super profits, what I need to do, I will simply take into account the super profits and how to compute the super profits, you know, future maintainable profit, less normal profit will give you super profits. Then you simply divide it by normal rate of return, simply divide it by normal rate of return. So under capitalization of super profits, we simply capitalize the amount of super profits. Is it clear to you? There is another way of computing goodwill through capitalization method and both these will deliver you the same answer. Sometime question may say that compute the goodwill simply by capitalizing the super profits, correct? Or simply question would state that compute the amount of goodwill through capitalization method. If question states that compute the amount of goodwill through capitalization method under such circumstances, what you are going to do under step number one, first of all, you are going to compute the capitalized value. Capitalized value means market value 
मार्केट वैल्यू ऑफ योर कैपिटल इंप्लॉय मार्केट वैल्यू ऑफ योर कैपिटल इंप्लॉय इन ऑर्डर टू कंप्यूट द मार्केट वैल्यू ऑफ योर कैपिटल इंप्लॉय यू विल कंसिडर द फ्यूचर मेंटेनेबल प्रॉफिट एंड देन यू आर गोइंग टू डिवाइड इट बाई नॉर्मल रेट ऑफ रिटर्न नॉर्मल रेट ऑफ रिटर्न इज ऑलवेज गिवन इन परसेंटेज रिमेंबर वन थिंग फॉर एग्जाम्पल नॉर्मल रेट ऑफ रिटर्न इज टेन परसेंट सो यू विल राइट हियर टेन परसेंट इज इट क्लियर टू देन we are going to compare this figure with our actual capital employed so whatever capitalized value is there and whatever capital employed is there so if this amount is higher than this amount then it would be construed that this entity is having this much of goodwill is it clear to you first of all we will compute the capitalized value what is capitalized value capitalized value simply suggests the capital value the market value of your actual capital employed and then you are going to compare capitalized value you with your closing capital employed or simply capital employed then the difference will be of course goodwill so this is the basic part of this particular chapter correct now i will try to explain all those things correct which i just mentioned earlier now first have a look over this particular question correct here it is written mr 20 purchased a business from mr 60 so purchaser is mr 20 and seller is mr 60 so profits earned by the seller during the last 4 years are given to you now in this case as you can see profits of last 4 years are 3 lakh 50 3 lakh 20 45000 3 lakh 80000 so seller informs the purchaser that this is a scenario of my profitabilities in the last 4 years seller also informs the purchaser seller is mr 60 and he is telling to the young purchaser whose age is just 20 that profits of year 3 were affected by loss of goods amounting to 20000 due to fire now seller seller is telling to the purchaser that profits of year 3 were affected by loss due to fire indirectly what seller is trying to tell to the purchaser that i am going to add this profit again for the purpose of computation of goodwill obviously purchaser also know that why he wants to add this because purchaser is a very brilliant fellow even though even though actually his age is 20 but he has a very sharp mind he didn't raise any question that why you want to add 20000 because he know that if i am going to ask he will have a very simple answer that these are abnormal profit and he will simply tell me that this 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 loss has taken place during my time but it is not necessary that this loss again will take place in future so we must add it back obviously abnormal profits will be added back but problem is that mr 60 who is quite as it like me actually mr 60 says that the goods were not insured and it, it was necessary to take a fire insurance policy an annual premium of which shall amount to rupees 2500 now in this case seller is telling to the purchaser actually problem with old age people is that sometimes they speak much, much more than what is required so in spite of telling that there is a loss in year 3 he went further and he was an honest fellow actually he tells to purchaser that this loss took place because i didn't take a fire insurance policy if i had had taken a fire insurance policy if i had had taken an insurance policy where annual premium is 2500 only this loss would not have occurred to me now mr p the purchaser as i told you who has a brilliant p, brilliant mind correct immediately he grasps the point he tells well 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 mr seller that mean you are telling me directly or indirectly that surety of this loss not taking place in future will be only when if i would take a fire insurance policy because seller just told to purchaser that this loss occurred to me because he didn't take the what we call fire insurance policy and mr p who was listening to very carefully actually and he had a very brilliant mind he catches the point and he uses it to his advantage he tells to seller well indirectly you are trying to tell me that surety of this particular loss not taking place in future lies under the ground that if i am going to take a fire insurance policy seller now says well you are absolutely right so try to understand when we will later on do the computation of the goodwill i will add 20000 quite obviously because it is an abnormal loss but at the same time 
Now, later on, under the future expense, under the future expense, this item will be subtracted because now it will be presumed that purchaser will take a fire insurance policy and his annual premium will be 2500. So it will be a sort of future expense for him. That is the point which you need to pay attention to. And over there, another point is that there, there were non-operating profits of 40,000 in year four. So seller tells to purchase it that in year four, there are non-operating profits. As you know, non-operating profit, correct, will be subtracted. Now purchaser, it is given in the question, was earlier employed in a company and his annual salary is 1,20,000. Now purchaser was earlier employed in a company and, and his annual salary over there was 1,20,000. Now quite obviously, now purchaser will acquire this business. When he will acquire this business, what will happen? When he will acquire this business, it is written in the question and now he would leave that job. So he will have to leave that particular job. So this will be subtracted under opportunity loss. It is known as opportunity loss. Is it clear to you? Because by getting this business, his opportunity income or opportunity salary of 1,20,000 would be lost. So that is why when we are going to adjust the future items over there, I am going to subtract it. Further, it is written, he will replace the job and replace the manager who is at present getting 8,000 per month. Purchaser is acquiring this particular business from Mr. 60. And in this particular business, there is a manager whose salary per month is 8,000. If I would multiply 8,000 with 12, it will be equal to 96,000. Now, Mr. P will leave his present job. He himself will completely engage himself into this particular business. Now he has acquired this particular business and now he will replace that manager. Indirectly, it means it will be considered as a future saving from the perspective of Mr. Purchaser. Is it it or not? So in this particular question, it is given to us that goodwill of the business is to be valued at three years purchase of every super profits. So at three years purchase of super profits, sorry, at three years purchase of average profit, we have to find out the goodwill. So basically this question belongs to uh, your average profit method. I've already told you under average profit method, the first step is what we call calculation of future maintainable profit. In order to compute the future maintainable profits, I will simply add, first of all, the given profits, four years profits are given. So I will add that I will get a total figure of 10,25,000. There is an abnormal loss. I will add it. There is an op there is an abnormal profit or non-operating profit of 40,000. I will subtract it. After adding and subtraction, I get a figure of 75,000. It will be known as total adjusted profit. I will divide it by four. I will get the average adjusted profit. Average adjusted profits suggest and signify that taking into account the normal circumstances in the past per year, this business house is earning this much of profit. Now we will do some future adjustment. As I told you, loss of salary, it is a future expense. It will be subtracted. Besides that, for savings of manager, because now he will replace the manager and he will, he himself can do all those tasks which were so far and hitherto we were done by the, that particular manager. So simply he will save actually 96,000. And as I told you during that particular discussion, he will have to take a fire insurance policy to safeguard himself from any abnormal losses. So this will be considered his future expenses. So subtract 120, add 96, subtract 2500 from your total adjusted profit of 268750. We will get future maintainable profits. Now this is our future maintainable profit. We'll multiply it with three years of purchase to get what we call this particular figure. Is it clear to you? Now we come over to this particular question. In this particular question, it is stated that there is a lady by the name of Sheena and she is desirous of selling her business to Sahira. The former, former means Sheena, the seller, has earned a profit of 1,50,000 per annum in the past. Now this time you are being given that Sheena was earning 1,50,000 in the past. That means per year profit in the past is already at your disposal. So you need not require to compute actually total profits and then you need to add back your abnormal losses, etc. Because this time average adjusted profits are already given to you. So here in this case, S1, we call it Sheena and S2 is Shahira. Sheena is seller, correct? And Shahira is purchaser. Seller is selling her business to what we call Shahira. 
and she tells to Shahira, actually on an average in the past, I'm earning 150,000 per annum. Further, she proclaims that actually I think whatever I was earning in the past, I personally think Shahira, sorry, Sheena, she is telling to Shahira that I was earning 150,000 in the past and I firmly believe that this trend will continue in future also. Further, she tells Sheena that, Sheena actually, the seller tells to Shahira that chemist fee of 10,000, that means Sheena is telling to Shahira that I am having a chemist to whom I am paying 10,000 rupees and I am, because it is an expense and I am charging it against the profits, correct, that means I am debiting it to my profit and loss account. But this amount will not be payable by Shahira. Why? Because she herself is an able chemist and she can work as such. What does it mean? The seller presently was paying a chemist a fee of rupees 10,000 and she was charging it to her uh, charging it as an expense but this amount will not be charged by Shahira. Be why? Because she herself is an able chem chemist. That means this will be considered as a future saving for Shahira. Is it clear to you or not? Similarly, presently, presently, rent at 30,000 per annum which had been paid by Sheena will not be a charge in future. That means the seller presently might have taken the premises on rent and she, is, she was actually paying a rent of 30,000 per annum as is given to you. But now it is given that Shahira owns her own premises. Now Shahira has got her own premises. So quite obviously she need not require to pay the rent against this will work as a sort of saving for Shahira. Correct. And further it is written Shahira owns her premises and can supply the accommodation necessary for the staff and equipment. The value estimated is 1,50,000. You need to understand this. Actually, seller presently is paying a month, paying annual rent of 30,000 per annum. Correct? So obviously, in order to actually, uh, because uh, simply because she is not having her own accommodation. But now the purchaser it is given can have her own accommodation. Uh, necessary to keep the staff and the equipment and further it is given the value estimated of that accommodation is 1,50,000. Accommodation value is 1,50,000 it is given to you. What will be the replication of this I will let you know in a short while but before that it is given the value estimated of net assets of the seller amounted to 18,50,000. Now try to pay attention here. The net assets of the seller given to you is equal to 18,50,000. The net assets of the seller given to you is 18,50,000. Now you are the purchaser. Sheena is the seller. Presently, she, presently her business is commanding net assets of 18,50,000. Obviously, when we say that purchaser is acquiring the business, indirectly it means whatever capital employed of the business is there, the purchaser will have to actually employ that much of capital because you are acquiring the business. Purchaser is acquiring the business of Sheena. Obviously, it means the purchaser will also have net assets of 18,50,000. Number one. Number two, it is given in the question that purchaser is going to supply her own accommodation and the value of the accommodation is 1,50,000 and it is a capital expenditure accommodation. Indirectly, it means now from the purchaser's perspective, the capital employed will not be considered as 18,50,000. Rather, you will add 1,50,000. So now the capital employed from the purchaser's perspective will become equal to 20 lakh. Are you getting my point or not? Is it clear to you? So now the capital employed from the perspective of the purchaser will move to 20 lakh. Now in order to solve this particular question further it is also written in this particular question that it was considered that reasonable return on capital invested in this type of business is 5%. So 5% is your normal rate of return. Calculate the amount of goodwill on the basis of 4 years purchase of super profits. So in this question we have to solve the question through super profits method. Under super profits method again we need to compute the future maintainable profits. Now in this question profits of past year are given that mean average adjusted profits are given. 
only thing now remaining is that I have to adjust the future scenario. Now, the, in this question, there will be savings in chemist fee and rent from the perspective of the purchaser because she need not require to pay any fee to the chemist because she herself is an able chemist and further she, ha she has got her own accommodation so she will be escaped of paying any rent so 10,000 plus 30,000 her from her perspective the future maintainable profit will be equal to 1 lakh 90,000 now before we start computing the normal profit first I compute capital employed 18 lakh 50 is already given to us but this capital employed will increase from my perspective from the perspective of the purchaser so now the capital employed will be equal to 20 lakh and normal profits will be 20 lakh into 5 percent 1 lakh now you subtract normal profit from the future maintainable profit future maintainable profit 190 1 lakh is your normal profits so in this case we find that super profits is equal to 90,000 and years of purchase is 4 so goodwill will be equal to 3 lakh 60,000 is it clear to you or not so this is how we are going to compute the amount of goodwill. Come over to question number three. Here it is given from the following information, prepare a statement showing capital employed. Average capital employed. Now, whenever the question would ask you to compute average capital employed directly, indirectly, clearly, disguisely, at that time, you must compute your normal profits on the basis of average capital employed. Is it clear to you? So in this particular question, I will ultimately have to compute average capital employed. Further, we are being asked to compute goodwill on the basis of five years purchase of super profits. Now, what is given to us in the question, first of all, now in this question, we are being given, see here, we are being given goodwill. Now, obviously, later on, when I'm going to compute capital employed, I will ignore the amount of goodwill. Is it clear to you? As I told you earlier, property, plant and equipment is given to me 3,50,000. Now, investment, I'm not going to consider investment. I'm not going to consider investment also. Investment in 6% bonds. 6% bond. My investment 45,000. Goodwill is this much. Both these items will be ignored. Further, discount on issue of shares 2 will be ignored. That means I will have to consider only current asset and property, plant and equipment for the purpose of valuation of assets. Correct? Uh, later on, which ultimately will be required to compute the capital employed. From the what we call liability side, we have debentures, provision for tax. These two items I am going to subtract, correct? Also, towards the liability side, we find there is equity share capital, preference share capital and reserves. Is it clear? Now, in this question, it is given. Okay, creditors are also given. It is given here. Creditors, you are going to take into account, correct? But share selling commission, you will ignore. Is it clear to you? So now coming over to the next information, current value of plant included in property, plant and equipment is 15,000 more. Obviously, when you are going to do the uh, calculation with respect to capital employed, you will consider now your property, plant and equipment at a figure of 3,50,000 plus appreciation of 15,000. Is it clear to you? 3,65. That means when we are going to consider the asset, if revised value would be available, then obviously I will have to consider the revised value. Further now, here it is given average profits of the company after interest on debenture. Now, interest on debenture is a normal business expenditure, no problem. And government taxes is 68,000. Now, in this particular question, it is given that the profits after government taxes is 68,000. That means profits after taxes given to you as 68,000. Further, it is given expected rate of return is 10% and rate of depreciation on fixed asset is 10%. Now, two things are vital in this particular question. What are those two things? Number one, your value of fixed asset has gone up. That means when later on you are going to do the computation of capital employed, obviously you are going to add 15,000 to the value of property, plant and equipment, number one. But because of this increase, now additional depreciation will take place. That means the purchaser of the business will have to provide extra depreciation. So it is something sort of what we call future expense from the perspective of the purchaser. So don't forget to charge depreciation at the rate of 10% on 15,000. Is it clear to you or not? So now in this question, first of all, how to begin? Because here in this particular question, we are simply given that profits after taxes are 68,000. So I will simply consider them as average profit. Is it clear to you? Because profits in segregated forms are not given. So your profit or per year profit are 68,000 after taxes. Very important point. Now, we have already gone through the question and we know that investments are non-trading because 
I just a moment ago I told you that it is written in the question simply as investment in 5% bonds of India. Quite obviously these are non-trading investment because investments are always non-trading. Why? Because funds are being utilized by the other entity, not by your entity. But problem is that when you are going to invest amount in the other entity, each year you are going to actually have some interest. Say even this year you must have received some interest. That is 6% of 45,000 will be equal to 2,700. And this income you must have had included in your current year's profit. So that is the reason because investment are non-trading. So any interest income on such investment will also be considered as non-trading. And that is the reason ultimately you will have to subtract. That means whatever profits we are being given, obviously these profits are inclusive of any income. Correct? So that is the reason now I am going to subtract here interest on investment to the extent of 2700. So now after having subtracted it, I also told you additional depreciation. Correct. Why additional depreciation? Because the value of property, plant and equipment has gone up by 15,000 and rate of depreciation is also given in the question. So I will have to subtract the additional depreciation. So after subtracting 2,700 and 1,500, I get future maintainable profit of 63,800. Once we have the future maintainable profit, then I need to find out the capital employed. As I told you, when we are going to do the computation of capital employed in the context of goodwill, we will not touch upon what we call goodwill, which is existing in the balance sheet. Likewise, we are going to ignore any non-trading investments. Correct. And of course, various other items, which I have already mentioned earlier, for example, in this particular question, discount and share selling commission too will be ignored. So you will write property, plant and equipment 350 plus 15, that is equal to 365,000. Current asset is equal to 2 lakh now and you will subtract your liabilities, creditors and debentures and provision for tax to arrive at 3 lakh 95,000. This will be your capital employed. But in this question, because question has stated that compute average capital employed. So I will have to compute the average capital employed. I cannot use the formula opening capital employed plus closing capital employed. So I will have to use this formula closing capital employed minus one half of future maintainable profit. So closing capital employed is 3,95,000 and we have already computed our future maintainable profit as 63,800. So one half of 63,800 you will subtract from 3,95,000 and you will get average capital employed of 3,63,100. So since you have computed average capital employed, you must base your normal profits on average capital employed. So 3,63,100 your average capital employed into normal rate of return 10%. This will be your normal profits. Now super profits we have already computed. Correct. So uh, sorry, we have already not computed. Now in order to compute the super profits, first of all, I need to have future maintainable profit. Future maintainable profits we computed earlier. Uh, this is equal to 63,800 and now I will subtract the normal profit so I will get this figure 27,490 this is my super profits and goodwill need to be multi in order to compute the goodwill I need to multiply it by 5 to get what we call amount of goodwill this is how we are going to compute the amount of goodwill so these are the odd basic questions now we come a little bit further move a bit further and before we move a bit further let me actually stop here for a while 5 minutes and then I will Resign you.
So welcome again. Now we are going to pick up question number four and this particular question what we find it is being given that following is the balance sheet of Victoria Textiles Limited as at 31st of 3 2028. In the balance sheet obviously when you are going to study you need to take care of this particular fact that which are the items which you are supposed to actually ignore out goodwill is one among them and <coughs> rest of the <coughs> rest of the items you are going to pick up no doubt about that land and building plant and machinery investment so far nothing is mentioned in the investment so i will consider it as non-trading correct and then stock then daters and then cash at bank and then creditors these are the items which i am going to consider in case if i need to compute the capital employed further it is given in the question that from the following information calculate the amount of goodwill at four years purchase of super profits now we are being given that profits before tax for the current year for the current year profits are given to you as six lakh now further here it is given that in this in these profits 10,000 as interest on investment because your investments are non-trading because if only investment word is written in the balance sheet always presume it as non-trading unless and until there is a clear hint that it is a trading one is it clear to you so this time it is non-trading so whatever interest is there you are going to subtract from 6 lakh. Further, it is given that, however, an additional amount of 50,000 would be required to be spent for the smooth running of the business. So whosoever is acquiring the business, he will have to spend 50,000 extra amount in future to carry out the business in a smoother manner. So that is the reason why you will have to subtract this amount too. Correct? 50,000. Further, it is given market value of land and building and plant and machinery. In fact, land and building. <coughs> is 3 lakh and plant and machinery are estimated at 9 lakh and 10 lakh respectively. So value of plant and machinery, plant and machinery, land and building and plant and machinery is going up. Correct. Now they are estimated at 9 lakh and 10 lakh. Further, dep further comma, depreciation to the extent of 40,000 shall be taken into account. Now this is an additional depreciation perhaps due to what we call increase in value of land and building and plant and machinery. So this time calculated figure of additional depreciation is given to you. I need not require to tell you what you are supposed to do with respect to this actually. 40,000 will be subtracted. Income tax rate is 50 percent. However, further it is given, it may be noted that additional depreciation is not allowed for income tax purpose. What repercussion? It's a pretty important question. This question has already struck in one of the examination. Actually, when the question is struck in the examination, in that particular question, you were also supposed to do the evaluation of shares. But one part of the question wherein you were supposed to compute the amount of goodwill and question was almost, almost same. So it may be noted that additional depreciation is not allowed for income tax purpose. What repercussion it would have later on in the solution, I will explain that too, but just wait for a while. Further, it is given rate of return is 20%. Normal rate of return is 20%, but it is given this is before tax. Normal rate of return is 20% before tax and tax rate is 50%. So first of all, you subtract 50% of 20%. 50% of 20% from 20%. So that means your normal rate of return because normal rate of return generally when we say it always means normal rate of return after tax. So your normal rate of return is 10% which you are going to consider later on. Further it is given for the purpose of determining the actual rate of return profits for this year after the aforementioned adjustment may be taken as expected profit. Expected profit is nothing but your future maintainable profit. That means in order to compute your expected or future maintainable profit, you will have to do the aforementioned adjustment. Now in this question, I have written it in bold. Similarly, average trading capital is required. So the question is clearly stating and giving you enough and sufficient hint that you need to actually compute average capital employed directly or indirectly you will have to compute your normal profit on the basis of average capital employed correct further it is given uh, that's all similarly average trading capital employed and in the initial stages the question stated here from the following information goodwill is to be valued on the basis of four years purchase of super profits so this is how we are supposed to do this particular question 
First of all, I'm going to take into account the profits of current year, which are given to us as 6 lakh. As I told you, this profit includes non-trading income, interest on non-trading investment, and it's a non-trading income. So I'm going to subtract future expense, 50,000 depreciation, additional expenses, sorry, additional expenses I will have to subtract because for the smooth running of the business, the purchaser will have to spend 50,000 and additional depreciation I will also, also subtract. Ultimately, my profit at this particular moment is 5 lakh. Now, in this profit, this is 5 lakh as the profit. From this profit, I will have to subtract the tax. Why I will have to subtract the tax? Because this time, profits which are given to us are before tax. So that is why, actually, these are future maintainable profits, 5 lakh. But these are before tax profits. So I will have to actually subtract the taxation. The problem is that the question says that depreciation is not allowed for the purpose of taxation. Depreciation is not allowed for the purpose of depreciation means when we are going to compute the provision for tax, we will not consider as if depreciation has been subtracted. We will not consider just for the purpose of computation. We will subtract depreciation, but for the purpose of computation of provision for tax will presume as if depreciation is not allowed. That means depreciation is not subtracted. So in order to have this presumption, what you will consider that your profits as if are 5 lakh 40,000. Instead of 5 lakh, you will now consider your profit as 5 lakh 40,000 to compute tax. Correct, because it is given in the question depreciation is not allowed for taxation purpose. So when you are going to make a provision for tax, you are simply not going to compute the tax on the figure of 5 lakh. You will consider 5 lakh 40,000 and then you will uh, charge what we call taxation rate. Your taxation rate is 50%. So ultimately your provision will be equal to 2 lakh 70,000. So this is how your provision will be 2 lakh 70,000. Is it clear to you? And I have written also here 5 lakh plus 40,000 into 50%. So profit after tax or future maintainable profit after tax is your 2 lakh 30,000. Then you will compute your capital employed. You will ignore goodwill. You will consider land and building at 9 lakh, plant and machinery at revised value of 10 lakh. You will not consider goodwill, neither investment, Obviously, rest of the item is stock, daters, cash and bank you are going to consider. Then you are going to subtract your liability ultimately. What we call you will get a figure of 20 lakh. So this is your capital employed. But in this particular question, it was given to us that we need to compute average capital employed. In order to compute the average capital employed, I will write here capital employed. Then I will subtract one half of future maintainable profit. As you can see, your capital employed is 20 lakh. And one half of future maintainable profit, future maintainable profit we just computed 2 lakh 30,000. One half of that will be equal to 1 lakh 15. So by subtracting 1 lakh 15 from 20 lakh, we will get 18 lakh 85,000. So this will become my what we call your uh, average capital employed. Normal rate of return will be considered as 10%, I told you. As the end, our normal profits will be equal to now I will apply 10% upon 18 lakh 85,000. So I will get a figure of 1,88,500. Now I will compute the super profits. In order to compute the super profits, first of all, I will write future maintainable profits. I will subtract normal profits. I will get super profits of 41,500. I multiply it with 4 to get the goodwill figure of 1,66,000. This is how I am going to compute the amount of goodwill in this particular question. Is it clear to you? Then we pick up question number 5. This question again is similar to the one correct, which struck in the examination, but in that particular question, you had to do valuation of shares also. Balance sheet of Channel 9 Limited as on 31st of 3, 2027 is given to you, correct? And here it is written, compute the amount of capital employed from shareholders fund approach and long-term fund approach and find out the leverage effect. Find out the leverage effect. What does this leverage effect is and what does it mean actually find out the capital employed from shareholders fund approach and long term fund approach anyway first of all we have we want to have a look over the balance sheet items in the balance sheet the items of our importance are tangible fixed asset and current asset as you know investments and goodwill we will have to ignore from the liability side we have current liability there are 10 percent debentures also besides we have equity share capital 12 percent preference share capital and reserve and surplus now, in this question, we are give, being given average profit, average profits after tax of 40% is, uh, is 15 lakh. Average profits are given and these profits are after tax at the rate of 40%.
ट्रेड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर वैल्यूड एट वन हंड्रेड एंड फिफ्टी परसेंट एक्चुअली नाउ क्वेश्चन स्टेट्स डेट योर इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर ट्रेड इन इनफेक्ट हेयर इट वॉज रिटर्न ट्रेड इन्वेस्टमेंट हाउ कम आई इग्नोर डेट आई एम एक्सट्रीमली सॉरी एक्चुअली हेयर द इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर ट्रेड इन्वेस्टमेंट सो यू विल कंसिडर इवन ट्रेड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स फॉर द कंप्यूटेशन ऑफ कैपिटल इंप्लॉयड नंबर वन नंबर टू Here it is written that trade investments are valued at 150% of the face value, which is 8 lakh. What does it mean? First of all, you need to understand that whatever trade investment which you have, their face value is actually 8 lakh. Their face value is 8 lakh. The figure which we put in the outer column suggests that this is the amount which is spent by us in order to acquire what we call these investment. Let us say these are shares or debentures. Correct. That means their face value is eight lakh, but our entity must have acquired these debentures by paying ten lakh. Because in the outer column, whatever figure is written, that is known as cost of the investment. Now, question says that your trade investments are valued at hundred fifty percent of the face value. So, first of all, I am going to compute hundred fifty percent of face value. Now, if I am going to compute hundred fifty percent of eight lakh, I think it is equal to twelve lakh. If it is equal to twelve lakh, that means while computing the capital employed, I will consider the amount of investment at rupees twelve lakh. Is it clear to you or not? Number one. Further, it is given in the question that rate of income tax. <laughs> oh my God! Sometimes due to internet lagging, no problem is there. Extremely sorry. So it is given rate of income tax is thirty percent with effect from one four two thousand twenty seven. Actually, your accounting year is ending on thirty first of three two thousand twenty seven. So from next year, that means in future, our income tax rate, which is presently is forty percent, but in future it will be equal to thirty percent. That means later on, when I am going to compute the future maintainable profit. And from there on, when I am going to later on subtract the provision for tax, I will apply provision for tax on the basis of future income tax rate of thirty percent. Presently, it is forty percent. Is it clear to you? Normal rate of return now it is given on long term capital employed is fifteen percent. What is long term capital employed and what is a shareholders fund employed? First of all, you need to understand that when we compute capital employed. we always subtract what we call liabilities from the assets and we get the figure of capital employed no doubt about that of course when we do, when we do the computation in the context of the goodwill when we consider asset as you know some important point we need to take care as i've already told you goodwill non trading investment and any non trading what we call asset will be ignored the capital employed which we arrive generally is also known as as per shareholders fund approach normally when we compute capital employed this capital employed is nothing but capital employed as per shareholders fund approach as per shareholders fund approach what does it mean because by subtracting various liability from assets whatever net assets which we get these net assets suggest that these are the assets available for shareholders that is why this capital employed is also known as shareholders fund approach you must have noted that when we compute capital employed we subtract all type of liability whether short term or long term liability correct that mean normally when we compute capital employed it is nothing but capital employed as per shareholders fund approach but when we are going to compute capital as per long term fund approach the only difference is that while subtracting the liability i am not going to subtract debentures this is the only difference that mean when we get capital employed without subtracting debentures or any long term liability in that case the capital fund which we arrive at would be known as capital fund as per long term fund approach is it clear to you this time we have to compute goodwill by applying what we call capital employed by computing capital employed on long term fund approach and shareholders fund approach correct so they have given normal rate of return of separately for long term capital employed 15% for short term capital uh, sorry for shareholders fund capital employed 20% this is what you are already given first we are going to find out goodwill as per shareholders fund approach because this is exactly what we are adopt we have adopted so far and most of the time actually more often than not we always use shareholders fund approach very rarely entities use a long term fund approach 
in order to compute the capital employed first of first first of all what i am going to do i am going to write tangible fixed asset of course trade investments are given in the question i told you i will consider it at 12 lakh because it is 150% of the face value current asset i will consider my total assets will become 86 lakh i will subtract both the liabilities there are two liabilities 10% debentures and creditors in the question correct so 10% debentures and current liability we will subtract and we will get what we call our capital employed now what is the amount of capital employed i will let you know capital employed in this manner is coming to 68 lakh capital employed is 68 lakh your capital employed will be equal to 68 lakh now the next point is now we need to find out <coughs> what we call future maintainable profits in order to compute the future maintainable profits what i am supposed to do first of all i am going to write average profit which is given to us after tax the first thing is that whenever profits after tax will be given in the question what you should do you convert and if tax rate is also given then you convert them into before tax in order to convert them into before tax what you are going to do you are simply going to write profit after tax and divide them by 1 minus tax rate 1 minus tax rate now you can see actually my profit is 15 lakh and tax rate is 40% so 1 minus 0.40 that mean it is equal to 0.60 so 15 lakh divided by 0.60 will tell me what was my profit before tax so average profit before tax first of all we will have to convert the profits after tax into before tax then we will use the adjustments as far as adjustments are concerned in this particular question there are no adjustments correct there are no future saving future losses so this will be considered as our future maintainable profit before tax obviously i will have to now make a provision for tax as i told you in future now the tax rate will be 30% so you are going to compute tax rate at the rate of 30% 750 so your future maintainable profit after tax will become 17 lakh 50000 is it clear to you now in this particular question <clears throat> understand one thing years of purchase is not given if years of purchase is not given then you are left off with no uh, with no alternative you will have to use the capitalization capitalized value method to compute the amount of goodwill so if years of purchase is not given in the question in that particular case first of all we will take into account the future maintainable profit that is 17 lakh 50000 and we we will have to compute the capitalized value as i told you earlier in order to find out the capitalized value you will have to divide it by normal rate of return so your actual capital employed is 68 lakh under shareholders fund approach and market value is 87 lakh 50000 that is capitalized value so goodwill as per this approach is 19 lakh 50000 now coming over to the calculation of goodwill through long term fund approach now under long term fund approach what i told you first of all i am going to compute recompute the capital employed but this time when i am going to compute the capital employed everything is same only thing is that i will not subtract debentures i have written here also less 10% debenture but i have written in bracket under long term fund approach long term debts shall not be subtracted for computation of capital employed so i am subtracting only the current liabilities to so 76 lakh as you must have noticed in this case my capital employed is higher obviously if my capital employed is higher my goodwill most probably will also be higher correct see here now we will compute the future maintainable profits similar to this similar to the last one first of all you will have to actually convert them into before tax your before tax will be equal to 25 lakh now in this case no future adjustments are there no doubt about that your future maintainable profit after tax will become 25 lakh and then you are going to subtract 7 lakh 50000 so future maintainable profit after tax will be equal to 17 lakh 50000 but 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 very important this profit 17 lakh 50000 is there but this profit will increase now why because if you are not subtracting the debenture that mean you are not considering debenture as your liability you are considering it as a part of your capital that is what we mean by not subtracting debentures so that is the reason in this particular case i will have to add interest on debenture that is 8 lakh into 10% this is the only point which you will have to take care of when you are going to compute the goodwill through long term fund approach so now you will have total amount of 18 lakh 30000 so under long term fund approach your profits future maintainable profit after all relevant adjustments will be 18 lakh 30 and 
normal rate of return you divide it to find out capitalized value and you are going to subtract your what we call capital employed and you will get goodwill of 46 lakhs as we have noted that under shareholders fund approach we had a goodwill of 19 lakh 50 but as per this approach long term fund approach goodwill amount is 46 lakh and this 26 lakh 50 thousand is known as leverage effect leverage effect what exactly we mean by leverage as you must have studied leverage in your financial management you know a firm is considered as leverage when it is having a what we call debt element correct so that leverage effect on goodwill that mean goodwill is higher on account of long term debts that is the point is correct now we take up another question now as far as this particular question is concerned in this particular question balance sheet of jet 9 limited is given and it is given on what we call 31st of 3 2027 in this particular question relevant items one is tangible fixed asset correct and then current asset investment and goodwill we are not more concerned up with and there are two liabilities this question is similar to the one which we just a moment ago correct i think you should be in a position to do this particular question this is absolutely same question Correct. So you should be in a position to do this question. See here, I will simply go through the question. Here again, the profits are given as 6 lakh, including 10,000 as interest on investment. Correct. Further, it is written, as you know, 10,000 you are going to subtract from 6 lakh. However, an additional amount of 50,000 per annum shall be required for the smooth running of the business. You will subtract this question. You can do easily because this is the same question. Correct. This is the same question, but only difference is that when you will get 41,500 as your super profit, even in that question which we did earlier, super profits was 41,500. But in that particular question, we computed goodwill at four years purchase. So I think that came to near about 166. But this time, years of purchase is not mentioned. So if years of purchase is not mentioned, you simply capitalize the super profits. Super profits of 41,500, you divide it by normal rate of return and your goodwill will be 4,15,000. This is the only difference between last question and this question. The last to last question. Both these questions are absolutely same. Question number seven. Tangible fixed asset, we are more concerned. Goodwill, we will not consider. Intangible fixed assets are also given. Of course, we will take that into account. And then as far as your liabilities are concerned, current liabilities are given in the question. And then below it is given fixed tangible fixed assets are revalued at 27 lakh. Tangible fixed asset have been revalued at 27 lakh. That means value has gone up. The company is expected to settle the disputed bonus claim of 1 lakh not provided for in the accounts. Now, a dispute is ongoing and company has not settled the what we call bonus claim. So now at the time of valuation of the goodwill, the party who would acquire our business, it will insist upon the fact that you need, you must subtract this expense from your profit and loss account to show the true worthiness of your business. So that is the reason company is expected to settle the bonus claim one lakh and company is expected to settle the bonus claim. Remember one thing, correct? Company is expected to settle the bonus claim and company has not provided for it in the accounts. That means this item hasn't been subtracted yet. So that is the reason we will have to pass an entry, profit and loss account because it will be a loss to the entity to bonus payable account. When we are going to provide for it, that means two things will happen. Our profits will reduce and at the same time, our liability will get created. So bonus payable account. You are going to write here bonus payable account. Bonus payable account. Is it clear to you or not? Is it clear to you? So one lakh, one lakh. This will be the entry. On account of this, two things will happen. Your profits will reduce and at the same time, your liability will also increase by one lakh. Further, it is written, goodwill is appearing in the balance sheet and this is purchased goodwill. You must have noticed very seldom I say that I expect this question to strike in the examination. Under NBFC, I did actually pointed out to you that some way the limited sort of question you could strike in the examination, surprisingly, even of 14 marks. So do not blink your eyes at that time. Similarly, this is one such question where I do not know why I'm having a sort of hunch that such question, this question might strike. So just keep an eye over this particular question also. In this particular question, I will read it further. There is already goodwill appearing in the balance sheet. 
there is goodwill already appearing in the balance sheet correct and further it is written below that goodwill appearing in the balance sheet is purchased goodwill we are not concerned with this line that it is purchased goodwill or self generated goodwill important thing is that it is considered reasonable to increase the value of goodwill by an amount equal to the average of the book value and valuation made at 3 years purchase of super profits for the last 4 years what does it mean whatever goodwill is there in the balance sheet we want to increase it by how much we should increase it we want to increase it it is considered reasonable to increase the value of goodwill by an amount equal to the average of the book value how you are going to take the average of the book value whatever book value is given you simply divide it by 2 that will become average of the book value then you do the valuation of goodwill valuation of goodwill correct so by this amount you are going to increase the amount of goodwill whatever goodwill is there in the balance sheet it will get increased by average of this figure plus whatever goodwill we have, which we are going to derive through valuation this is the point which you need to understand correct it is considered reasonable to increase the value of goodwill by an amount equal to the average of the book value and a valuation made at 3 years purchase of simple average super profits of last 4 years so we will have to compute the goodwill first of all that is the main point further you are being given after profits after tax profits are given 2023 24 profit after tax and tax rate is 40% is 3 lakh then in 2024 it is 3.5 lakhs in 2025 26 it is equal to 4 lakhs and 2026 27 it is equal to 4.1 lakhs so this is given to us further it is given normal expectation in the industry to which the company belong is 10% it is an interesting question a certain the amount of goodwill a similar sort of question is also there in your mtp i think most probably i do i don't remember i think december 23 mtp correct detailed solution first of all what what i told you move into goodwill that whenever you are being given profits after tax it convert them into before taxes so profits of 2023 24 5 lakh given to us is it clear to you 2024 25 profits are given actually these profits are 3 lakh so here i have written profits before taxes so i'm converting it into before taxes so 3 lakh divided by 0.60 1 minus 0.40 is your tax rate so you are converting it so before tax profit will be equal to this much similarly 3.5 lakh divided by 1 Minus 0.40, that is 0.60. It will be equal to this much. And similarly, you will first of all convert all the profits. Is it clear to you? After converting all the profits into before tax, now you will have to subtract the bonus payable, because bonus payable will reduce the amount of our current year profit. So current year profit 2026-7 profit. So one lakh we will subtract it. Are you getting my point or not? Why we subtracted bonus payable? Because this is a normal business expense, so which we haven't provided so far. But now we have, we will have to provide it. So now my total profits, so current year's profit will be equal to five lakh eighty three thousand three hundred thirty three before tax. Actually, current year profit is four point one divided by one minus point four zero. That is divided by four point one. Divided by one minus point four zero, you will get a figure of six lakh eighty three thousand three hundred thirty three. Subtract bonus payable, then it figure will be equal to five lakh eighty three thousand three hundred thirty three. Then add all these profits. After adding all these profit divided by four, you will get five lakh eighty three thousand three hundred thirty three as what we call your average profit. now because there is no adjustment to be made with respect to any future scenario so in this case this will be considered as your future maintainable profit then you simply subtract the amount of tax and your future maintainable profit after tax will be equal to 3 lakh 50000 now we will have to compute the capital employed in order to compute the capital employed because capital employed fixed tangible asset or property plant and equipment is 27 lakh 
and there are intangible asset intangible assets are considered as part of asset 260000 so you will subtract the liability and here i have written bonus payable bonus payable also you will subtract now because another liability got created when you are going to pass that entry which i just mentioned earlier correct so ultimately your capital employed will be equal to 1860000 once you have computed the capital employed you are in a position to compute the normal capital employed So, uh, sorry the normal profit capital employed into normal rate of return 186000 then you are going to compute super profits future maintainable profits minus normal profits your future maintainable profits 350000 minus normal profit 186 so 164 will be your super profits into 3 so goodwill will be equal to 492000 average value average book value of goodwill plus goodwill your average value will be 5 lakh Plus goodwill is equal to four lakh ninety two thousand divided by two. So by this much amount, your by this much amount actually the value of your goodwill will increase. So revised value of goodwill, which is given in the balance sheet, it will get increased by this much. Correct. Actually, the question in the initial stage is told that we have to increase the value of the goodwill by book value pl plus valuation of goodwill. Correct. So this will be this will be the amount of Uh, amount by which we will have to increase the amount of goodwill so this is how you are going to do this particular question and besides that there is another question question number 8 in this particular case balance sheet of y limited as on 31st of 3 2028 is given to you now now in this balance sheet what is given to us we are being given goodwill tangible fixed asset current asset so tangible fixed asset current assets are items of relevancy and then coming over to the liability side provision for tax trade creditors and bank overdraft are three items regarding which we are more concerned of with further it is written in 2000 when the company started its activities the paid off capital was same we are not concerned with this line the profit and loss for the last 5 years this is important line we are more concerned of with this now in this case you are being given <coughs> profits or loss in the year 2023 24 there is a loss and then after this there is a chain of profits as you can see correct after this year in the following years the company is earning profits further it is given income tax rate so far has been 40% and the above profits have been arrived at on the basis of such tax rate so all these profits which are given to us are after tax profits from 2027 28 the rate of income tax will become 45% in this question it is given 10% dividend in 2024 2025 and 10% of dividend in 2024 25 2025 26 and 15% dividend in 2026 27 27 28 has been paid further it is written market price of the share is 125 also it is given with effect from 14 2024 managing directors remuneration actually you change the state it should be 14 2027 because balance sheet date is 31st 3 2027 that mean in future with effect from future the managing director remuneration will be 20 lakh instead of 15 lakh that mean managing director remuneration will increase by 5 lakh it will be considered as a future expense further it is given that company has secured a contract and from which it will can it can earn an additional 10 lakh per annum for the next 5 years so it is a future gain correct and we have to do calculate the value of goodwill at 3 years purchase of super profits for calculation of future maintainable profits weighted average profits to be taken now this time another twist to the tail is that we will I have to take weighted average so how to compute the weighted average first of all write the profits only those years where profits are there that mean if a particular year there is a loss in ignore it out is it clear to you for example in this question in the very first year there was a loss so i completely ignored it out correct so only four years profit we have written and these profits are after taxes first of all we you must convert them into before tax as you know how you are going to convert them 1 minus 
First of all, write the profits, divide them by one minus tax rate. Your present tax rate is 40%. I, I think so in the question, yes, it is 40%. So one minus 0 0.40. So divide this profit by one minus 0 0.40. You will get profit before taxes. These are your profit before taxes. Now simply give a weight to them. Weight one, two, three, four, correct? A total of the weight is 10. Now you multiply these profits with respective weights and get the weighted profits. Now add them up, you will get what we call six, 603 lakhs divided by its sum of weight. Sum of weight is 10. And now this resultant figure will be termed as what we call weighted average profit. Indirectly, it is your average profit or average adjusted profit. Now, as far as future scenario is concerned, there will be an increase in managing director's remuneration to the extent of 5 lakh you are going to subtract. Further, you are going to add because in future you are, you have acquired or secured a contract which will deliver you, fetch you a return of 10 lakh, you are going to add it. So after adding all these things, we get what we call 65 lakh 30,000. Subtracting 5 lakh, adding 10 lakh, we get 65 lakh 30,000. Now in future, the tax rate will be 45%. So future maintainable profit after tax will be equal to 35 lakh 91,500. Is it clear to you? Then we will compute the capital employed. In order to compute, in order to compute the capital employed, write your tangible fixed asset then current asset, then subtract all the liabilities. There are three liabilities. Your capital employed will be equal to 168 lakh. Now, in this case, the next step is, first of all, it is given in the question that in the first two years, your rate of dividend is 10%. And in the last three years, your rate, sorry, in the next two years, we are talking about these four years. In the first two years, because we have ignored the year in which loss has occurred. So, after that, in the first two years, rate of dividend is 10%, 10%, and in the later two years, rate of dividend is 15, 15%. You take the average of it. So your average rate of dividend is 12.5%. If question would have stated only till up to this particular point, then I would have considered, I would have had considered 12.5% as normal rate of dividend. Correct? I would have had considered 12.5% as my normal rate of dividend. But in this question, very disguisedly, correct, very stealthily, they have given market price also. Whenever in the question market price will be given, you will have to actually adjust your normal dividend, normal rate of return. In order to find normal return, now what you will do, whatever your average dividend is there, you divide it by market price of the share. Correct. You divide it by the market price of the share and compute the percentage. So by doing that, you will get normal rate of return. Correct. Normal rate of return means the return which is normally fetched in the market. That is what we mean by that. So that is why you will have to adjust here your normal rate of return. But why we adjusted here? Because this time the market price of the share is also given. Correct. So once you have at your disposal capital employed a normal rate of return, you can find out the normal profit. Now, from the future maintainable profit, you will subtract the your normal profit. You will get what we call this much of super profits and goodwill into three years of purchases this much. Correct. After that, after that, there is question number nine. And this question is from your December 23 examination. This was the only question actually where only goodwill part is there. And this question we have already covered. You must have noticed that in our module, Two questions of similar nature were there. Similar nature. You can easily manage this particular question. I will read the question and you can easily manage it. See, even in this question, your equity share capital, preference share capital is given. Other equity is also given. Now, importantly, there are two liabilities, debentures and trade payables. So you will write here, debentures and trade payables. Then property, plant and equipment is there. Goodwill we will not consider. Non-current investment or non-trading we will not consider. We will take into account current asset. Correct. And then similar to the last two question, correct, which we did. Here it is given profits for current year, which is 22-23, 40000 And it includes 14000 as interest on investment. You will subtract it. Similarly, additional amount of 70000 per annum shall be spent for the smooth running of the business. Correct. So you must have seen actually how many questions have struck directly and straight away from our module. So 70,000 you will subtract. Then market value of property, plant and equipment is estimated at this much. In order to match the above figures of further additional depreciation to the extent of 56,000 will be considered. So additional depreciation is also given. You will subtract it. 
income tax rate is now 50%. Further, it is written additional depreciation is not allowed for income tax purpose. I have already solved this question. This question, question number 9 is absolutely to the question which we have done earlier. Correct, you have you must have noticed. So, I need not require to make, show you again that particular question. And here it is given rate of income tax is 20% before tax. So you will have to convert it after tax. Your tax rate is 50%. And for the purpose of determining the actual rate of return, profits for this year after aforementioned adjustment may be taken as expected profit. And similarly, average trading capital employed need to be computed. So I have already done the computation. Now you can easily compute this particular question because two questions of same nature we have already solved. Now regarding lots of queries I have received from a student regarding economic value added June 24 paper and yes, yes, in, in fact, I consider my mistake. Here cost of equity I have written here 15.5% and you all are absolutely right. I do not know actually why I, I have written here 1.5 but while doing the calculation I do not know why I was taking it as 1.1, 1.1. Perhaps in the previous question beta rate was 1.1. So you all are absolutely right and lots of messages I have received and thank you very much for pointing it out. I am not one of those who is, who is not going to actually accept his mistake whether it is advertently or inadvertently. First of all, uh, Srinivas and Gopalan brought it to my notice. Then there were three, four more students who brought it to my notice. Thankful to all of them. Yes, you all are absolutely right. Your cost of equity will be 20% in this particular case. Correct? I accept it wholeheartedly. And number one thing regarding discounted cash flow, regarding discounted cash flow questions of goodwill, we have covered that under what we call in days 113. Two questions we have included over there regarding discounted cash flow also. So when will I will do in days 113 over there, I will discuss the discounted cash flow method of computation of goodwill also. Correct. So on such note, we take leave of you and hope shares is on the card. So as far as valuation of shares is concerned, we come directly straight to the business end to start today's this particular session. So as far as valuation of shares is concerned, as you know better than I actually, there are basically two broad methods of computing uh, value of shares, correct? Now, as you know, one is known as assets backing method, also known as net assets method. And through this particular method, we are trying to find out the intrinsic value of shares. Generally, such sort of method or such sort of methodology, that is assets backing method or or what we call net, as net assets method. Generally, such sort of methodology is adopted by such investors who have made huge investments into the other entities, correct? Why? Because they are more concerned with the what we call safety of their money. They want to know the huge block of money which they have invested into other entity whether it is safe or not what happens suppose tomorrow company undergoes liquidation so best way to know about the healthiness of the entity is to compute the intrinsic value of share so through assets backing method or what we call net assets method we get intrinsic value of share now if suppose intrinsic value of share happens to be more than the face value that means your investment is absolutely safe on the other hand, there are some investors who are more interested in the what we call earning capacity. They are more interested in the trading activity and how much their what we call investment could fetch return to them for that purpose. They want to actually use, they want to compute earning per share and which they can uh, compute through what we call yield method, also known as what we call uh, earning capacity method. Besides that, uh, the combination of these two methods, as you know, is known as fair value method. Under fair value method, we simply take the average of the intrinsic value of share, which we compute through net assets method, and we take what we call earning per share, which we compute through yield method, and the average of these two would deliver us fair value. Now, the next question is how to compute the intrinsic value of share. As you know, intrinsic value of share can be computed by applying net assets method or what we call assets backing method. Under it, first of all, what we are supposed to do, we are going to take into account all the assets, all the assets. But once again, here you need to exercise caution because this time you are computing net assets in the contest of valuation of share. In the contest of valuation of goodwill, generally we do not take what we call goodwill, which is appearing in the balance sheet and also non-trading investment. But as far as in the context of valuation of share is concerned, whenever we are going to take into consideration assets, we will include what we call non-trading investment and also goodwill. Obviously, we will exclude fictitious assets. So all these assets you are going to take into account at revised value in case the revised value is available. 
From there on, you are going to subtract the external liability. And by subtracting the liability from the various assets, obviously we will get the net assets. Net assets indirectly also means capital employed. And indirectly, it also means assets available for shareholders. Assets available for shareholders. When we say shareholders, it includes the preference shareholders also. So right now, you have arrived over what we call net assets available for shareholders. In order to compute the intrinsic value of share, actually we need assets available for equity share. So for the same, now I will have to subtract the preference share capital which is appearing in the balance sheet. Now if in the additional information it is given that there are some areas of preference dividend, I will also subtract the areas of preference dividend. Many a time a student asks, sir, do we need to compute the preference dividend and subtract? No, nothing like that. If preference share capital is given in the balance sheet, you will simply subtract it. You are going to subtract areas of preference dividend only when it is given in the additional information. It is clear to you or not. Now you are going to get assets available for equity share. Then you are going to divide the assets available for equity share by the total number of what we call equity share. This way around you will be able to find out intrinsic value of the share. I have already told you if intrinsic value of the share happens to be more than the face value, that means you need to require to worry. Your investment is absolutely safe. Now, in order to make you understand <clears throat> two important aspects with respect to what we call computation of net assets, first of all, we are going to pick up this particular example. In this particular example, I have simply asked you to compute what we call net assets available for equity share. Now, it's a very small balance sheet, very small balance sheet. Only two items are there towards the asset side. One is non-current asset, as you can see. Another one is current asset and total of the asset is equal to 15 lakh. Towards the liability side, towards the liability side, we have got liability. And besides that, we have got equity share capital, preference share capital, and reserves. Now, suppose if in, if in this particular question, I would ask you to compute the net assets available for equity shares, how you are going to compute. Obviously, you are going to add your property, plant, and equipment, and current asset, and you are going to subtract the liability. So current asset and non-current asset you are going to add, you are going to subtract the liability, and this will be termed as net assets or capital employed or what we call assets available for shareholders. But we are interested in finding out assets available for equity shares. So I will have to subtract the preference share capital, correct? And then I will get assets available for equity share. It is very simple. But the point I tr I'm trying to actually make you understand is that often in the examination, actually, you will not be given complete information or comprehensive balance sheet, correct? Under such circumstances, you need to know, com you need to know the art of computing what we call assets available for uh, assets available for equity shareholder through liability side approach now through liability side approach what i am going to do actually i have already told you what we mean by equity first of all you compute equity and i have already told you so many times even under in india ascended in three india ascended in ten that equity stands for net assets so now what i am going to do i am going to actually take into account equity share capital preference share capital total preference share capital i will add what we call reserve in case if there are some fictitious asset i will subtract the same then I will get what we call equity. Equity means net assets or capital employed or assets available for shareholders. Correct? But we are more interested in finding out what we call share, uh, assets available for shareholders. So I will have to subtract now preference share capital, which I have earlier included. So after subtracting the preference share capital, I can easily get assets available for equity share. This is how you are going to use what we call liability side approach to compute net assets available for equity share. Another important aspect in this particular case, you need to understand this example very well. Because so often, I've already told you through... The, in the examination, you are going to get a combined question. So you have, you have to compute the capital employed for the purpose of goodwill in the same question and also capital employed in the context of the valuation of the share. So sometimes it creates a bit of confusion. In order to what we call eradicate this particular confusion, I have taken another example. Now kindly actually go through it. We are going to take here first non-current assets are given in the question. Pay attention. Book value of the investment is 3 lakh because it is written in the outer column. And its market value although happens to be 2 lakh. Besides that, we have got goodwill and we have got current assets. Correct? This is our total of asset side. Now, liability side, equity share capital, preference share capital, reserves and liability total is 15 lakh. Now, suppose in this question, if I want to compute capital employed or net assets, correct, available for shareholders and for what we call equity shareholders. So, how I am going to compute? The point important which you need to understand is this. So under it, you need to understand that 
in the context of goodwill if suppose i am going to compute the net assets first of all in the context of goodwill i will take into account the non current asset i have already told you in the context of the goodwill when we compute capital employed on net asset we never take non trading investment i have already told you these are non trading investment because nothing is mentioned so always presume investment are non trading correct and you are not going to take into account what we call goodwill also so you are going to ignore these two item when you are going to compute what we call assets available for shareholders or capital employed in the context of the goodwill i am talking about in the context of the goodwill we are not going to take these two item we are going to take only these two item and i am going to subtract the liability that's exactly what i have done over here correct in the context of the goodwill when i am going to compute the capital employed also known as assets available for shareholders i will take into account the non current asset i will not take into account goodwill i will not take into account what we call non trading investment i will take into account uh, what we call current asset then i will subtract the liability so you can see here we are getting what we call 6 lakh now this 6 lakh happens to be net assets or capital employed in the context of goodwill in the context of goodwill now suppose if in this if in the same data i am going to ask compute net assets or capital employed for uh, in the context of valuation of the shares then how you are going to compute because when we compute capital employed in the context of the shareholders we have to take into account goodwill and non trading investment which we haven't taken earlier so i will add add them back are you getting my point so this will become what we call net assets or capital employed in the context of what we call shares so this is the point which you need to understand is it clear to you but you must have paid attention when here i am adding back when here i am adding back i am adding back only the market value this is the point i am trying to actually bring to your notice you are going to add back investment no doubt about that but you are going to add back investment at market value this is the point you need to take into account similarly suppose if i would have had adopted what we call liability side approach as usual first of all i will going to take into account equity share capital preference share capital reserves correct when i am going to actually add all these three item it tells me the capital employed it is the meaning of capital employed no doubt about that because it means equity share capital plus reserve is equal to equity equity is always equal to net assets net asset is always equal to capital employed indirectly it means this total 10 lakh 5 plus 4 plus 1 is nothing but assets available for shareholder but problem is that as i told you suppose i am interested in finding out capital employed through liability side approach for the purpose of valuation of goodwill correct then what i will have to do i should not take into account what we call goodwill and non trading investment although i am adopting what we call although i am adopting liability side approach you might feel sir we haven't taken into account goodwill and non trading investment no because when you are taking equity when you are adding back equity share capital preference share capital and reserves indirectly it means you are taking the difference of all the assets and liability all the assets and liability and in all the asset goodwill is also there and non trading investment is also there so that is the reason you will have to subtract these two item pay attention through liability side approach when you are going to subtract goodwill and non trading investment non trading investment in, is being subtracted at book value this is these are the final points which you need to take into account so now you are going to get net assets or capital employed for the purpose of valuation of goodwill now this will become your net assets or capital employed for the purpose of goodwill now the point important is that we are more interested we are more interested in finding out what we call capital employed for the purpose of capital employed for the purpose of valuation of uh, shares now if i want to do if i want to compute what we call capital employed for the purpose of valuation of approach through liability side approach correct then what i am supposed to do i will again add back the amount of goodwill and again i will add back the amount of non trading investment so i can easily get what we call 10 lakh is it clear to you or not so these are the finer points which you need to be aware of before you become very deft actually in distinguishing between the diff in distinguishing the difference between the capital employed in the context of the goodwill and capital employed in the context of the shares now next part i have written something but i will explain it now in the examination as we have already seen as far as computation of intrinsic value of share is concerned it is not going to pose us any problem 
Intrinsic value of share can be arrived very easily as you must have noticed all we have to do is to pick up all the assets including non-trading investment and goodwill at revised value in case if revised values are there then I will have to subtract the liability I will have to compute the net assets and net assets here means net assets for shareholders so I will have to subtract the preference share capital in case preference share capital is there in the balance sheet and in case if there are areas of dividend if there are areas of dividend I will have to subtract the same and then I can easily get what we call net assets available for equity shareholders net assets for equity shareholders once I will get this particular figure net assets available for equity shareholders I will have to simply then divide it by total number of equity share this is how I can easily compute what we call number of equity share then I can get easily intrinsic value of the share problem is that when in the question one class of equity share capital is partly paid up under such circumstances there is a bit of problem I should not say problem actually there is a bit of caution which you need to take into account and consider before you attempt what we call in finding out intrinsic value of share let's go through this particular question to understand how we are going to compute intrinsic value of share in case if in the question one class is fully paid actually fully paid is not going to give us any trouble if one class also happens to be partly paid in the same question let's have a look this is the balance Balance sheet of RB Limited as on 31st of 3, 2028. In the balance sheet, we are being given goodwill. We are being given other fixed asset besides that other current asset and preliminary expenses are valueless asset. We are not concerned with this. 30,000 equity shares of 10 each. So total paid up value will be 3 lakh. And 10,000 equity shares of 10 each, 8 per paid paid up. You must have noticed this class is partly paid up. That means rupee 2 worth of call is still yet to be called because we have called up only uh, 8 out of 10. Anyways, 10,000 into 8, 80,000 is the paid off value. Total paid off value of equity share capital, no doubt about that, 3,80,000. Besides that, we have got what we call reserves and then two liabilities in the form of debentures and current liability, correct? Below it is written, goodwill is independently valued at 50,000. Fine. Actually, goodwill in the balance sheet, 70,000 is given. Its revised value is given. You will consider revised value. Likewise, other fixed asset, 420, 450 in the balance sheet. Revised value, 420 is at your disposal. Another important point. There was a contingent liability of 20,000. Although it is written, which has become payable. Remember one thing, while computing net assets, either under valuation of goodwill or for that instance, under valuation of share. Whenever contingent liability would be given, you will always consider it as a liability. You will presume that this liability has materialized and converted into a real liability. Is it whether it is written or not. Although in this question it is written, which has become payable, whether this line would have been written or not, I would have still considered this as a liability. Is it clear to you? Now in this particular question, we have to determine the value of both the type of share under net assets method. Indirectly, it means we have to compute the intrinsic value of share. In order to compute the intrinsic value of the share, first of all, we'll consider all the assets. We'll take into account their revised value in case if it is appearing. So goodwill revised value 50,000, other fixed asset revised value 420. Then I will consider current asset. After taking into account, obviously preliminary expenses will not be considered. The preliminary expenses, underwriting, commission, discount on issue of share, they are fictitious item. I will subtract the current liability which is given in the question. I will also subtract the 11% debentures and as I told you, contingent liability payable I will have to subtract. Under valuation of share and valuation of goodwill, whenever you are going to compute net assets or for that instance capital employed, you must subtract, must subtract what we call contingent liability. Correct? Presuming, that, presuming it that it has now become payable. Obviously, now we will get net assets available for shareholders. Correct? Net assets for shareholder. But our task is to find out assets available for equity share. So, I will have to subtract the dues of the preference shareholder. Dues means the preference share capital. Unfortunately, in this question, there is no preference share capital. Correct? If there is no preference share capital, no information is possible in... Uh, possible below so areas of preference dividend if it is given under the additional information you must subtract otherwise you won't then we will get the amount available for equity shares now we have derived the amount available for equity shares after having derived the amount available for equity share actually 
if there would have been only one class of share, I could have had easily computed intrinsic value of share simply by dividing it by the number of share. But problem is that in this particular question, there are two classes of share. One class is 30,000 shares of 10 each fully paid. Another is 10,000 shares of eight paid up. So when there will be more than one class of share and one is fully paid, another one is partly paid under such circumstances in order to find out intrinsic value of share, you have got two alternatives at your disposal. Alternative one is a little bit simpler. It's a little bit simpler. Under this alternative, first of all, you are going to write assets available for equity share. Then you will take into account the total paid up value of your equity share capital. Total, total paid up value of your equity share capital is 3 lakh plus 80. Total paid up value is now 3 lakh 80,000. Correct? That means total value of equity share capital is 3 lakh 80,000. No doubt about that. Now you presume that you presume for a while that what that each share is of rupee one each. If you are presuming this way around that each share is of rupee one each, that means you are presuming that your company is having three lakh eighty thousand share. Quite obviously, because paid up value is three eighty, and if I am going to presume one share is of one, so that means there are three lakh eighty thousand shares of one each. So on such presumption, now you divide. You, now you divide this figure. Assets available for equity share divided by number of equity share, presuming each equity share to be of rupee one. So this way around, you will get this value and this value obviously is intrinsic value of share, but it is intrinsic value of share of rupee one each. So once you have determined intrinsic value of share of rupee one each, now you are in a position to find out the intrinsic value of 10 and intrinsic value of eight paid up. So value of 10 paid up will be 10 into 1.26, 12.60. Similarly, intrinsic value of 8 paid up will be equal to 8 into 1.26 that is equal to 10.08. I have already told you it's a little bit simpler. No doubt about that. When more than one class of equity share is given in the question and one class is fully paid, another one is partly paid up. We have the choice. We can use this method if you want. You, have, you, you can use this. But my advice is instead of using this method, use this one, second alternative. It is always better to use this one because most of the time when partly paid of share capital is given, we generally use this method. So even under this method as usual, because this is the first step, we need to find out, we need to find out and determine assets available for equity share. Correct? By subtracting, I've already told you various liability from the assets and ultimately preference share capital will get assets available for equity share. Once we have determined that, now I will make a national call. National means imagination. Imagination. Through imagination, we will think that there are 10,000 share on which we have called up only eight. So we can still make a call at the rate of rupees two because at the time of liquidation, directors of the company has got this prerogative, this right to call the uncalled amount. So that is why nostril, nostril means through imagination. So through imagination, I will believe that I can still call 20,000 rupees. So if I, I, will, I will call or I will be able to get 20,000 more, obviously now assets available for equity shareholder will move up from 480 to 5 lakh. This 5 lakh will be known as national amount available for equity share. That means national total amount available for equity share will be 5 lakh. Now you divide it by your actual number of equity share, your actual number of equity share, 30,000 plus 10,000, 40,000, you will get intrinsic value. Now this intrinsic value, which you will get, denotes the intrinsic value of fully paid share, that is rupees 10 paid up share. This is intrinsic value of rupees 10 paid up share. And in order to know the intrinsic value of eight paid up share, you subtract from 12.50 the uncalled amount. So if I'm going to subtract from 1250, rupees 2 which is the uncalled amount I can get the what we call intrinsic value of share of 8 paid up is it clear to you so this is how we have to determine intrinsic value of share correct now coming over to the next method intrinsic value of method when I started the chapter I told you actually this particular methodology is generally adopted by such investors correct who are more interested in the earning capacity of their investment or their shares so they generally uh, are more interested in the earning and that is why they are going to use yield, yield method or also known as earning capacity method. Under this particular method, correct, in order to find out the what we call, in order to find out the uh, earning per share, obviously, the first step is to determine the profits available for equity share. 
in order to determine profits available for equity shares first of all you need to have profits after taxes correct and from there on in case if in the question there is information that some amount need to be transferred to general reserve you transfer it similarly if there is some information that some amount need to be transferred towards proposed dividend you subtract it however you have to exercise caution if there is preference share capital if there is preference share capital if there is preference share capital in the question because preference share capital always carry a coupon rate of what we call dividend so that dividend must be subtracted whether any information is given or not that mean in order to determine profits available for equity share under earning capacity method under earning capacity method you are going to subtract preference dividend correct so we are going to subtract the preference dividend ultimately we will get profits available for equity shares after having determined profits available for equity share i am going to compute then expected rate of return it is also known as average rate of return expected rate of return profits available for equity share which you have just determined divided by the total value of equity share total value of equity share means suppose you have got 50000 share one share is of uh, 10 each that means the total value will be equal to 5 lakh divided by 100 you will get what we call expected rate of return once you have the expected rate of return now you are in a position to find out earning per share in order to know the earning per share first of all you write expected rate of return which you computed under step number 2 then divided by normal rate of return which will be given in the question and multiply it by what we call paid off value per share this figure will tell you that you are how much one share of so and so face value can earn this much of amount in the market this is what we mean by earning per share there is another method of computing earning per share you can also compute this way if, if this method appears little bit simple you can use this also instead of three step first of all under the second step you will have to compute profits available for equity share you are going to compute profits available for equity share pfe profits for equity share correct as we computed here under step number 1 correct once you have the profits available for equity share now you have to find out what we call capitalized value now in order to find out the capitalized value what i am going to do i am going to simply divide profits available for equity share by normal rate of return by normal rate of return by dividing this i will get the capitalized value once i will have the capitalized value then i can divide it by number of share so if we are going to divide capitalized value by number of equity shares we can still get earning per share both methodology obviously are going to deliver you the same answer correct so after acquainting ourselves with the basics now we can move a bit further in this particular question let's have a look first of all on 31st of 3 2020 supreme limited provides you following information in this particular information you are being given goodwill other fixed asset and current assets towards the liability side we have equity share capital then general reserve besides that profit and loss account also importantly we have got two liabilities is it clear to you now below it is given on 31st of 3 to 2028 goodwill of the company is valued at 50000 while other fixed assets were valued at 350 that means the revised value of goodwill and other fixed asset is given to you further in this question it is given profits earned by the company in the last 3 years were 52000 51650 sorry 51,600, 52,000 and 51,650. Further it is given every year an amount equal to 20% of the profit earned was transferred to general reserve. So that means this is the policy of the entity that whatever profits they earn actually 20% of that profit they transfer to the general reserve. Correct? And they are transferring it to the general reserve reason is also provided although we are not concerned with that this is considered reasonable in the industry in which it is engaged that means the industry in which this particular entity is functioning that industry itself has got this tradition of transferring every year to 20 year 20 percent of their profits further a 10 percent rate of return on investment is considered fair in this particular industry so this is your normal rate of return now compute the value of the company share by yield method i told you through yield method first of all you need to have the average profit because in this particular question you are given three years of profits first you average them but while doing the computation first total them up 
and similar to the goodwill if there would have been any abnormal losses or abnormal gains you would have done the treatment correct and then total adjusted profit would have been found out as we are doing here and then we are going to divide it by three to get average adjusted profit 51,750 correct in this particular question net profits of the company it is given clearly this way around it is not given whether these profits are after tax or before tax had it been off before tax i would have then subtracted the taxation correct after that suppose if these profits in the question would have been given that these profits are before tax obviously then after that after computing the average profit i would have had subtracted the taxation because only profits after tax, once we shall have at our disposal, then only we can make the appropriation. Now question states that company has a policy of transferring 20% to the general reserve. So as you have seen already, 51,750 worth of profits already computed now because it's a part of tradition to which this particular industry, uh, to, this, uh, to the industry to which this particular entity belongs. So all the firms in that particular industry are transferring 20%. So 20% of 51,750 comes to 10,350. So after subtracting 10,350, we will get what we call profits available for equity share. Remember in this particular question, there is no preference share capital had had preference share capital been given over there i would have had computed preference dividend also correct anyway so now in this case profits available for equity share is 41400 this is the only step which require a little bit of what we will computation after that we need to compute the expected rate of return as i told you for that you need to take into account the profits available for equity share which you just computed after that you divide it by the value of the equity share capital you have already seen in the balance sheet your equity share capital given to you as 4 lakh isn't it or not so divide it by 4 lakh multiply it with 100 to get 10.35 percent this will become your expected rate of return also known as average rate of return once you have computed this now you should be in a position to compute the the earning per share in order to compute the earning per share first of all i will write the expected rate of return normal rate of return in the question is given as 10 percent and then i will have to multiply it with the paid off value not with face value although in this question face value and paid off value is same because fully paid share is there so we can get 10.35 per share what does it mean suppose today if i am the investor if i am going to sell my share of rupees 10 each it can be sold in the market at 10.35 is it clear to you or not now there is another method of there is another way as i told you earlier if you do not want these three steps you can straight away after computing profits available for equity share which is 41400 which we computed under step number one now we are in a position to compute the capitalized value in order to find out the capitalized value i will divide the profits by the normal rate of return that will let me know that total capitalized value of my profit is 4,14,400. What we mean by actually capitalized value? Capitalized value signifies the amount of capital which would be required by the other entities in the market to earn the same amount of profit which is being earned by your entity. Capitalized value of profit signifies the amount of capital which would be required by the other entities in the market to acquire, to to uh, acquire the same amount of profit which is being earned by your uh, your entity indirectly it is market value of your capital correct anyway so four lakh fourteen thousand now you simply divide it by number of share as you can see we are still getting 10.35 per share so either of these two methodology you can adopt to compute what we call your earning per share once you have computed the earning per share uh, once you have become deft in computing our intrinsic value of share and earning per share now we can move over to the next part that is fair value of the share what is fair value of the share i need not require to tell you i have already written here this is simply the average of these two correct in order to understand it better we pick up this particular question 3.1 over here it is written balance sheet and in the balance sheet this time lots of items are given and figure are in lakhs we are being given land, we are being given plant and machinery, then patents, then stock, then sundry datas, then bank balance, and besides that, there is preliminary expense. Preliminary expenses are fictitious item, we are not concerned with that. Fully paid equity share is given, general reserve is also given, then we are being given profit and loss account. Besides that, we have got two liabilities, sundry creditors, and provision for taxation. Now below, it is given that the expert valuer valued the land and building at 240 lakh. Remember one thing, your land and building in the balance sheet was 110. That means your land and building has gone up by 130 lakhs. 
Similarly, value of goodwill is 160 and value of plant is now estimated at 120 and plant earlier actually was 130. So as far as land is concerned, there is an appreciation, but it is moving up by 130. Whereas as far as plant is concerned, there is devaluation. It is coming down by 10. It is moving up by 130. Correct. Out of the total data. Now, another important point is <coughs> out of the total data, it is found that data of 8 lakhs are bad. Now, after having computed these three years of profit or at the time of valuation of shares, now you come to know that, that actually out of total data, 8 lakh worth of data are bad. So obviously you will have to pass the entry for the same. What entry do you pass to write off bad debts? Now because bad debts is a loss, first of all you are going to write bad debts account debit. Two data account. Because when bad debts would occur, your debtors balance will get reduced. So this is the entry which you are supposed to pass, correct? Bad debts account debit. And then yet another entry will be passed, profit and loss account debit to bad debts. On account of these two entries, you must have noticed actually what consequences are following now. Two consequences are following because if I am going to pass one single entry, entry will be profit and loss account debit to debtors. That means profit is also reducing and data is also reducing. So what you are going to do, you are going to first of all subtract 8 lakh from the current year's profit. And also while computing the assets, you will take the datas at whatever figure they are given. Uh, you will have to subtract this amount of 8 lakh. Further, it is given that company is engaged in diamond cutting business and normal industry return is 10% of the value of the shares. 10% return is there. It is the practice of the company to transfer 25% of profits to the general reserve. Plant and land have been depreciated at 15% and 10%. Now this figure 10% and 10% this is a rate of depreciation. Obviously you will have to use it. Why? Because in this question there is fluctuations in the value of land and plant. Obviously there will be additional depreciation because of appreciation and there will be reduction in depreciation because of what we call reduction in value in plant. Now in this question, we are supposed to find out the value of the share under intrinsic value of method, then through yield method and fair value method, correct? So first of all, we'll take into account what we call net assets method to find out intrinsic value of shares. In order to find out intrinsic value of share, I'm going to pick up land at revised value, plant at revised value. Goodwill, obviously, I will consider because I am computing assets available for share in the contest of valuation of shares. Patents are also there. Patents will be considered. Stock will be taken into account. And regarding daters, as I told you, daters are 88, but you have to reduce it by 8. Now you will consider 80. Cash balance is 52. Total becomes 720. Correct? Now, from there on, you are going to subtract your two liabilities, sundry creditors and provision for taxation. That is 188. You will get 532. Obviously, this figure will be considered as capital employed or net assets, but it indirectly it means assets available for shareholders. Assets available for shareholders. Once again, in this particular question, preference share capital is missing. If preference share capital is not there, quite obviously no question arises with respect to any information in the additional information in with respect to areas of preference dividend. So amount available for equity share will become 532 and we will have to divide it by the total number of share because figures are given in lakhs. Actually, we have total equity share capital of rupees 2 lakh and one share is of 100. So number of share is equal to 2 lakh. But all these figures are in lakh, so I have written here 2, that means 2 lakh. So 532 divide by 2, we get intrinsic value equal to 266. So as far as intrinsic value of share is concerned, that is not a very tough nut to crack. Coming over to the earning per share. As far as earning per share is concerned, what you are supposed to do as usual, under intrinsic, sorry, under earning capacity method, first of all, I will take into account all the profits. Now you must have noticed the current year's profit is 96. I have subtracted eight bad debts. So total profits now 268. There is no abnormal loss, no abnormal profit in the question. So 268 will be my total adjusted profit. I will divide it by three to get what we call average adjusted profit. Now in the average adjusted profit in this particular question, because there is an upvaluation in the value of land, 
correct so on account of that i will have to provide some additional depreciation rate of depreciation is 10 percent, so 10 percent of 130 will become 13 so it will be considered as a loss to us now actually it is a future loss correct similarly there is a reduction in the value of plant reduction or decline in the value of plant by 10 and the rate of depreciation on plant happens to be 15 percent so obviously it is going to be future saving so 1.5 you are going to add back so by subtracting 13 and adding back 1.5 you are going to get this particular figure you can call it expected profit average maintainable profit future maintainable profit whatever you may like to say correct now after this again in this particular question rate of taxation is not given so no provision for tax correct presuming that all these profits are already after tax now we will have to transfer because in the question there was a line that which suggested that 25 percent of the profits must be transferred to general reserve so i'm going to transfer to general reserve again there is no preference share capital had it been there i would have computed preference dividend and subtracted but in this question preference dividend is not there so this is the figure which you are going to get and this will be considered as profits for equity shareholders once you have computed that now you should be in a position to compute expected rate of return for the same you will have to write profits available for equity share divided by total value of equity share capital which happens to be what we call 200 lakhs and then multiply it with 100 you will get this particular figure expected rate of return now expected rate of return which you have derived that is 29.185 divided by normal rate of return multiply it with 100 to get this value correct you can also find out intrinsic value of share by capitalizing the profits that means your uh, profits available for equity share is 58.37 divided by normal rate of return this will be your capitalized value then divided by number of equity share you will still get the same result now in this question we are in a position to find out fair value of the share obviously we'll take the average of intrinsic value and intrinsic value and this will be the value it is known as fair value fair value is also known as dual method it is also known as dual method correct now there is yet another question and this question is an interesting one balance sheet of channel fox 5 limited as a 31st of 3 2028 is given to you and we are supposed to compute the valuation of share on yield basis obviously in the balance sheet as uh, figures are given this way around and goodwill is given then tangible fixed asset is given then 10 percent uh, trade investment and then current assets are given and then equity share capital preference share capital reserve in surplus debentures and current liabilities are available in the question below it is given average profit after tax of 40 percent so now we come across where percentage of profit is percentage of tax is also given so you must have noticed the average profit after tax is 40 percent uh, average profit after tax 40 percent and profits are given for 2025 12 lakh 18 lakh and 15 lakhs now another interesting point in this particular question is trade investments are valued at 150 percent of the face value which is 8 lakh that means the investment which is given in the balance sheet actually their face value is 8 lakh their face value is 8 lakh now we can say so number one number two as per this particular information now i'm going to compute the value of the investment trade in, and it is clearly written these are trade investments anyway so 8 lakhs into 150 percent 8 lakh into 150 percent will tell me how much i think it is equal to 12 lakh well so value of investment is equal to 12 lakh we can say so certainly 60 percent of debentures are redeemed prior to the valuation of the share this is another line similar sort of question is struck in the examination i think last to last year or perhaps last year now what does this line suggest 60 percent debentures are to be redeemed pay attention here you have debenture 10 percent debenture to the extent of 20 lakh in the balance sheet total worth of debenture is equal to 20 lakh total worth of debenture given to you as 20 lakh now the question states that out of 20 lakh 60 percent debentures have been redeemed now 60 percent first of all let me compute 60 percent so 60 percent will be equal to 12 lakh so that means 12 lakh worth of debentures have been redeemed quite obviously it means 40 percent debentures are remaining 
फोर्टी परसेंट डिवेंचर विल बी इक्वल टू एट लैख सो एट लैख वर्थ ऑफ डिवेंचर्स आर रिमेनिंग नाउ बिकॉज यू हैव रिडीम्ड सिक्सटी परसेंट ऑफ द डिवेंचर्स डेट मीन नो मोर एंटिटी नीड टू पे इंटरेस्ट ऑन दीज डिवेंचर डेट मीन टू थिंग्स विल हैपन when we are going to redeem the debenture the repercussion will be what will be the repercussion or consequences one the repercussion one is that when we are going to redeem the debenture debenture liability will fall down because my entry will be debenture account debit to cash account correct this is the entry generally we pass for redemption of debenture so that mean because of this now my cash balance will reduce because in the question cash is not given so i will have to reduce what we call current asset by rupees 12 lakh and obviously my debenture will also get reduced by rupees 12 lakh number 1 number 2 the second repercussion will be like this because now you have redeemed 60% of the debentures so 60% that mean you were paying interest on full amount of 20 lakh and your rate of interest on debenture is actually 10% so that mean no more in future you are going to pay 10% on 1 lakh 20000 because oh sorry 10% of 12 lakh that comes to 1 lakh 20000 that mean there will be a saving in future in the form of interest so saving amount will be equal to 1 lakh 20000 so this is the point also in this particular question it is given that rate of tax in future will be 30% and normal rate of return on this is trillion dollar line and this is the line which confuse is a student fraternity a lot normal rate of return on net assets now kindly go through the questions all the previous questions not only of this particular chapter but also of valuation of goodwill 99.99% you will find that we are generally given rate of return simply normal rate of return and simply normal rate of return always means rate of return on investments or capital employed but this time the normal rate of return is given on non uh, on net assets available for equity share this is the point which you need to take into account because in this question normal rate of return is based upon net assets available for equity share net assets available for equity share so we will have to make some appropriate changes correct in our methodology how and what will be those changes would be just pay attention here first of all as usual because we have to compute in this particular case valuation of shares i think through earning capacity method you are right on yield basis we are supposed to compute so for that as usual first of all i am going to write the profits 3 years profits are given to us because these profits are after taxes so often i keep on telling you convert them into before tax but when you are going to convert them into before tax you are going to take into account the tax rate which you have already charged that is 40% so 1 minus 40% so you can easily convert them into before tax so your before tax profits will be equal to this so 20 lakh 30 lakh 25 lakh before tax total profits will be equal to 75 lakh 20 lakh 30 lakh 25 lakh 75 lakh divided by 3 to get 25 lakh so your average profit before tax will be equal to 25 lakh now in future i told you you will have a saving in the form of interest on debenture so quite obviously 20 lakh into 60% correct i have already done the computation so 1 lakh 20000 interest on debenture you are going to add it's a sort of future income for you now in this case your adjusted profit will become 26 lakh 20000 now you are we will have to subtract tax correct because in future your tax rate will be 30% you must sub subtract tax at the rate of what we call 30% so by subtracting 30% from 26 lakh 20 we will get profits available for shareholders to the extent of 18 lakh 34000 18 lakh 34000 remember one thing now here i have written less transfer to preference dividend because we are computing profits available for equity share we are computing profits available for equity shares that is why we are subtracting preference dividend preference dividend must be subtracted for computation of profits available for equity share i have already told you correct so 1 lakh 20000 so profits for equity shareholder ultimately will be equal to 17 lakh 14000 once you have computed profits available for equity shares now because we have to do the valuation of equity share through yield basis so i have the two methodology i can use step number 2 and 3 or straight away i can now compute so for that i will compute the capitalized value correct and capitalized 
in order to compute the capitalized value, I will take the profits available for equity shares and then I am going to divide it by normal rate of return which is given to us as 10%. Correct? And then we will get this value. I will then divide it by the total number of equity share. So you can say 42.85 is my valuation of shares. Is it clear to you or not? Right, sir, absolutely clear. Now, if it is clear to you, we can move over to some questions from the recent examination. But before that, let me pick up question number. This is the question no one has solved till this particular day. Correct? Now, after this class, suddenly you will find the solution everywhere. No one has given you complete solution for June 24 till up to this particular day with respect to valuation of goodwill also for consolidation. And because now I have started delivering the solutions, so soon you will have what we call lectures from the other side. Anyway, now in this question, June 24 examination, it is given P Limited provides the following information that is on 31st of 3, 2024. In this particular information, you are being given equity share capital 80,000 shares of rupees 10 each, fully paid, and 50,000 shares of 10 each, four paid up. So, we are so far till up to this particular information, we are being given only this much of information that our equity share capital one class is 80,000 shares of 10 each, one class is 80,000 shares of 10 each and it is fully paid and there is another class that is 50,000 shares as you can see 50,000 shares of 10 each of rupees 10 each but at the rate of 4 so this is partly paid up also in this question you have already noted now there is preference share capital 6 lakh also general reserve is also there besides that we are being given 12% debentures 12% debentures here is a very important line. Assets include a non-trade investment. Assets, actually asset side is not given at all. However, whatever assets are there, now question says that it includes a non-trade investment and the market value of which is 2,40,000 and in the outer column that is book value, they have written 2,80,000. Book value is always written in the outer column. Now question gives you relevant information profit before tax of last three years were 190, 250 and 280,000 respectively. Including income from non-trade investment of 20,000 on an average. So whatever these profits are there. In these profits every year we have included 20,000 which is non-trading income. So obviously I am going to subtract the same. A rate of income tax 30% is also given. Fair rate, fair return on capital employed in this type of business is 9% after tax. So normal rate of return is also given to you. Now in this question it is stated that and here the confusion arises. One, good, you have to find out the value of goodwill at 3 years purchase of super profits, number one. And second, we have to find out the value of fully paid equity shares under assets backing method and use closing trading capital employed for calculation of goodwill and questioner generally in order to er eradicate any confusion generally such information is given in the question that we have to use what we call closing capital employed for the purpose of valuation of goodwill now i have told you already actually i'm not allowed to publicize these answers by my publishers and by my other associated site but still i have to fight with them I'm making them public. Anyway, so these are the answers which have been forwarded by your institute. Good thing about this that they have given two answers, correct? One alternative, one alternative two. Now last time I made a request to the institute to do so and it's very nice to see actually that they have started now giving what we call multiple answers, especially where more than one answer is possible. Anyway, these are the answers of your institute. Now we are solving this particular question. You must have noticed when you went through this particular question, in this particular question, there was no information with respect to assets. I mean to say there is no complete information with respect to assets and liability. So how you are going to compute capital employed? Because ultimately you will require capital employed for the purpose of valuation of goodwill because without that you cannot find out normal profits and you cannot find out later on super profits. So you need to have capital employed. Obviously you will have to use the liability side approach. Remember, you are computing capital employed or assets available, correct, for shareholders. 
करेक्ट नॉट फॉर इक्विटी शेयर होल्डर एट दिस मोमेंट एट दिस मोमेंट वी आर कंप्यूटिंग कैपिटल इंप्लॉयड इन द कॉन्टेस्ट ऑफ द गुडविल करेक्ट अर्लियर टू एग्जाम्पल वेन आई स्टार्टेड दिस पर्टिकुलर सेशन आई टूक एंड जस्ट टू मेक द थिंग्स क्लियर स्पेशली वेन यू आर गोइंग टू फेस क्वेश्चन लाइक दिस वन सो इक्विटी शेयर कैपिटल फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल एज वी हैव ऑलरेडी सीन वन क्लास इज एटी थाउजेंड शेयर्स ऑफ टेन इंच फुली पेड आई एम गोइंग टू राइट हेयर एट लैक एंड देन वी हैव फिफ्टी थाउजेंड शेयर्स ऑफ टेन इंच बट इट इज फोर पेड ऑफ फिफ्टी थाउजेंड इंच टू मेक्स इट टू लैक देन नाइन परसेंट प्रेफरेंस शेयर कैपिटल इज ऑल्सो गिवन जनरल रिजर्व इन द क्वेश्चन इज ऑल्सो गिवन आई हैव सो मेनी टाइम टोल्ड यू एंड हैव बीन टेलिंग यू करेक्ट इक्विटी शेयर कैपिटल प्लस रिजर्व इज नथिंग बट इक्विटी इक्विटी इज नथिंग बट एसेट्स net assets and net assets is nothing but capital employed so that mean we have computed capital employed or net assets for shareholders but problem is that when we compute equity this way round indirectly it also means we are taking over the difference indirectly it means we are taking into account all the assets and we are subtracting all the liabilities indirectly it means and we know that for in the contest of goodwill when we compute capital employed logically under asset side we should not take goodwill and non trade investment correct and non trade investment we should not take this is the point now in this question you have already seen there are some non trade uh, there are some non trade investments so i cannot consider non trade investment so what i am supposed to do now i will have to subtract non trading investment again the question will apply at what value you are going to subtract them at what value you are going to subtract them see here this is the value sorry this is the value 2 lakh 80000 at this value you are going to subtract them 2 lakh 80000 that is book value so you will get operating capital employed or in other words because we have subtracted non trading investment now we will get capital employed in the contest of goodwill it is also known as operating capital employed i hope now till up to this particular point it is things are clear correct another and you must have understand in order to make you understand this point that is the reason why i took example in the earlier cases you need to go through that particular example once again to get a better understanding and thorough understanding now we are in a position to compute the goodwill in order to compute the goodwill we need obviously our average profit or adjusted profit first so that we can subtract normal profits from there on to get super profits so first of all profits are given to us of 3 years so first i will write them correct total profits 190 250 plus 280 but all these 3 years profit include 20000 20000 20000 interest on investment and interest on investment is non trading so i will subtract 60000 correct so by adding 3 years profit and subtracting 60000 20000 into 3 60000 so i will get total adjusted profit of 6 lakh 60 i can get now 2 lakh 20000 profit is it clear to you or you could have done this way you could have simply added the profit you have taken the average and you could have simply subtracted 20000 anyway so average profits will be equal to 2 lakh 20000 now in this question these profits are before tax so i will have to subtract the tax so obviously my future maintainable profit or adjusted profit or expected profits will be equal to 1 lakh 54000 now i will compute the normal profits in order to compute the normal profits I will take nine percent normal rate of return and capital employed. We computed fifteen lakh earlier, correct? Fifteen lakh was our capital employed. Here it is. So fifteen lakh into nine percent will become one lakh thirty five thousand. So nineteen thousand will be your super profits. And at three years of purchase, we can find out goodwill. So now we have determined the amount of goodwill, and our answer is matching with the institute's answer. No problem, correct? Is it clear to you? Second. your institute's answer is correct and both our answers will match then we have to find out intrinsic value of the share in order to determine the intrinsic value of share we need to know net assets available for equity share correct we have already computed capital employed but this is the capital employed in the contest of in the contest of what this is the capital employed in the contest of the goodwill because you have computed these this capital employed or net assets in the contest of the goodwill that mean this capital employed is exclusive of is exclusive of what we call goodwill and it is also exclusive of non trading investment 
Now goodwill which you have just computed, you will include it now. And you will also include non-trading investment. But non-trading investment, when you are going to include, after having computed capital employed, you will include it at market value. It is of paramount importance to understand. You will include here market value. Is it clear to you or not? You will take into account here the market value. So once you have taken the market value, so 15 lakh plus 57 plus 240. Now, it means now you have computed till up to this particular stage. That means you have assets available for equity share because in this particular question, I think uh, at this moment we have, get, we have got assets available for shareholders. I will make a national call because one class of share is only four paid up. There, is, there are 50,000 shares of 10 each. Six, uh, there are 50,000 shares, I think, in this particular question. Let me check. Right. 50,000 shares of 10 each, where 60 is unpaid amount. So I will make a national call on 50,000 share at the rate of six. That will be equal to three lakh. That means this figure suggests total assets available for shareholders. But we are interested in computing net assets for equity share. So I will subtract the preference share capital. Now, preference share capital is 6 lakh. So we will get 14 lakh 97,000. This 14 lakh 97,000 is nothing but net assets for equity shares. Now you divide it by your number of equity share, you will get intrinsic value of shares. So this is the question of June 24 paper. Is it clear to you or not? So this is how you can do this particular question. Besides that, besides that, there is another question in this particular case. Uh, of December 23 examination and December 21 examination. If some of you want to do that, then you will have to wait for five minutes. Excuse me, new syllabus question to December 23 examination. We have already completed December 24 examination. In my regular classes, I've already covered these questions, December 23 and earlier one. So some of you can leave if you wish so, but I would love your presence. But anyway, so here we go. The following is the balance sheet of R Limited that is given to you as on 31st of 3, 2023. In this question, you are given equity share capital, then 2,813% preference share capital. Other equity is also given. <coughs> Retained earnings. <coughs> then 10% debentures and trade payables. There are two liabilities and... <coughs> This is, I think, the same question which we covered under Goodwill also, if you remember. Correct, and there were some mis misprints over there, but here misprints will not be there. 25 lakh 20,000 is the total property, plant and equipment, and Goodwill is also given. Non-current investment is also given. Current asset 560 and 25 lakh 20,000. Now here in this particular question, you must have noticed profits before tax 2023 is given to you, and it amounts to 8 lakh 40,000 including 14,000 as interest on investment. What you are supposed to do for computing, later on when you are going to compute the profits, obviously 14,000 is interest on investment and investments are non-trading, obviously you are going to subtract the same. An additional amount of 70,000 per annum is required for a smooth running of the business. You will subtract it. You must have noticed by now this sort of question we have already done, but that was in the contest of goodwill. Market value of property, plant and equipment is estimated at 26,20,000. Remember, it is pretty high because in the balance sheet, it is given 16,80,000. In order to mass the above figures of further depreciation to the extent of 50,000 will be taken into account. But this additional depreciation is not allowed for income tax purpose. That means when you are going to compute the income tax, you will add back this 56,000 and this 56,000 without any doubt will be treated as future expense also. In income tax rate is 50% and rate of return is 20% before tax. It is before tax, so after tax it will be 10% because tax rate is 50%. For the purpose of determining the actual rate of return profit for this year, after a aforementioned adjustment may be taken as average profit. Similarly, average trading capital need to be taken into account. Now, what is the demand of the question. In this question, you have to compute the value of the goodwill based upon the four years purchase of super profits. So here actually, this is this was the only question so far out of four questions which have been asked in the last four examinations. This was the only question where only goodwill part was there. Because here you have to compute only the goodwill. First, you will write the profits 8,40, subtract the interest on investment, additional expenses, depreciation also. So your profits in future will be equal to 7,7,000. 7 
obviously now you are going to subtract the tax but when you are going to subtract the tax you will add back depreciation because it is given that depreciation is not allowed for depreciation purpose that means profits for for taxation purpose should be considered 756 and you are going to apply tax rate so this will be the amount of tax and your future maintainable profit will be equal to 322000 now we will compute the capital employed correct in order to compute the capital employed, no question of taking goodwill and investment. Current asset is 5,60,000. Liability, I am going to subtract. Creditors, I am going to subtract. Yes, my capital employed is 28 lakh, and some of the student also brought it into my books. Correct? That, sir, in valuation of goodwill, in the last question, there were misprints, which I myself actually also pointed out. Anyway, it is 28 lakh. Now you are going to compute the average capital employed. So average capital employed will be capital because in this question it is stated that we have to compute the average capital employed. That's why we are taking cap average capital employed. One half of future maintainable profit. Now your capital employed is 28 lakh. Maintainable profit is 3 lakh 22. One half of that you are going to subtract. So ultimately your average capital employed will be equal to 26 lakh 30 thousand. Normal rate of return is 10 percent. So your normal profits will be equal to this much. And then you are going to find out your super profits. In order to find out your super profits, you will take the maintainable profits. From there on, you are going to subtract 2,63,900 to get 58,100. Multiply it with 4 to get what we call your answer. This was uh, December 23 question. And now, finally, there is one more question. And this is this question is new syllabus December 22 examination question. In this particular question, we are given balance sheet, correct, of Bharat and Sheena Limited as a 31st of March 2022. Equity share capital, we are given 10 paid up, 80 lakh. Then 12% preference shares of 100 each fully paid, also given. Reserve and surplus is also given. 10% debentures. And then we have current liability, 20 lakh. Goodwill is also given, that is equal to 8 lakh. Fixed tangible assets are given, 120 lakh. 10% trade investment, investments are trade investment and current assets are also given to you in this particular question. Now profits after tax at the rate of 40% are also given. Profits are given to you as 24 lakh, 36 lakh and 30 lakhs. Then similar to, the, to a question, even in this particular question you are being given that your investments are now valued at 150% and the face value is 16 lakh. If I am going to compute what we call 150% of the face value, 16 lakh into 150%, I think it will be equal to 24 lakh. I do not know exactly, but you can compute it. So I think it will be equal to 24 lakh. 60% of the debentures are to be redeemed. So it is almost similar sort of question which we just attempted earlier. If I am going to redeem 60% of the debenture, debenture is 40 lakh. Now 60% of 40 lakh will be equal to and 10% debentures are there. So 24 lakh worth of debenture will get redeemed. Indirectly, it means my current asset will fall by 24 lakh because we are repaying the debenture and my debenture liability will also come down by 24 lakh. Also, there will be a saving at the rate of 10% on amount of debenture redeemed. Now debenture redeemed is equal to 24 lakh. You will compute 10% of 24 lakh. So that will be your saving, future saving. Now rate of tax will be 30% in future. And here it is given. This is the point actually I am referring to. Normal rate of return on net assets for equity shareholder is given. Normal rate of return on net assets for equity shareholder is given. Now see in this question, because in this question, whenever you will be given normal rate of return on net assets for shareholders, in that case, you will have to exercise a bit of caution, especially if the question is demanding valuation of goodwill and valuation of equity share also. In this question, you are supposed to compute the goodwill, number one. You are comp supposed to compute net assets uh, available for equity share. And you are supposed to compute yield base value of equity share that means earning per share and you are supposed to compute fair value of equity share indirectly it means you have to compute the intrinsic value of the share also. Now in order to solve this question first of all we will take up all the profits which are given to us of last three years and I will convert them into before tax correct in order to convert them before tax i will divide them by one minus tax rate which happens to be 50 percent in this particular case so this will be my profits before tax now i will tally these profits 40 lakh plus 60 lakh 
and uh, plus 50 lakh divided by 3 to get what we call my average profit before tax. Now I am going to add interest on 60% debenture because in future I need not require to pay on 60% of the debenture that is 24 lakh worth of debentures 40 lakh into 60% 24 lakh worth of debentures have been redeemed so 24 lakh into 10% 2 lakh 40,000 will be savings for me in future now my adjusted profit becomes 52 lakh 40 from there on I'm going to subtract future rate of tax now future rate of tax is 30% so 15 lakh 72 now profits for shareholder will become 36 lakh 68,000 now, generally, when we compute profits available for shareholder in the contest of goodwill, in the contest of goodwill, because in the contest of goodwill, we generally, when we compute profits, we never subtract preference dividend. You must have noticed. But in this particular question, these are my adjusted profit. If you do not want to write profits for shareholder, you can simply write FMP, future maintenance profits, to not to get confused. So generally, we compute till up to this particular stage. Never ever under valuation of good will be subtract preference dividend from the profits. But in this particular question, because so many times I have seen a student asking this question whether preference dividend will be subtracted in the contest of goodwill or not. Never. Answer is no. But under one rare circumstances, you will have to subtract the preference dividend. First, let me tell you that I will have to subtract the preference dividend. Preference share capital is 20 lakh into 12%, 2 lakh 40,000. Why I am subtracting it? The question is because I have written here the answer also. In this case, normal rate of return is based upon net assets for equity shareholder. Because in this particular question, your normal rate of return is based upon net assets. That is the reason why we are subtracting what we call even preference dividend from the profits, even though we are computing profits for in the contest of goodwill. Are you getting my point or not? So this point should be absolutely clear. We are subtracting it because this time your normal rate of return is based upon equity share. So generally when we are computing future maintainable profit, it denotes profits available for shareholders. Because normally we are given normal rate of return. But in this particular question, we are being given, and this question in the context of goodwill I am talking about. In this particular question, net uh, normal rate of return is on net, on net assets for equity shareholders. So you have to first of all find out future maintainable profits available for equity share. So in order to know that, you will have to subtract the preference dividend, then you will get profits available for equity shareholders. That is why we are subtracting preference dividend in this particular question. Correct? Now, in the context of the goodwill, I need to compute now the capital employed. When I will compute capital employed, I will take into account all the tangible fixed asset. I will take into account trade investment. Now, the value of trade investment has gone up to 24 lakh because it is 150% of the face value. Face value is 16 lakh and 150% of that. Now, this is the market value. Current asset were 52 lakh, but because 24 lakh debentures have been redeemed, now the current asset will be taken at 28 lakh. Then I will subtract the liability debentures, but now the amount of debenture is 16 lakh because from 40 lakh, 24 lakh worth of debentures have been redeemed. Current liability I will subtract, I will get net assets. Generally in the context of the goodwill, this figure is enough because uh, we, we need only capital employed and capital employed we have already computed. But Time and again I am telling, in this question problem is that your normal rate of return is based upon assets available for equity share. So that is why you need to find out assets available for equity share or capital employed for equity share. Is it clear to you? So assets for equity share indirectly this is your capital employed but in the context of equity share. So your normal, your capital employed indirectly here means assets available for equity share and why we are computing assets available for equity share even in the context of goodwill because in this particular question normal rate of return is based upon net assets for equity share. So we need to compute net assets for equity shares. So you multiply it with normal rate of return to get your normal profits. Is it clear to you? Now we have already computed average profits adjusted, correct, earlier. This is your 34 lakh 28,000. And now 11 lakh 60,000 is my normal profit. So we have computed super profits. Super profits multiplied by 3 to get what we call valuation of goodwill 68 lakh 4,000. Now in order to <coughs> compute uh, earning per share, now if you want to compute uh, 
earning per share, you can directly take why to waste the time. We have already seen profits available for equity share 34 lakh 28 divided by 10% normal rate of return get the capitalized value divided by number of shares. So we have got now earning per share also. All we need, all we need now earning uh, intrinsic value of share. In order to compute the intrinsic value of share, I will take into account first of all net assets available for equity shares which we have already computed. Correct? In order to compute intrinsic value of share, we require net assets available for equity shares. But problem is that so far when we have computed assets available for equity share over there, we haven't included goodwill. Now we just computed goodwill, it is 68,4000. So I will add it back to get assets available for equity shareholder in the contest of valuation of shares. Now I will divide it by number of share and I will get this figure. And finally, you can find out your fair value of the shares also. Correct. So this is the most comprehensive revision which we are which we are trying to give you. I hope each one of you would agree that nothing could be more comprehensive than this one. All previous three attempt question paper, including the current one, and no one till this particular date has given you any solution for these is non-banking financial companies. I have seen actually many students have a view that this chapter is not very important from the examination point of view and so many I keep on telling and cautioning that when you are pursuing a course of such strength then obviously you cannot leave anything to chance. Is it clear to you or not? If you really want to clear the examination with flying colors and strong performances it is important that you need to devote what we call equal intensity to each chapter howsoever uh, or what sort of cha chapter it is. Correct? Although chapter seems innocuous, innocuous means innocent chapter, that means it is not a very long one. But in spite of that, actually, it's a pretty important in the sense that even if the long question would not strike you, definitely some MCQs will be there. And if MCQs will not be there, you are going to get what we call long question. And let me caution you, I have a hunch regarding this particular chapter that this time, you so very surprisingly, you may get a question of even 14 marks from this particular chapter. What possible question that could be, which would carry what we call such high percentage of marks that I will let you know but before that let's come straight to the point first of all when we are going to do this small chapter which are the areas which we have to cover very comprehensively as far as NBFCs are concerned you need to first of all take into account there are three topics correct in it but I have seen a student have been fed up with this particular guidance that they need to actually cover only one topic I will I will talk about that later on. But first of all, let me actually tell you which are the three areas where you need to actually devote some additional uh, what we call attention. Now, in this case, first topic is of owned fund. In fact, we will talk about net owned funds, but I at this moment I have written here owned fund. This is one area where you can expect surprisingly a question, correct? Then there is, of course, a topic related to provisioning. And I have seen, as I was telling, actually, student fraternity have a student fraternity actually has been told to cover this particular topic only, and that's all. So nothing like that. And there is another very important topic. What exactly that particular topic? That is also related to provisioning, but that particular part is related to provisioning of what we call higher purchase assets and leased assets, and leased assets. And from this particular topic. If question would strike in the examination, that will not carry marks less than 40. Let me tell you. Let's have a look actually, first of all, over all these things. But before we move into the higher growth, let me just actually give you a little bit of an idea regarding NBFC, although each one of you are very well aware regarding all these things. As far as NBFCs are concerned, what exactly the NBFCs are? NBFC, as you know, it stands, this abbreviated form stands for non-banking financial companies non-banking financial companies what exactly non-banking financial companies are even though name is non-banking financial company but they are almost banking company they are very similar and we almost alike to what we call banking company but in spite of that why they are not tagged as banking company simply because of the fact they do not actually hold any license banking license this is the only difference between banking company and nbfc as far as their functionality is concerned their activities are concerned they are almost similar to what we call banking company very important point that nowadays especially in the present scenario correct all over the world what we have seen there is a tremendous growth by leaves and brown by leaves and bound actually NBFCs have shown high amount of growth 
Is it clear to you? So, all over the world now, NBF scenes, NBFC sector is rising and rising tremendously because they are playing a very important role by providing credit facility and other financial services, especially in the sector not covered by the traditional banks. That's the reason actually their role is very important. Now, coming over to the next point, I have seen that even though many students actually have gone through this particular chapter, but if you are going to ask them a very single question, give some examples of NBFCs operating in India, and they simply actually, uh, at that time, cut a very sorry figure. So it is very important that when you study a particular chapter, actually be aware of. In India, there are some very big company, and to be very honest, at this particular moment, Bajaj FinServe, you must have heard about it, is the largest NBFC in India. Besides that, there are several NBFCs like LIC Housing, like Larson and Tar Turbo, what we call financial services, uh, and besides that, there is Aditya Birla from Birla Finance, you must have heard about it. Then Chola Mandlam, Chola Mandlam Financial Institution is a very big, very big NBFC, besides that, Mahindra and Mahindra. And then there is what we call Piramal Finance and then Tata uh, Financial Limited. Besides that, there is Mutahut Company the, and Sriram Finance. All these are almost in the top 10 of India. So it is very important for you to understand all these aspects when you study. Anyway, coming over to another important point. As far as NBMC is concerned, if a particular business house has correct the NBFC business, remember one thing, will not include if your principal business is agricultural activity. If your principal business is of what we call industrial activity. If your principal business is of purchase or sale of only, only goods, but excluding securities, then it will not be included under NBFC. So there are some activities which are excluded from the definition of what we call NBFC activities. You need to be, uh, you need to be aware of, especially with respect to your MCQ question. Now coming over to the important facet of this particular chapter. Suppose if you want, if you if you want your organization to be get registered as an NBFC. Suppose you want to get yourself registered with an NBFC. There are two foremost things which you need to fulfill. One, you should be already incorporated as a company. That means you should be already a company before you get yourself registered as an NBFC. So you need to be incorporated as a company either in the previous company, either in the under what we call previous companies act of 1956 or under the present companies act of 2013. So you need to be a company. Second import, first point is this. And second criteria is that you must have a net owned fund. NOF, net owned fund. You need to have a net owned funds of 10 crores. You need to have a net own funds of 10 crores. These are the two criteria which you need to meet actually to get yourself registered as far as NBFC registration is concerned. Just a moment ago, I told when I started this particular chapter that there are three important segments of this particular chapter where from you can expect questions in the examination. And one among them is, as you can see, is Minimum net owned fund or simply net owned fund. How to compute the net owned fund? Obviously, if the question would strike from this particular topic, then question would be of six marks or four marks. It cannot be of more than that. Number one. Or it could actually be included under MCQ section. But anyway, as far as a uh, question from this particular topic is concerned, what are the chances? Remember one thing till up to this particular day, not a single question has been asked from this particular topic. And that is why you need to actually pay greater attention towards this particular topic. Is that clear to you? I have so many times in the past sessions also have told you that such topics which haven't been yet touched upon by the examiner, chances of striking the question from such topics are always very high. So that's the reason you need to pay attention as far as this particular topic is concerned. Now coming over to what we call computation of net owned funds, what you are supposed to do under it. As I told you, in order to compute the net owned funds, your first step should be to compute the owned fund. And in order to compute the owned fund, what we are supposed to do, in order to compute the owned funds, OF as we denote it, correct? you will take into account your equity share capital. You will take into account your equity share capital. So could, should we take preference share capital also? I'm coming over to that. Preference share capital will never ever be considered for computing the own funds, correct? In order to compute the own funds, only equity share capital will be considered number one. However, 
under rare circumstances, if the question states this way around, 10% preference share capital convertible into equity share. That means if convertible preference share capital is given in the question, in that particular case, you are going to consider that. Only convertible preference share, not preference share capital. Only convertible preference share capital will be considered. Is it clear to you? This is the point which you need to take care of. Besides that, we are going to add all the free reserves. All the free reserves. And if there are some valueless assets like deferred expenditures, then you are going to subtract that. So this is how you are going to compute your own funds. Is it clear to you or not? Yes, sir. Absolutely clear. Once you have computed the own fund, then your next step should be to compute aggregate investments. What we mean by aggregate investments? Aggregate of investments. Most of the question you will see actually because it is an NBFC and NBFC actually accumulates funds also because after all it's a financial institution and they spend huge amount correct elsewhere to what we call get some income. So as far as any NBFC is concerned they will always have some investments. So you will take into account the aggregate, aggregate investment. But what about aggregate investment? Here investment word stands for investments in group entities. Investments in group entities. When we say group entities, it means investment in subsidiary associates, etc. So if there are some investments in the group entities, suppose there is an NBFC and it has invested in equity shares of a subsidiary or for that instance, it might have invested some amount in debentures of a group entity, then you will aggregate these investments. Important point is that investment in group entities will only be considered. Is it clear to you or not? You will total them up. After totaling up, totaling them up, then what you are going to do, then you are going to again compute 10% of own funds. You have already computed the own funds. Now you will simply compute 10% of your total own funds. Correct? You have already computed own funds. You will simply take the 10% of the own funds. Now you will compare step number B and C or Put in simple words, simply deduct the amount of 10% of own funds from the aggregate amount of investment. So after subtracting, you will definitely get some figure and this figure will be known as excess of investment. It will be known as excess of investments, excess of investments over 10% of own funds, 10% of own funds. It will be known as excess of investment. Obviously, this is your investment and this is your 10% of own funds. And obviously, this amount will always be higher in comparison to 10% of own funds. You will always get an excess. So, you need to compute the ex excess of aggregate amount of investment over 10% of own funds. Once you have computed this, then finally you will be in a position to compute your net owned funds. In order to compute the net owned funds, what you are supposed to do now, whatever amount you have computed under step number A, that is your owned funds, correct? You have under step number A, you have computed the total owned funds. And from total owned funds, now you will subtract this figure. And this figure means excess of aggregate of investment over 10% of what we call owned funds. By subtracting it, you will get the net owned funds. So these are the what we call procedural aspects of finding out net owned funds. Is it clear to you? And here is one question. Uh, then you will be able to understand it better. In fact, you can solve it now. I think I have explained it so well. Let's have a look over here. Now, this is the what we call question which is given to you. And in this question, I have taken from uh, CA material, to be very honest with you. And here it is given, Templeton Finance Limited is a non-banking finance company and the extract of the balance sheet are given to you. So here this is uh, what we call NBFC and its balance sheet is given to you. Now coming over to the balance sheet, have a look over the liability side. Now as far as liability side, we need to take care. Ultimately, we have to find out the net owned funds. And as you know, in order to compute the net owned funds, I need to take into account the paid of equity share capital and free reserves. 
And during my this short discussion, I haven't talked about anything with respect to loans and what we call deposits. So quite obviously, you are going to ignore them because they will not be considered for the computation of own funds. But only area of concern, if there will be convertible preference share, then do not skip this particular fact that it will be a part of what we call own fund. If simply preference share capital would be given, ignore it out. Is it clear to you? Now. Towards the balance sheet, we find there are deferred expenditure. That means you have already computed your own funds. That is 100 plus 500 minus 200 total own funds. Now you have at your disposal. From the total own funds, as I told you, what we are supposed to do? We are supposed to actually then take care of our aggregate investment. And aggregate investment means investment in group entities. And here, if you are going to have a look, you'll find investments are given and given over here in shares of subsidiary and group entity. That means investment in shares and investment in debentures of subsidiary and group entities. Both these investments are in group entity. So now you have the aggregate amount of investment also 200. Then whatever total funds you have computed, take 10% of that. 10% of own fund, we call it. So now you have the aggregate amount of investment 200 and you have the 10% of own funds. Compare these two, find the excess of aggregate of investment over 10% of own funds. Now you have find, found out what we call 10 excess of aggregate of investment over 10% of own funds. Now you simply actually subtract it from your total own funds to get final figure of net own funds. This is how we have to move to solve the question. This is how I have solved this particular question. First, you simply come take into account equity share capital at free reserve. You will get total 600 subtract the deferred expenditure. That means now we have computed the own funds. After having computed the own funds, I talked about this particular fact. We will take into account the aggregate of the investment. So our aggregate investment is 200. Correct. After having computed the aggregate investment, you can separately compute 10% of own funds or you can directly compute excess of investments. That means 200 is your investment. Excess of investment over 10% of own funds. Now 10% of own funds own funds we computed 400 so 10 percent of 400 will be equal to 40 and our aggregate investment is 200 so 200 minus 40 will deliver you 160 that means you have directly computed here excess of investment over 10 percent of own funds 160 so this excess amount which you have computed now will be subtracted from the owned fund now your own funds were 400 so by subtracting 160 from 400 you will get 240 this will be your net own funds so computation of net fund, net own fund is not a very tedious task but only thing is that a student fraternity hardly have ever been told to actually devote attention towards this. This is the only area of concern. Coming over to the next part, I told you as far as this particular chapter is concerned, there are three vital wings which you need to take care of and you will have to capture their flight. So, second one is provisioning. And before we understand the meaning of provisioning, we know what we need to know. Broadly, all the NBFCs can be classified into two types. One, deposit taking, and another one is non-deposit taking. All the NBFCs, all the NBFCs can be broadly, I'm telling you broadly, actually in practical life, classification of NBFC is entirely different. And that is my only area of complaint to the Institute. They must include such thing in the as a part of the slavers because when they want to produce quality, what we call professional, the quality professional need to be well aware and abreast of the latest, what we call knowledge. I will talk about that later on, what actually in practical life is. But anyway, whatever is given as per your syllabus, we have to cover first of all that way around. So as far as NBFC is concerned, I have already told you NBFCs. All the NBFCs can be actually segregated into two part deposit taking. In short form, I have written DT. That means deposit taking NBFC and of course non-deposit taking company non-deposit nd nd means non-deposit taking we never write ndt deposit taking and nd means non-deposit taking another important point which you need to take care of all the non-depositing non-deposit taking nbfc correct non-deposit taking nbfcs are further segregated into two parts are further segregated into two parts what are those two parts one is systemically important i am not telling systematically i am telling systematically 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 correct systematically important si and not 
actually non systemically important nsi that mean non deposit taking nbfcs are further segregated or subdivided into two segments systemically important and not systemically important is it clear to you first of all you need to know this what we call point after having known this particular point that nbfcs can be broken into what we call majorly two parts but you can say three parts deposit taking and then non deposit taking systematically important and non deposit taking not systematically important is it clear to you now after knowing this what you should do for the purpose of understanding provisioning requirement you need to understand that we can make one group and another group in group 1 i will include deposit taking nbfcs deposit taking nbfcs and i will also include non deposit taking nbfc which are not uh, which are systematically important so under group 1 we will include two types of nbfc nbfcs which are deposit taking and i will also include here non deposit non deposit taking nbfcs which are systematically important is it clear to you i can make two groups why i am making these two groups i will let you know this is one group that mean this one group comprises of such nbfcs which are either deposit taking number 1 or they are non deposit taking but systematically important in group 2 now only this type of nbfc is left so that mean in group 2 we will include only such nbfcs which are non deposit taking but not systematically important not systematically important is it clear to you why i am making or dividing them or collaborating them into what we call two separate groups the reason being is that when we are going to actually study provisioning requirement because many a time i have seen student fraternity again actually confuse here and confuse here a lot simply because of the fact they do not know this grouping we will see that provisioning requirement for this group is similar correct for this group is similar and for this group is little bit different from this group are you getting my point or not that is why i collaborated them into some groups now you will be able to understand the provisioning requirement what we mean by provisioning requirement first of all obviously as you know these are financial institution financial institution provide loans advances other credit facility they also indulge in what we call discounting of bills that is another way of what we call providing finance or credit facility because they are dealing in such things correct they are giving loans they are providing advances they are providing other credit facilities and besides that besides besides that we will also see that there also there are some nbfc which will provide what we call credit credit facility in a different sense for example they are giving what we call hire purchase facility leasing facility etc we'll talk about that later on first of all we are talking about provisioning requirement with respect to loans advances and other credit facility suppose if there is an nbfc it has given what we call some loans or it has a, a given some amount as an advance or it has given some other credit facility so under such circumstances obviously the rbi guidelines correct they stipulate on such nbfc to make some provision as you know as you have done it in your earlier phases of education with respect to banking companies similar to here an nbfc will have to create some provision and in order to create the provision first of all we need to understand the assets of nbfc actually could you tell me what are the assets for nbfc or for that particular instance any financial institution if you are a financial institution what are your major assets obviously property plant equipment is an asset but what will be your major asset your major assets will be all the loans and advances which you have given because you are a financial institution or you, your entire existence depends upon what we call your this particular asset is it clear to you or not so here asset word, word asset stands for loans and advances which have been forwarded or given to given to others by the nbfc by your organization you presume your organization is nbfc and you are the accountant of that so there will be some loss assets when you will reach the end of the reporting date every reporting date you will have to see and uh, see the possibility of what we call 
potentiality of your advances loans which you have given to others suddenly you will find there are some loss assets loss assets means such loans and advances which you think have become virtually irrecoverable in spite of legal action you cannot actually recover them so that's the reason you have termed them as what we call loss assets quite obviously here how much provision you you will make i need to require to tell you 100 percent provision you are going to make is it clear similarly for doubtful asset now, as far as doubtful assets are concerned, all the doubtful assets, doubtful asset or doubtful debts or doubtful loans or doubtful advances, one and same thing. All the doubtful assets are actually, first of all, doubtful assets could be secured and unsecured. Doubtful assets could be secured and unsecured. Correct? Doubtful assets could be secured and unsecured. What we mean by secured? Because generally when we give loan, obviously we will ask the ask that person or client who is taking loan actually to give some deposit, to give some security, then only we are going to give you. That is the normal policy adopted by the financial institution whensoever actually they are going to give loan to the uh, loan seekers. Is it clear? So loan, the, First of all, any loan which is given by NBFC will be either secured or unsecured, number one. So we are here talking about doubtful debts. First of all, you will have to see whether it is secured or unsecured, correct? Now, if it is secured, then how you are going to make the provision? If it is unsecured, how you are going to make the provision? Now, if the doubtful debt is secured, then on the reporting date, you will see the time period. If time period is zero to one year, correct? Zero to one year, then provision which you are going to make will be 20%, correct? And if time period till the reporting date is in between one to three years, one to three years, then provision requirement will be equal to 30%. And if on the reporting date, a period of three years have already gone by, that been more than three years. If more than three years, obviously in that particular case, you are going to make a provision of 50%, 50%, not 100%. In case of doubtful debts, and if doubtful debts are secured, the provisioning would be done this way around. However, if it is unsecured, if it is unsecured, then obviously you are going to make 100% provision. In case of 100%, in case of unsecured portion, correct, we will not take into account the time element. With respect to doubtful debts, you need to take care of this. Then another important point is with respect to a standard asset. What are what we mean by before that I will come over to substandard asset. Substandard asset is generally re referred to as such loans and advances where you feel that there is greater possibility of what we call recovery, although there, there may be some chances that you may not get the what we call amount recovered. Correct? Although probability of recovery is high. But at the same time, some element of risk is there. They are known as service standard asset, correct? A provision at the rate of 10% will be made. It is simple. Now coming over to the standard asset. A standard asset, basically, we classify any loan in advance as a standard asset when we feel that no risk is attached to it. There is no risk with respect to the what we call recovery of this. Is it clear to you? So here, RBI guidelines say that we have to actually create a provision of 0.40%. Is it clear to you? 0.40%. These are the rules which I just mentioned. Loss asset, doubtful asset, substandard asset and standard asset. These rules will apply to all type of NBFC, whether it is related to group 1 entity or whether it is related to group 2. In group one, I have included such NBFCs which are deposit taking and such NBFCs which are not deposit taking, but they are systemically important, correct? While in group two, there is only one one type of NBFC that is not uh, non-deposit taking, but not systemically important. Is it clear to you? So whatever rules which I have mentioned, they, they will apply to all types of, all types. But there is only difference, only differences with respect to a standard asset. As we can see that extended asset, the provisioning requirement for deposit taking NBFC 
and such NBFCs, which are non-deposit taking but systemically important, they will have to create a provision at the rate of 0.40%. That means first group. Correct? As far as second group is concerned, wherein we have included NBFC, which are non-deposit taking but not systemically important. The rule says that they will have to create a provision on a standard asset at the rate of 0.25%. So this is the only difference. Is it clear to you? Generally, most of the question which we have seen in the, in the examination, no doubt about, is from this particular topic. No doubt about that. So this is one question through which I will try to explain it further. Correct? While closing the books of account on 31st of March 2027, a non-banking financial company has its advances classified as follows. So one of the NBFC has given some data regarding its loans and advances to you. And it is not mentioned in the question whether this NBFC is deposit taking. It is not mentioned in the question whether it is a deposit taking NBFC, whether it is a non-deposit taking, non-deposit taking NBFC, NBFC systemically important. It is also not given and it is also not given whether it is non-deposit taking, not systemically important NBFC. So nothing is mentioned. If question does not mention, then how you are going to create a provision or how you are going to solve the question that I will let you know. But first of all, let's have a look over some items are given a standard asset 18.4, 18,400. So how much provision you will have to make? I just told you standard asset, correct? Both these companies will make a provision at the rate of 0.4%. But this entity, correct, that be non-deposit, non-deposit taking NBFC, which is not systemically important, it will create a provision at the rate of 0.25%. This is the point I want to actually bring to your light. And sub-standard asset, all type of entity will create a provision of 10%. Now here, secured portion of doubtful debts is given. I have already told you with respect to secured portion of the doubtful debts, we have to take into account the what we call time element. Now, since it is given up to one year, amount given is 300. Here, I am going to make a provision of 20% as I just told. And one to three years, I just told if it is in between one to three year, 30% provision. And if it is more than three years, 50% provision correct 50% because it is a doubtful debts. However, unsecured portion of doubtful debts will carry a provision of 100% and loss asset, obviously you are going to make a provision of 100%. That means everything is same, but only area of difference is with respect to extended asset. So in case of NDNSI, that means non-deposit taking NBFC, which is not systemically important, it will create uh, with respect to standard asset a provision at the rate of 0.25%, correct? But other NBFCs, that mean other group NBFC deposit taking and non-deposit taking NBFC, which is systemically important, they will create provision at the rate of 0.4%. I solved this question. See, in the examination, if such question comes, always put up a note, correct? Presuming it is a deposit taking NBFC, or it is a non-deposit taking NBFC, but systemically important. Correct. So on such basis, if I am going to solve this particular question, I will make a provision on a standard asset at the rate of 0 0.40. I will make what we call provision at the rate of 10% on substandard asset and on outful debts. Depending upon the time element, I am going to make the provision 0 to 120%. Correct. So then 30% in between 1 to 3, more than 3 year at the rate of 50%. Unsecured portion 100% and loss asset obviously 100%. On this ground, if I'm going to solve the question, this will be what we call my amount of provision. So total provision will be equal to 439. Now, just to give you a better insight, correct? Although you can simply write a note and solve the question till up to here only. You need not require to do a full fledged solution as I have done here. Then I have written here, if it is a non-deposit taking, that in group two, if it is a non-deposit taking company and not systematically important, in that case, everything will be same. But only this difference will take place. Are you getting my point or not? That means on a standard asset, we will create a provision at the rate of 0.25%. So obviously in this case, our provisioning amount will be a little bit different than the other one. So this is the point. So this is one question with respect to provisioning. But students are generally told you have to do this particular chapter, but just focusing upon this particular part. And it's over, the student feel happy. Oh my God, so in such a short span of time, question chapter is over. And suddenly when in the examination they see actually not a single question is struck from this area. 
then I need not require to tell. So, there is another area provisioning with respect to lease and hire purchase asset. There are two types of assets. Correct. One simple loans. Simple loans means simply credit facility. It could be through loan. It could be through advances. It could be through discounting or bills. That is how the NBFC would make provisioning, which we just saw earlier. But how about an NBFC? How it is going to make a provision with respect to leases and higher purchase asset? Because here also some credit uh, facility is existing, but at the same time an asset is an asset of tangible nature is also coming into picture. See here, and this is very important. I told you, you can, you will expect, and I'm telling you and cautioning you. Just remember this thing. I'm telling you a question if it would strike, and I have a great hunch, correct? That question could strike from this particular topic. So that is why you need to pay very high amount of attention towards this particular topic. This is the only topic remaining now in this particular chapter besides that. Two students have asked some queries and we will also discuss that during this particular session. Correct. So I will, as usual, I will take five minutes of break and then I will continue with it. So, and this is very important, very important. Don't miss it out. I'm telling you, 14 marks are on the plate, but simply by having a look over the question and ignoring it will not actually hold you in a very good state. So definitely that should not be the policy. Let's do this topic also. Wait for five minutes.
So welcome again. After the break, now we will pick up this particular topic as I told you. So in this particular topic, we are going to learn how an NBFC which is dealing in leases and higher purchase assets, actually how it is going to make the provision. Yeah, who will put it here? Actually, I just happened to receive my tea. I'm very sorry, but I do not want to waste your time. So I came early. Anyway, so lease and higher purchase assets. We are talking about provisioning requirements of higher purchased and leased assets. Suppose if a particular entity has given some asset on higher purchase or it has leased some asset under such circumstances, how the provisioning is done. And that is not at all a very, very child's play, a, a very, very easy task not a child's play. Let's have a look. Amount of provision, how you are going to create a provision. Suppose if you have given, uh, you have sold out an asset on a higher purchase system and at the same time, you, or for that instance, you have leased a particular asset. In order to make the provision, first of all, you will compute on the reporting date, are there some investment which have become due but not yet received by your, by your entity? On the reporting date, suppose by the end of the reporting date, out of two, there, there are five installments and only one installment you have received. But till the reporting date, one installment, that is second installment, is not received. Try to understand this particular point this way. Let us say this is year one. In year one, in the beginning, you sold out a particular asset, correct? And you have received the installment. By the end of year two, and this is your current reporting date, let us say second installment has become due, but it is not received. So you will take and we further presume there are total five installments. There are total five installment which the client is supposed to pay to you. Obviously, this installment has become due and your current reporting date is this one. So on this date, this installment will be known as installment due, but not received. So you are going to write it over here. Besides that, all these investments, correct, which the customer is supposed to pay you respectively at the end of year 3, 4 and 5 actually, correct, these installment are due, but at the same time they haven't become, sorry, these installments, the customer is supposed to pay, but they haven't become yet due. So that is why you are going to write installment not yet due, because till up, the, till up to the reporting date, these installment haven't become due. Are you getting my point? So you will total them up also. Now you will write that figure. Then obviously you are going to add that pin in simple words. You will take into account total all such investment on which you haven't received any money so far. On this installment, you haven't received the money in spite of becoming due. But on this installment, you haven't received the money because they simply haven't become due yet. But you will take the total of such investment. Then then very important line, finance charges not matured and not credited to profit and loss account. Finance charges not matured and not credited to profit and loss account. If there are some finance charges, what we mean by finance charges from the perspective of the NBFC, finance charges means the interest income, the charge which you are charging from the client simply because you are providing him time facility of five years. Obviously, as you know, your higher purchase price will be higher than the cash price. So you are charging some interest. For example, see here, I have written fin finance charge not matured and not credited to profit and loss account. What does it mean? It means such installment which haven't yet become due on such installment Obviously, on each installment, you are going to receive some interest. First of all, you need to understand this. On each installment, you are supposed to receive some interest portion. You have done higher purchase chapter earlier in your earlier phases of education. So each installment comprises elements of payment towards the interest from the perspective of the client, payment towards the interest and payment for the principal. Sir. Likewise, from the seller, NBFC's perspective, you are going to receive some portion of the installment as interest in some portion against the what we call principal. Sir. So what we mean by unmatured finance charges, put in simple words, it means 
unmatured interest and unmatured interest means interest on such installment which haven't yet become due that is why interest is not maturing so you will take care of such interest also is it clear to you so obviously if the interest hasn't yet matured you cannot credit it to profit or loss account then you are going to take that after taking that into account in fact after subtracting it from the total of such installment where you did not receive the money and which are unmatured then you will subtract it obviously you will get this particular figure now and from this particular figure it is important it, and it will never be given in the question you need to subtract the depreciated value what we mean by depreciated value suppose cash price of the asset for simplicity sake is 100 cash price i'm talking about that mean that is the cost price from the perspective of the client correct so this will be considered as the cost price of the asset so cost price of the asset is 100 from the perspective of this purchaser it is cost price from the perspective of the nbfc this is this is the cash price so you can call it cash price or cost price so you will subtract depreciation at the rate of 20 percent it will never be given rate of depreciation will never be given it's a rule is it clear to you or not you will separate depreciation on a straight line method basis on a straight line method basis you are going to subtract the depreciation rate for two years in this case because your reporting date is now almost by the time of your reporting date two years time period has already gone by is it clear to you that mean if cost of the asset is 100 depreciation at the rate of 20 uh, 20 percent 20 into 2 will be 40 so depreciated value of the asset will be considered as 60 so this is what you have to write now correct first of all we will take into account total such in installment where we haven't received the money this will give you the total of that and from that you are going to subtract the unmatured interest that means this interest this interest and this interest interest of year three four and five in this example is it clear to you after subtracting subtracting it we will get this particular figure uh, this particular figure and from this particular figure now i am going to subtract what we call net book value an important point is that how to compute sorry i will subtract the depreciated value and how to compute the depreciated value you need to understand that rate of depreciation will be applied at the rate of 20 percent correct till the time period for the reporting date in this case it is two years so that is why i have written two years and here i have written two years actually i shouldn't write two years because this is just a format so depreciation you are going to apply for the time period which has elapsed by the time of reporting by subtract by taking the difference of these two you will create a provision to the extent of that difference that is how the provision is made with respect to leased asset is it clear to you or not second important point is that when the question in the examination would strike from this particular area they will also ask you to compute the net book value that is why i'm telling you question will comprise of 14 marks and don't do not neglect this part please pay attention no one will tell you and no one must have actually taught you this particular topic i'm very sure about that so kindly pay attention here and allow me to have a sip of tea also now how to compute the net book value it is very important first step is similar you will take the overdue installment you will also take the total of all such installment which haven't yet become due so this will be the total now and again you are going to subtract the unmatured interest that means till up to this point everything is same correct and now you will subtract from this value the provision which you have created earlier so you will get the net book value this is how the net book value of the asset is computed i have picked up this particular question from your mtp 2024 and if this question is given in mtp 2024 that itself is a sign that itself is a clue that itself should work as a guiding factor for you that why you should pay attention and should not ignore this particular topic although a similar question those among you who, who have our regular study material you must have seen actually similar question is already there and we have done it obviously in the class 
So let's have a look over this question. Samvedan Limited is a non-banking finance company. Correct name itself. I have I have generally I changed the name, but here I have kept the same name. And although it is given in your MTP, but let me also tell you, this chapter is also this particular question has been taken from NBFC ICI module. But problem is that the this particular question uh, is from NBFC, but NBFC is not part of CA final. Now it is. Uh, now, early, now it is also not part of group 2 because in CA now there is no accounts in group 2, correct? Actually, now uh, CA students are not at all studying NBFC. But in the, from their earlier study module, this, uh, this question has been extracted and it is given in your MTB. Samvedan Limited is a non-banking finance company. It accepts public deposit and also deals in higher purchase business, correct? Higher purchase business. It provides you with the following information regarding major higher purchase deals in 31st of 3, 2022. Few machines were sold on higher purchase basis. So some machines have been sold on higher purchase basis. And here it is written, the cash, just wait, the cash price, sorry, the higher purchase price was per set was rupees 100 lakhs as against cash price of 80 lakhs. So it is also given that cash price is 80 lakh and higher purchase price is 100 lakhs. The amount was payable as 20 lakhs down payment. As you know, under higher purchase, the client or the higher purchaser is going to make some initial payment that is known as signing amount or deal amount, correct? So here it is down payment and balance. And he is supposed to pay you balance amount in five equal installments. So total installments are five. Higher vendor collected the first installment on 31st of 3, 2023. Now our first year will end on 31st of 3, 2023, correct? Because we sold the asset on 31st 3, 2023 or for that distance 1, 4, 2022, you can say on this as on this date or 1, 4, 2022, you can say that we have sold the asset. <coughs> the higher vendor collected the first installment on 31st of 3, 2023, but could not collect the second installment, which was due on 31st 3, 2024. That means the story is beginning from 1 4 2022. Correct? The date actually, question has stated 31st 3 2022. So, for simplicity's sake, I am telling you 1 4 2022. Is it clear to you? So, 1 4 2022. Obviously, my first year will end on 31st of 3 2023. However, this year installments we have received. Now, when we reach this end of 31st of 3, 2024, this is our current year as per the question as we will see. This, this is our current year, this is our reporting date. Correct? 31st 3, 2024. That means till the reporting date, two years time period has already elapsed. Now, amount payable as 20 lakh, we have already gone through. Higher vendor collected the first installment but could not collect the second installment. So, second installment could not be collected. The important point is this. The company was finalizing the accounts for the year ending 31st 3, 2024. So this is a hint actually that this is the reporting date. Now question further says, till 15 5, 2024, the date on which board of directors signed the account, the second installment was not collected. We are not, honestly speaking, we are not much concerned with this particular line. Just to confuse you, they have given that after the end of the reporting period on 15th of May 2024, the board of director approved the what we call financial statement, but till up to that particular date, the second installment is still running due. Correct? But I just told you, simply you will have to ignore it. Presume internal rate of return is 10.42%. Internal rate of return, you simply take it as what we call rate of interest. Now, there are many questions in this particular question. What should be the principal outstanding on 1-4-2023? Your first question is this. Correct? Further, should the company recognize the charges for the year ended 23-24 as income? So, in this particular question, you are being asked lots of questions. Another, first of all, the first question is on 1-4-2023, they have, have actually it's 1-4-2023 indirectly also means 31st of 3, 2023. Correct? Just to confuse you, intentionally they are going to give in the examination such dates. 
that means they are asking you what is the principal amount outstanding at the end of the first year because 31st 3 2023 or 1 4 2023 is one and same date so whatever principal is outstanding first of all question is asking this amount this amount and then should the company recognize finance charges that mean the interest income for the year 2023-24 why question is asking this income because this year's installment you haven't received this year's installment you haven't received correct question is asking whether the interest obviously which is included in the installment should be recognized as income or not correct we will have to decide about this also whether we should recognize it as an income we will see later on it will be recognized as an income why we are going to recognize it as an income reason being is that we are at the end of the reporting date we are at the end of the reporting date we haven't received the installment no problem but the rule says that from the reporting date from the reporting date if 12 months period would exceed and still if the what we call interest portion remains uh, uncollected then you will not recognize but we are at the end of the reporting date so 12 months period hasn't gone by yet is it clear to you from the reporting date if 12 months period would elapse and still the interest payment remains uncollected then i am not going to recognize it in the pnl otherwise i am going to recognize it in spite of the fact that we haven't collected the investment of this year because investment was due on this particular date no 31st 3 2024 so not a single day has gone by because we are at the end of the reporting date correct so not a single day has elapsed in fact 12 months facility is already with us so if within next 12 months within next 12 months if we are not going to receive then we should not recognize this as an income this is the point is so another question is what should be the net book value now this is the main question what should be the net book value of the asset on 31st of 3 2024 that means in order to compute the net book value we have already seen actually what we need to take into account first of all we will have to compute the provision after having computed the provision then only we will be in a position to actually compute the net book value and then what should be the amount of provision so all these things all the question which i just explained through that example now will become more clearer to you through this particular question and surely i have a hunch and whenever i have a hunch most of the time i have seen actually question has struck in the examination from that so let's have a look over this particular question and how you are going to solve in order to solve this question i have done it in this manner but i will tell you a simple procedure also if you if you remember the methodology of higher purchase under higher purchase system calculation of interest you can apply that way also if you are more comfortable with that way otherwise you can use this one so first of all we need to take into account the rate of interest which is given in the question after taking that into account now what i am going to do 31st of 3 2022 or 1 4 2023 you can also write this correct amount outstanding that mean on 1 4 2023 presume you for a while you presume that you are the client you are the higher purchaser you have purchased an asset correct although the higher purchase price is 100 no doubt about that higher purchase price is 100 but at the same time the price of the asset is 80 and 20 you are supposed to pay as interest 80 is the cash price of the asset and 20 is the interest you are paying that is what we mean by hard purchase price 100 isn't it or not so first of all you will write what we call <clears throat> the cash value of the asset and then obviously you have made the down payment also so you have made the down payment on because on this particular date 31st or 3 2022 entity has sold out the asset so on that date you are going to make a payment of 20 and entity will receive 20 because you have made the down payment on the same day no question of any interest in it that means whatever down payment which you have paid this payment is considered as payment against the asset price remember one thing two types of payment you are supposed to make one against the asset and the well price of the asset is 80 and obviously 20 is the interest because your higher purchase price 100 is given but when you are making a down payment it will not carry any what we call interest element 
so that is the reason i have i haven't i have written here nil so that means this entire payment 20 is for the purpose of principal amount so 80 minus 20 now what will happen that means the closing balance at the end of the year closing balance will be equal to 60 is it clear to you or not after having paid the down payment obviously now the closing balance is 60 is it clear to you now what will happen on 31st of 3 2023 what we find we find that 60 is the opening balance now 60 has become your opening balance is it clear to you again you are going to receive because we are supposed to make the balance amount balance payment in three installment see total is the higher purchase price 20 is the down payment 20 is the down payment so balance amount is 80 and that 80 need to be paid in five installments so one installment will be equal to 16 you need to understand that also is it clear to you or not so we may say that 60 is the amounts 16 is the installment amount now the next point is that what is the interest portion in it in order to compute the interest correct you will apply 60 rupees 60 on this particular figure if you are going to apply rupees this uh, 10.42 on 60 see here i have written here also interest at the rate of 10.42 percent at the end of the year obviously interest will be charged at the end of the year and but it will be charged on the opening balance so 60 is the opening balance and you are going to charge interest on it so you will get the interest figure of 5.24 sorry interest figure of 6.25 and if I am going to sub subtract 6.25 from what my installment amount, I will come to know that actually I have paid 9.75 for the principal amount. Correct? So my balance will be 50.25. Is it clear to you? This is my balance on 31st of 3, 2024. So we have got the answer to the first question. Answer to the first question is what is the balance at the end of 31st of 3, 2023? This is the principal amount outstanding will become the answer. Correct? Now, there is another question associated. What about the finance charges with respect to this year? Now, obviously, this back closing balance will become the opening balance for the year 23-24. That means on 1-4-2020 because we are, here I have written 31st 3-2024, but here I have written opening outstanding balance. That means for this year ended, opening balance will be 50.25 again 16 is the amount of the installment again i will have to find the what we call interest in order to find the interest i will apply the interest rate on this particular figure so 50.25 into 10.42 percent will deliver me 5.24 by subtracting 5.24 from 16 i will come to know the portion of the installment which is meant for what we call installment or for the price of the asset so 10.76 i will subtract from 50.25 to know the balance correct because this is the principal amount asset price is the principal amount to get the closing balance you will subtract is it clear to you now we have to stop here but at the same time you must complete you must complete this table and you must be able to find out the interest for the rest of the years also and the balances of the later years after having computed this now we are in a position to find out the to give the answer to the all the questions and second two major questions are there calculation of net book value and creation of provision first two questions first of all let me discuss that first question was correct what is the principal balance at the end of 31st of 3 2023 this is second question was the interest for the year 31st 3 2024 should it be recognized or not i have already discussed that that this interest even though installment i have written it with red pen this installment is due but problem is that we are at the end of 31st 3, 2024 and not a single day has gone by because rule says that till next 12 months would go by, we should consider it what we call, we should consider it as an income. So 5.24, correct? We will consider it as an income and we will credit it to profit and loss account for the year ended 31st 3, 2024. Now how to compute the amount of provision? I just told you in order to compute the amount of provision, first of all, what we need to do, we need to take into account the overdue installment. Now, this installment is overdue, no doubt about that. 
and after this there are three more installments there are three more installments so three more installments 16 into 3 so total amount of installment correct uh, which are overdue and which are not yet due will be equal to 64 and from this as i told you i all i have to do is now to subtract the finance charges which are not matured but you should be aware of the meaning of finance charges which are not yet matured so what we mean what we meant by or what we mean by actually finance charges which are matured i discussed it earlier correct interest charges on such installment which haven't yet become due so these are the charges these are the charges finance charges correct for the next three years so you will total them up and i must have to written also here see these are the finance charges you are going to subtract what we call uh, from this 64 8.51 total of unmatured finance charges correct after subtracting this you are getting this particular figure but now another important point will surface you will have to in order to create the provision you will have to subtract the depreciated value and here you need to be alert because in order to find out the depreciated value first of all i will take into account the cash price and i will compute depreciation for two years on a straight line basis at the rate of 20 percent so cash price is 80 and depreciation at the rate of 20 percent on 80 for two years will be 16 plus 16 32 so 32 minus 80 will be equal to 48 this is your depreciated value so now you have computed the depreciated value and this value the difference will be your provision amount so you have computed the provision amount also is it clear to you or not so this is how you are supposed to compute the provision is it clear to you or not now so how to compute the net book value it seems actually that part is not printed here okay i will compute it for you no problem okay no problem at all i think i have computed it okay amount of provision okay amount of provision i have computed later on and now net book value actually steps are absolutely similar see here steps are absolutely similar so first of all i will take into account the overdue installments correct their total will be 64 i will subtract the unmatured charges now this is the total now this is the total now from this particular total i will subtract the amount of provision which i have already computed actually provision i have computed later actually you can put this step first and then you can uh, follow with this particular step anyway for how to compute the provision i have already seen we have already seen first we will take the total of all such installment where we are supposed to receive some money and from there on we are supposed to subtract the unmatured finance charges then whatever figure we will get from there on we are supposed to subtract the depreciated value we will get the amount of provision after this till up to this point our step will remain same correct we will take the total of such investment from which we are supposed to receive the money their total is 64 from there then we are supposed to subtract the unmatured finance charges then we will get this particular figure now in order to compute the net book value i will have to subtract the amount of provision so this will be considered as my net book value is it clear to you or not so this is how you have to in fact you can make this as a step one is it clear to you and then this will become your step two correct and this is here i have written about what we call answers to the first and second question and last thing is with respect to leased asset and higher purchase asset rule also says mm -hmm. that entity need to make some additional provision for additional provision also this is the norm this is the normal way of making the provision and besides that we have to make some additional provision additional provision an additional provision will be made on net book value on net book value as per the time limits for example any entity any nbfc if it is dealing in higher purchase or lease rentals correct and our lease rentals or what we call higher purchase installments have become due then obviously we will have to make some provision now you see where higher charges or lease rentals are overdue up to 12 months then no provision is needed is it clear to you because 12 months period hasn't gone by as we just saw earlier also however if the time is in between 12 to 24 months if the if we haven't received the higher charges or the lease rentals correct for a period which is falling 
from 12 months till 24 months, then 10% provision, 10% of net book value. That is why the concept of net book value is important. Although if a question is related to additional provision, you will always be given net book value, correct? And where time period is from 24 to 36 months, in that particular case, we are supposed to make a provision of 40%. And similarly, if time period is from 36 to 48, provision is 70%. If time period would exceed 48 months, in that case, 100% pro provision is required. For example, just to make you understand, in this case, there is an entity and it is selling lots of asset and some information is given with respect to what we call their net book value and the time period for which the installment have remained unpaid. So here it is given, this entity has sold LCD television set and period overdue is given up to 12 months. Now up to 12 months, I have already told you, no provision is required. No provision is required. Is it clear to you? Up to 12 months, no provision is required. In fact, this is the question actually. Here it, I have done the solution. Where higher charges or lease rentals are overdue, no provision is required. Is it clear to you? Although it is interest amount is given to you, what we call confuse you. That means we need not require to this much of interest has remained due for a period, but period is up to 12 months. It hasn't yet exceeded. So no provision is required and also net book value of the asset is also given to you. Now washing machine. Now in this case, period is given period of overdue is for 24 months. If it is for 24 months, we have already seen if the time period is 12 months, but up to 24 months, in that case, provision will be made at the rate of 10%. 10% of what? 10% of net book value. Now you are being given net book value as 2410. Now in this case, you are going to make a provision of 10% of the, of the net book value 241. Correct? Similarly, in case of refrigerator, it is given 36 months. Now, because it is given 30 months, now it is falling in between 36 to 48 months slab. So obviously 70% provision will be, sorry, in this question, 30 months was given now, right? So 30 months will fall in between this particular slab, 24 to 36 months. So 40%, you will have to make the provision on the net book value, which is there, which is given to us. Net book value is 1280. In this case, 45 months, correct? 45 months will definitely means actually, it is 45 months will be 36 to 48, correct? 45 months are given. So 70%. If it would have been given as 49 months, it would have fallen in this particular slab. So this is how you are going to create a book value. So these are the questions which you must take care of while solving what we call and questions, oh, sorry, while going through NBFC. So on our part, we have done comprehensive revision. I hope each one of you would agree. It is not just a revision, but many other things. For it, now here is the test. I'm taking the test now. Non-performing asset in case of lease rental and higher purchase asset, correct? Actually, this generally we discuss in our regular classes where we define what are non-performing asset, etc. But at this moment, let me tell you the answer is overdue for three months. Similarly, term public deposit will always include debenture, funds raised directly or through public deposits or bank finance. Everything is known as what we call public deposits or public funds, sorry. NDS is applicable to NBFC. Yes, from 1-4-2018, now NBFC have fallen, has, uh, have fallen into the purview of NDS, no doubt about that. And this is one question. NBFC ND which have asset side of asset size of 500 crore correct and all NBFC deposits shall maintain minimum tier 1 capital of actually answer is 10% actually you will definitely be a little bit surprised sir, how we are going to answer this particular question you need not require to worry about those among you you who have our regular classes notes over there we have written theories also but this is just a question very rarely could be asked actually but still you should know that all and even like banking company you must have heard about this tier one capital tier two capital capital adequacy ratio similar is the case with respect to nbfc but if you can memorize this it will hold you in a good state then one student uh, i think srinivasan was there he told me, sir, regarding June 24 financial instrument question, I think he was talking about financial instrument question. Yes, he told me, sir, answer is wrong. Answer is correct. Actually, I have checked Srinivasan Gopalan. You have 
taken here 15 percent kindly check your solution actually it is 6.5 percent and answer is well and truly correct this was one query correct which was raised by Sri Nivasan Gopalan so that is why I have included here and there was another query from one student I have forgotten the name of the student he asked this actually Srinivasan asked query from economic value added or value added correct uh, regarding June 24 question so answer is correctly solved but you have given me the solution which you did on your side and then I checked I, I found you committed a mistake over there you have taken 15 percent it should be actually 6.5 percent because risk free rate is 6.5 percent which we computed here is it clear I hope it is clear and then one student also asked uh, that he is having a bit of doubt with respect to June 24 question which I think I in the class told you to do it by yourself and this is a relevant doubt because I told you to do it by yourself so in, in that case you may have a bit of problem. Your question was interesting because I told you that generally in case of loans etc we have to compute the fair value on the date on which actually we have delivered the loan or taken the loan. You are absolutely right till up to this particular point. And your another query was was with respect to this question, sir, there are two types of rate of interest is given. So why we did not use or for that distance, why we did not compute internal rate of return to come to find out the present value of the loan. You are absolutely right till up to this particular point. But in this question, why we are not actually discounting, correct? Reason is that it is given in the question that loan amount is 20 crore. But if you have gone this particular question and intentionally I gave it to do it by um, to do it by yourself so that I will come to know at least how the student are going to fare off when such questions, such a new thing will surface before them. See here in this particular question it is given since the sorry Bayas Limited paid an origination origination fee of 12.395 crores to Sindhu Limited to compensate Sindhu Limited for the lower rate of interest. In this question what is happening Bayas Limited is borrowing from Sindhu Limited and they are borrowing amount of rupees nearly what we call 20 crores. Is it clear to you? 20 crores. And it is repayable as a single bullet payment at the end of five years. Bullet payment means in one lump sum we will have to pay it after five years. Number one. Number two. And we are getting this loan at the rate of 5%. At the rate of 5%. And rate of interest is 8%. That means suppose I am, the, I am the person who is seeking the loan. That means I am the borrower. I am Bayas Limited. I am Bayas Limited. Number one. And let us say you are the lender. You are lending me money and market rate of interest is 8% but you are giving me this particular loan at the rate of 5%. Now the amount of loan is 20 crores but what is happening here the borrower is paying initially some amount near about nearly 12 crores he is paying to the lender and telling him I am paying you this amount for the loss of interest. So because in this question compensation amount is already paid initially we need not require to find out fair value or discount it directly this amount remaining after subtracting the origination fee whatever amount you will be left of with this will be considered the value at which loan will be recognized. Is it clear to you because you have why we compute actually present value because we want to know actually by how much we are gaining. Because I have taken the loan, if I am going to compute the present value, it will be lesser than that. No doubt about that. It will be lesser than that, isn't it or not? So generally I will have a gain and lender will have a little bit of loss. But the point is that we have already compensated him for the loss. So that is why that itself will now be considered. So whenever in the question, if it would be given this way around that on that date itself, we have given some payment to compensate him for the loss. In that case, simply subtract it from the amount of the loan and whatever balance will be there, that should be considered as the value. That itself should be considered as the fair value. So here you need not require to discount it. Is it clear to you? So that is the reason why we did not apply any what we call interest rate on it. So this, these were your question and regarding your answers, some students were asking the answers with respect to I think financial instrument test. Question number one, your answer is actually D, correct? Question number one, I'm simply telling you the answer. Question number two, answer is A. Question number three, and it is very simple to answer. Question number A. Oh, sorry, option A, fourth D, fifth D, 
and finally sixth also d so these are the answer many student demand were demanding the answer so i gave the answer so starting today a very important topic as you must have noted this is financial instrument and this is your revision revisionary session 10 and we hope to actually finish financial instrument within one hour correct uh, not pretty long one but at the same time pretty important from the examination point of view what sort of question you can be actually you can expect out of this particular session so hence when we start today's this particular session you need to require to worry about whether you are having the notes right now or not i will see to it that you understand intricacies of this particular complicated chapter financial instruments so we are starting this particular session financial instrument first thing first as far as this particular chapter in this on financial instrument is concerned as each one of you are very well aware that there are three indices which govern the entire accounting affairs of financial instrument one is indices 109 actually indices 109 why this is important because so many times we have seen from this particular from this particular chapter mcqs are striking in the examination wherein they are asking you like indices 109 deals with so that is the reason you need to understand first of all three indices deal with financial instrument and first one is indices 109 indices 109 deal with recognition and measurement then besides that there is indias 32 indias 32 deals with presentation aspects of financial instrument and besides that there is indias 107 also which is related to financial instrument but it is related to disclosure of financial instruments correct these are the three standard this is the first thing which you need to know now coming over to financial instrument by now you each one of you know quite well actually what we mean by financial instrument you know financial instrument is a contract and this contract gives rise to financial asset for one party and for the other party it will give rise to either financial liability or what we call equity instrument so what is financial instrument financial instrument basically is a contract and this contract will give birth to financial asset for one party and it will give birth to either financial liability or equity instrument for the other party is it clear to you all in all now we can surmise that this entire chapter actually revolves around actually three things in fact to be very honest with you two foremost thing one is financial asset and another one is financial liability besides that we will have to take into account what we call uh, equity instruments now first of all we need to understand what we mean by financial asset financial asset put in simple words it is a contractual right to receive either a cash or what we call another financial asset from the other party correct what we mean by financial asset financial asset simply signifies a contractual right to receive something in cash or what we call financial asset from the other party now as per definition cash itself is considered what we call financial instrument it is by definition included under the definition of financial asset moreover you can think that way for example suppose if you have put up cash in a bank that mean you have a contractual right with the bank to take back your cash anytime isn't it or not similarly equity instruments cash and equity instruments by definition fall under the category of financial asset besides that under the category of financial asset we generally include debtors trade receivable investment in debentures of another party <coughs> investment in preference shares of another party and loans given to the other party for example if we have given what we call loan to other party here it means there is a contract between you and the other party and because of this contract you are having a right now to take back what we call some amount or some financial asset from the other party in settlement isn't it or not so this is what we mean by financial asset what we mean by financial liability now financial asset signifies contractual right to receive something that is cash or what we call financial asset on the other hand you just reverse it financial liability means it is a contractual obligation upon you to deliver what we call cash or some financial asset to settle the liability or obligation so generally under the financial liability as an example we include actually creditors trade payable redeemable debenture issued by an entity and redeemable preference share issued by an entity is it clear to you and what we mean by equity instrument we have you have already gone through what we call indias 103 and indias 110 you know very well that when you make investment in a particular entity for example your investment in a particular entity is 10% what does it signify 
it signifies as an investor now you have a right on the net assets of the company to the proportion of your what we call proportion of holding for example your holding is 10 percent now whatever net assets of that particular entity and what we mean by net asset net asset means asset minus liability and in more technical jargon it is also known as residual interest residual interest so equity basically signifies your interest in the what we call net asset or as we call residual interest is it clear to you or not that is what we mean by equity now this part classification of financial instrument is very important in this in the sense i expect a question of four or five marks could strike from this particular part so kindly pay attention don't take it lightly i've already told you what you mean by actually financial asset correct financial asset means you are having a contractual right to receive either cash or some financial asset from the other entity as I clear to you, for example, investment in equity shares, investment in loans, trade and other receivable and government, government bonds. All these are considered as financial asset because here either they are by definition, for example, investment in equity share by definition is considered as an asset, number one. And moreover, actually, you can think on such line when you are going to invest into a particular entity. Now you are having a right on the residual interest that when you are still having a right to receive something, isn't it? That is why it is a financial asset. Whereas in case of loan state receivable and government bonds, correct, you are having a contractual right to receive any cash or financial assets. So these are financial assets. On the liability side, if I will look into, I will see issue of debenture, perpetual debenture. What we mean by perpetual debenture? Perpetual debenture basically means such debenture which the company has issued but no time limit has been set for their repayment. Generally when an entity issues the debenture, as you know at the time of issue itself company will has to actually very clearly define what its redemption terms. Now for example, generally the redemption term cannot be more than 10 years but companies are allowed to issue perpetual debenture. That's a different thing that in India perpetual debentures are not allowed. but there are perpetual debenture wherein no time limit is there but at the same time when a company will issue the debenture as you know company undertakes a contract there is a contract between the debenture holder the investor investor you can say the debenture holder and the company that on the debenture which we have issued we are going to give you return for the specific period of time till the time of maturity and after the maturity we are going to repay your amount so that means there is a contractual obligation upon the company to deliver financial interest each year, sorry, interest on debenture each year. And at the end of the maturity, we need to repay the principles. So issue of debenture definitely is a financial liability. There is a contractual obligation upon you to deliver cash or financial asset. In case of perpetual debenture, although there is no obligation to deliver the principal amount, because there is no time limit. But in, in spite of that, you are still under an obligation to pay each year what we call interest on debenture. That is why it will fall under the category of financial liability. Similarly, if your entity has received some deposit, it will be considered as financial liability on account of what we call same logic. But I would like to actually, I would like you to pay some extra attention towards these items. For example, inventories, property, plant and equipment, intangible. First, I will take these three items. In your view, what these should be classified? <coughs> inventories. If suppose your entity is keeping inventories with yourself, correct? Does it mean that here you are having a contractual right to receive some cash or financial asset from the other entity? No, here in this case, you are not having any such right. So that is why it will neither be considered not applicable and oblique A means not applicable. That means it is neither a financial asset nor financial liability, neither it is or nor it is what we call equity. Correct. Similarly is the case with property, plant and equipment. Same logic because here, here just property, plant and equipment is just an asset for you. Just holding the uh, holding the property, plant and equipment doesn't what we call confers upon you a right to actually receive some cash or any financial asset from the other party. And similar logic will apply to intangible. So these are neither what we call financial asset nor financial liability. Coming over to prepaid expenses. Most of the time students actually commit mistake here because they are under an impression that it is a sort of current asset and they without what we call any thinking con consider it as a what we call financial asset but point important you need to understand here is that prepaid expenses is neither financial asset nor financial liability sir why the reason is that of course you have paid the money in advance but there is no contractual obligation in this particular case to receive cash against the same 
or any financial asset against the same. Here you are having a contractual right to receive some services against the same. Here you are not having any contractual right to receive any cash or financial asset. So that is the reason it will not fall under the category of financial asset. It will be considered as what we call uh, a simple asset. Similarly, deferred revenue expenditure. What is deferred revenue expenditure? It means it is a revenue. It is some amount which you have already received as a revenue. Correct. Obviously, you have recognized some portion of the revenue, but some portion of the revenue you haven't re recognized and that portion of the amount received as revenue, which you haven't yet recognized is known as deferred revenue. Is it clear to you? But that amount which you have received as revenue and some portion of it, you haven't recognized it as revenue. Definitely, it is a deferred revenue. But that amount as per contract, you need not require to repay. You are not under any contractual obligation to repay. So that is why it will not be considered as financial liability. Sim and very important income taxes and most of us confuse here. We are under an impression actually that income taxes we have to pay. So there is a contractual right. No doubt here there is a contractual right. But this right is n here in this particular case. The obligation to pay the amount is not coming up on account of any contract. It is a uh, statutory obligation you can say. Is it clear to you? It is very important that obligation or for that distance any right should fall upon you on account of contract. Here in this case, there is no contract. Remember one thing. Here in this particular case, what is happening? There is a statutory what we call rule that each year you have to pay the income tax. So it is a statutory obligation, not an obligation on account of contract. That is why it should not be considered as financial liability. Gold bonds. Gold bonds are financial asset because when you are purchasing the gold bonds of the government, generally gold bonds are issued by the government of a nation. And in this case, you are having a contractual right to receive your interest and at the same time your principal money after the expiry of the maturity period. But if you are keeping the gold with you simply, then it is neither a financial asset nor a what we call li a financial liability. It is just an asset for you. Now coming over to some important items. These are the important items. See here, irredeemable preference debentures. Okay, irredeemable. Here you have to pay a little bit of attention. Irredeemable. Irredeemable preference shares or for that instance debentures. Suppose your entity has issued irredeemable preference shares. Irredeemable preference share has been issued by your entity. Correct? These are irredeemable preference share. Now you let me know. What should I categorize them? Should I categorize them? First of all, things that way around. Obviously, these items cannot be classified as financial asset. At the most, we may think that it can be treated as financial liability. So I will have to think this way around. These are irredeemable preference shares or debenture for that instance. Correct? Now, think on such line. Is there, is there, and further it is also written, uh, let me complete this, with discretionary interest irredeemable preference share or debentures because in case of preference shares we pay dividend in case of debentures we pay interest but this time this payment of dividend and interest is discretionary what we mean by discretionary discretionary basically signifies choice prerogative that means it is the complete prerogative of the director of the company whether they wish to actually pay the dividend if it is a case of preference share or debenture, if it is a case of interest. That means this time debentures have been issued. First of all, on the condition that these are irredeemable. Second, also the payment of dividend or interest will be the complete prerogative or choice of the directors of the company. Now you have to see whether it is a financial liability or not. It could become financial liability or for that distance any item could be financial liability only if there is an obligation upon the entity one to pay interest or for that distance dividend but in this particular case there is no such obligation because this time payment of interest and dividend is discretionary it is upon the choice of the directors number one also there is no obligation with respect to payment of principal money there is no obligation because these are irredeemable. Are you getting my point or not? So what should I categorize them? Should I categorize them as financial liability? I will categorize them as equity because I cannot categorize them as financial liability. 
is it clear to you or not because this time any financial history any financial instrument where you are not having any obligation with respect to payment of interest on dividend will be categorized as equity is it clear to you why it is an equity second important point because these are very confusing point and no one will tell you this one ccp as as we generally call them compulsorily convertible preference shares correct wherever i am saying preference share you substitute it with debentures also so compulsorily convertible preference shares or debentures once again here it is written with discretionary interest now suppose your entity has issued compulsorily convertible preference shares or for that instance debenture compulsorily convertible preference share and debentures and again there is discretion with respect to payment of what we call interest or for that is this dividend so what should i categorize such financial instrument i told you you can categorize an instrument as financial liability only when there will be an obligation upon you to either pay interest or what we call principal amount as per the contract you have issued compulsorily convertible preference shares and debentures and also the payment of dividend and interest is discretionary that mean you are not under any obligation if you are not under any obligation with respect to interest or for that distance dividend and at the same time upon you there is no what we call obligation to pay the principal in this case remember one thing how you are going to actually on maturity how you are going to repay preference shareholders or debentures because they are compulsorily convertible into equity share that been at the time of maturity you will not deliver any cash neither any financial asset you are going to simply convert them into equity so in this case neither there is an obligation with respect to interest dividend neither there is an obligation with respect to principal payment so that is why this particular instrument too will be categorized as an equity item is it clear to you or not is it clear i hope so it is clear i am doing my level best effort another important point in one session i think at the most in one hour we will finish it up don't worry about that but i will take a little bit of time only for this and then further redeemable preference share redeemable preference share coming over to mm -hmm, what is happening okay redeemable preference shares or debenture now this time preference shares are redeemable or for that instance debenture further it is written with discretionary interest with discretionary interest this time redeemable preference shares or debentures these are redeemable but as far as interest or dividend payment is concerned that is here it is written with discretionary interest correct that means there is a discretion there is a choice upon the director whether they want to pay interest or not so as far as payment of interest or for that instance dividend is concerned there is no obligation there is no obligation but what about principal what about principal they are redeemable so that when you have to pay the principal now you must have noticed in this particular case what is happening redeemable preference share with discretionary interest that mean there is no obligation with respect to interest there is no obligation with respect to interest but at the same at the same time there is an obligation with respect to principal sum that mean this instrument is carrying two sort of thing one there is an obligation for interest and dividend there is an obligation for principal there is no obligation sorry i i think i have re readable preference here for principal there is an obligation and for interest and dividend no obligation so if a financial instrument is such where there is obligation upon you and simultaneously there is no obligation upon you that mean there is no obligation with respect to interest and dividend because interest and dividend is discretionary but there is an obligation to pay the principal because they are redeemable so such a instrument is known as compound financial instrument why it is a compound financial instrument because there is obligation for interest and dividend uh, sorry for principal so that is why this portion will be considered as financial liability but at the same time there is no obligation with respect to interest and on so that is why that portion will be considered as equity is it clear to you why it is a compound financial instrument one more example i will take irredeemable preference here 
if they are irredeemable that means there is no obligation with respect to principle with respect to principle there is no obligation but this time here it is written with mandatory interest that means interest must be paid so that means there is an obligation with respect to interest interest or dividend there is an obligation so again it will be considered as compound financial instrument so you need to understand what you mean by compound financial instrument is it clear to you an instrument where there is obligation for a particular thing especially for interest and dividend and there is no obligation for the other part is it clear to you besides that you can also go through these two compulsorily convertible preference shares and all these now you can understand them very easily don't worry about that so after having a look over this particular part next part is method of measurement of financial asset and financial liability as you know as far as accounting aspect is concerned suppose your entity is having a financial instrument then how you are going to measure how you are going to actually recognize it first of all financial instrument are recognized either as financial asset or financial liability or equity you know now as far as their measurement is concerned how they are measured somewhere under business combination also if you remember actually while discussing the while discussing the business combination in stages i talked about this thing financial instrument are measured either as fair value through profit and loss account or fair value through other comprehensive income as we normally call it fetoci or as amortized cost that means there are three broad categories and entity will measure the financial instrument by what we call putting the financial instrument into either of these three categories is it clear to you now the question is how the entity is going to decide that in which category we are going to put the important point is that it depends upon the business model we call it business model what we mean by business model business model basically stands for intention of the entity intention of the entity are you getting my point or not just allow me to have a sip of tea so suppose i have a financial instrument and i want to actually categorize it into one of these three categories so how i am going to decide it i will look into the intention of the entity and this intention is known as business model is it clear to you this intention is known as business model business model is nothing but the intention the purpose for which you want to actually keep the financial instrument now if you intend to actually keep the financial instrument for the trading purpose for the trading purpose trading means you do not want to hold it for a for a long period of time all you are interested in buying and selling of this financial instrument and that is how you want to recover back your money you have invested some money in the financial instrument and by selling it what we call you want to recover the amount is it clear to you that mean if your intention is to not to hold for a long period of time correct rather you are interested in trading activity then generally the financial instrument will be classified under the category of fet pl that is fair value through profit and loss account and what we mean by fair value through profit and loss account so often we actually uh, have gone through this the name fair value through profit and loss account i have already told you so many times those among you who have who are our regular class student i have told fair value through profit and loss account in simple words means measurement of fair value through profit and loss account that means whatever changes in the fair value of this financial instrument would take place that will be credited or debited to profit and loss account in simple words that is what we mean by fair value through profit and loss account is it clear to you second point is that if my business model is if my business model is to hold the asset for a for a particular period of time i want to hold the item for a particular period of time but after some time i want to sell it off that mean i do not want to hold it for till the date of maturity i want to hold it for a for a period of time and after that i want to sell it off so here your intention is to hold and then sell off but you are selling it off before the maturity so if your intention is such generally under such a situation we categorize it into ftp ftpt oci fair value through other comprehensive income 
is it clear to you and what we mean by fair value through other comprehensive income it means any changes in the fair value will be taken to other comprehensive income what is other comprehensive income the lower section of statement of pnl is known as other comprehensive income is it clear and there is another category if your intention is to hold the financial instrument till the date of maturity if your intention is to hold till the date of maturity in that case it will be categorized as amortized cost what we mean by amortized cost that also i will let you know correct now just have a look over this particular question first of all case study 7.1 correct here it is written 10x limited invested in equity shares of another entity on 15th of march 2027 okay no problem remember one thing your investment is on 15th of march 2027 that mean accounting year will end almost after 16 days that is on 31st of 3227 our accounting year will end isn't it or not that mean prior to the end of the accounting year prior to almost 16 days so this entity actually purchased made some investment in equity shares of another entity and your investment is rupees 10000 further it is written transaction cost incurred amounted to 100 transaction cost that mean when we do the sale purchase of what we call financial instrument we have to incur some transaction cost like legal expenses like stamp duty expenses like brokerage commission all these are considered as transaction cost is it clear to you so there is transaction cost also 100 now at the end on this particular date we purchased it for 10000 but at the end of the year question states that fair value on the balance sheet date is actually 12000 pass entries if financial asset is classified as fair value through profit and loss account generally under fvtpl we include equity instrument investment in equity instruments correct however question is stated that first of all what will be your entry just pay attention in this case when you purchase when you did the transaction you will simply write investment in equity instrument account 10000 number 1 and you will show transaction cost separately correct transaction cost account debit to bank account 10100 in fact it means this is the combined entry actually you are passing two entry investment in equity instrument account debit to bank account 10000 10000 and transaction cost account debit to bank account 100 100 is it clear to you now whatever transaction cost is there ultimately these are the expenses is it clear to you in balance sheet oci where should be shown under the liability we never show in balance sheet oci in balance sheet oci the balance in oci is known as retained earnings and that retained earnings are reflected under the other equity correct satya priya oci is the name of the account like like statement of pnl it is the name of the account similarly other comprehensive income is the name of the lower section and whatever balance will be there that is known as retained earning that retained earnings will be reflected under the other equity towards the liability side correct anyway now whatever transaction cost is there that transaction cost must be actually debited to profit and loss account that mean if the financial is remember one thing if financial instrument has been categorized as fvtpl number 1 transaction cost will be separately recorded that when you will pass separate entry for transaction cost and ultimately it will be debited to profit or loss account number 2 at the end of the year whatever changes has taken place i just told you any change in fair value will be debited or credited to a statement of profit or loss account so in this case the fair value has gone from 10000 to 12000 so the gain will be taken to the credit of a statement of profit or loss account so investment in equity instrument because of increase in fair value your investment will increase investment account will be debited and gain will be taken to profit or loss account and just to clear the case with respect to fvt oci now we take almost the same example investment has been done on this particular date correct that is 15 3 okay 15 3 so on 31st on 31st of 3 2022 my accounting year will come to an end this time date is given 15 3 15 3 2022 we have made the investment this time also there is transaction cost fair value similar to the last question is 12000 at the end of the year but this time question is asking pass entries if financial asset is classified as fvt oci 
Now try to understand. Logically, investment in equity instruments should always be categorized under the category of FVTPL. Should always be categorized. However, however, an entity is given a choice. An entity is given a choice. If the entity wish or desire, they can categorize investment in equity instrument instead of FVTPL, they can categorize it under the category of FVT OCI also. However, once you have gone for this option of categorizing your financial asset into FVT OCI category, investment in equity instrument I am talking about. Once you have taken the decision that we are going to categorize it as what we call FVT OCI, then you cannot revert it. That means henceforth, after your dead decision, you will always consider it as FVT OCI. Anyway, so in this case, in simple words, your financial asset investment in equity instrument is considered as FVT OCI. Now question is asking you to pass the entry. In case, now see the difference between the last one and here, although the amounts are same. We have made investment in equity instrument and our investment is 10,000. But here I have added the transaction cost to the financial asset. Are you getting my point or not? That means transaction cost will be added to financial asset if the financial asset is being measured under the category of FVT OCI or transaction cost will be subtracted from financial liability. Financial liability is being measured under the category of FVT OCI. In case of FVTPL, transaction costs are separately recorded, correct? They are not what we call mingled with the what we call amount of the financial asset or liability. However, in case of in case of FVT OCI, if there will be transaction cost, that will be added if it is a financial asset, it will be subtracted if it is a financial liability. So we are adding rupees 100 to the cost of the investments. Cost of the investment is 10,000. So that is why I have written investment in equity instrument account debit to bank account. Correct? Because here you are not recording the transaction cost separately. So no question of taking the transaction cost to the PNL because there nowhere now transaction cost is appearing because it has become a part of what we call asset. Is it clear? Now at the end of the year, that means you have recorded investment when you made the transaction at 10,100. Now at the end of the year, fair value of your investment is 12,000. At the end of the year, fair value of your investment is 12,000. How much, how much is the increase now? Now increase will not be considered as 2,000. This time your increase is from 10,100 to 12,000. That means 1,900 will be considered, considered as an increase, number one. And this increase I need not require to tell you will be taken to what we call OCI instead of PNL. That is the only difference. However, from where you can get the question, from which topic? In this entire chapter, only two topics you need to do thoroughly, correct? Only two topics. Take it from my side and you need not require to stress upon unnecessarily. One among them is amortized cost, correct? One is amortized cost and another one is compound financial instrument. So question of 7 mark, 14 mark could strike from only this particular topic and none other topic. You need not require to go through any other topic at all, I can assure you. Is it clear to you? That means till up to what I am teaching you here, you have to actually go through only, you have to do only that much. Amortized cost category, what does it mean? I have already told you if the intention, if the business model is to hold the asset till the date of maturity, then you need to actually take your financial asset into the category of amortized cost. Is it clear to you? Now, first of all, we need to understand the entire affair of what we call account, this uh, entire affair of accounting of amortized cost because from this you are going to get the question. In order to make you understand, first of all, see here, and this particular case study is very, very important. G9 Limited, as a part of staff welfare expense, contracted to lend employees a sum of money at 5% interest per annum. What is the contract between the entity? The name of the entity is G99 Limited. G99 Limited has entered into a contract with its employees, with its employees, correct? And the contract is that entity will lend some money to employees and the money will be lent at at an interest rate of what we call 5%. This is the contract so far. 
Correct? This is the contract. Now it is written the amount lent is to be repaid in five equal installment along with interest. Now, question says that whatever amount this entity has lent to the employees, correct? The employees are going to repay the amount in five equal installment. It is of, put, it is of paramount importance to see this particular repayment scenario. The repayment scenario in this case in five equal installment along with interest. That means each year employee will give us some installment and along with that some interest. Is it clear to you? Is it clear to you or not till up to this particular point? Notes will be given and dispatched on your emails. Correct? Where you need to send your email. Number one. Otherwise, after two days, you can get it from what we call public platform. After two days, we will release it on public platform. But if you want instantly, after the session, provide your email addresses on the links which we are going to give you in the what we call message box or under the description. Now here, very important line is given market rate of interest is 10%. And most of the time, whenever you are going to get a question, I will let you know, I will tell you everything. Don't worry about amortized cost, but first of all, pay attention. You will be generally given under such questions that so and so is the interest rate at which the actual amount or loan has been forwarded by the entity to their employees. And quite surely that rate of interest will be much different than the market rate of interest. As you can see here, market rate of interest, MRI, market rate of interest in this particular case happens to be 10% happens to be 10%. Is it clear to you? Now the question states that the loan amount is 16 lakh and it is lent on 1-1-2015. The loan amount has been lent on 1-1-2015, number one. Amount is 16 lakh, number two. And total installment is equal to, total stall, number of installment is five. This is the point. Loans Daters, trade receivables, whatever. Generally, these items are always measured at amortized cost. Correct? Quite obviously. You may ask, why, sir? The reason is that, suppose I, if I have given a loan to somebody, obviously I will have to wait till the date of maturity. Are you getting my point? If I have invested some money in the debentures of a particular company, even debentures will fall under it generally. Correct? I will have to wait till the date of the maturity. So, automatically here the intention is to hold that particular asset for till the date of maturity. That is why they are measured under the category of amortized cost. Number one. Number two. Now question says that following the principles of India's 109, you are required to record entries for 31st of 12, 2015. That is exactly what the question would ask you. At least for one year they would ask entry. And, and last time there was a question, let me tell you, correct? And that question, similar to that question was available in our notes, but the problem is that a student hardly ever take the effort to go through the entire length and breadth of the chapter in spite of so many warnings. Anyway, calculate the value of the loan to be recognized initially and also amortized cost for all subsequent years. This is the demand of the question. Generally, under such question, I have given you a clue. There will be what we call either loan amount will flow out or loan amount will come in. Both the possibilities could happen. Number one, at some rate of interest, that rate of interest will be given. At what rate of interest you have given loan or you have taken the loan. And that rate of interest must be different from the market rate of interest. Is it clear to you? Generally, under such questions, you will be asked to reflect the item of the loan or for that instance, financial liability. In this case, it is a case of loan and it is a financial asset for the entity. So you will be asked to reflect the amount of financial asset or for that instance, financial liability at amortized cost in the balance sheet. We will take up all these issues. Now pay attention. Your first step is initial recognition. Last time when the question is struck in the examination, they simply asked you only this step, step number A. And prior to that, one question also is struck in the examination from financial instrument. Again, they asked only step number one. Is it clear to you? 
एनीवे अंडर स्टेप नंबर वन व्हाट वी आर ट्राइंग टू ट्राइंग टू डू एक्चुअली व्हाट इज हैपनिंग दिस एंटिटी इज गिविंग ए लोन ऑफ रुपीज सिक्सटीन लैख एज यू कैन अंडरस्टैंड इट बेटर ना एंड दिस लोन विल गेट रिपेड टू यू आफ्टर हाउ मेनी इयर्स आफ्टर फाइव इयर्स नाउ द क्वेश्चन इज now the question is should i recognize it at 16 lakh on the initial date because on the initial date i have given the loan i have to pass the entry i will have to record this so financial assets should be measured at what value the question arises obviously i cannot recognize it at 16 lakh why because i am going to recover my loan after 5 years isn't it of course in between i am not only 5 years actually i am going to recover it in five equal installment but the full amount will come back to me only in five years and in each year i will get some interest and some installment of the money so that is the reason we cannot recognize it at 16 lakh it is as simple as that at least this thing should be clear to everyone now if you are going to divide 16 lakh by 5 kindly divide and let me know what is the amount i am not having the calculator Kindly divide sixteen like sixteen lakh by five and let me know how much is the amount. So, as you can see, if you are going to divide sixteen lakh by five, so each year you are going to get a installment of three lakh twenty thousand. Each year you are going to get a installment of three lakh twenty thousand. I think so, isn't it or not? Three lakh twenty thousand. Number one. Number two. First of all, right here, make this table, and in this table you will have to make almost six columns. and under the six column first of all you will have to write year your starting year is 2015 quite obviously the story will run up to next 5 years so for next 5 years you will have to stretch it and then you think on such lines so what thank you upendra rajpan it is 3 lakh 20 okay thank you and more over it is written over here but in the heat of the uh, actually Study. I sometimes forget myself the amount actually. Anyway, three lakh twenty thousand. So three lakh twenty thousand is the principal money which you are going to receive back. Is it clear to you? But you will have to think on such line that whatever you are going to record here, you are going to record here at the end of the year. That means if I am saying two thousand fifteen, it means. at the end of 2015 so at the end of the 2015 why because at the end of the first year i am going to receive back the first installment is it clear to you so i have received the first installment 3 lakh 20000 number 1 if i have given 16 lakh worth of loan to somebody at the end of the year i will also receive the interest so 5% of 16 lakh i will also receive the interest at the end of the first year again why i am telling you it at this moment it is appearing easy to you due to one thing right now i am teaching i hope this much of arrogancy i can reflect but anyway just for the sake of joke i told that but the point is that actually it is easy in the initial stages but sometime unnecessarily mistakes creep in in the examination in the heat of anxiety so pay attention record the interest as per the rate which is initially given as per the agreement that mean market rate of interest you are not going to take when you are going to prepare this particular table is it clear to you so you will compute the interest on 16 lakh it will be 5% so 80000 interest also i will receive so total amount how much i have received is equal to 4 lakh this is the inflow for you in the first year that mean from the beginning till the first year total inflow is equal to 4 lakh and so on you will compute the inflows first of all now in the second year you will compute the interest could anyone among you told, tell me how i computed 64000 see here wherever you will get stuck it is always better to move into the rough work you know that out of 16 lakh principal sum out of 16 lakh principal sum you have received a principal payment of 3.20 at the end of the first year you have already received 3.20 isn't it or not now whatever is the remaining balance on this remaining balance you will compute what we call 5% i ho i hope it is clear to everyone kindly check it 16 lakh minus 3.20 whatever figure you will get multiply it with 5% to get 64000 and this way round you will compute the what we call interest so this is how you have computed the amount of interest for each year that mean your first target is to compute the inflows which will flow to you is it clear i hope it is clear till up to this particular point if it is clear then 
at the principal and the interest. So this is nothing but your total inflow. Now you will have to be alert in the sense. Now you will have to discount them. And for discounting, I need not require to tell you, you will always consider the market rate of interest. You will always consider the market rate of interest. Honestly speaking, when you will receive the question in the examination, these present value figures will be given to you in the examination. Is it clear to you? That means first target is to compute number one inflows. Then you are going to compute the present value, as somebody told, of each inflow. So obviously that you can do better than I because you have a subject like that and total inflows will be equal to 14,6272. Directly or indirectly it means today we are imparting with 16 lakh. Imparting with 16 lakh. I am giving 16 lakh worth of loan. But in true sense how much I am receiving. In absolute terms I am receiving this, this much. If I, you are going to add all these things, it will tell you the absolute amount which you are receiving. But this is of no use. Correct? Important point is that in real terms you will be receiving 14,6272. Is it clear to you? So, at this value, initial recognition will always be at Actually, initially we should recognize it at fair value. But how to compute the fair value? That is present value. Is it clear to you? So, financial asset under amortized cost in the initial stage shall be recognized at fair value. Now, what is fair value? That is nothing but the present value. Is it clear to you or not? It is clear. Second point is that if you have computed the fair value, Question will also ask you to pass the entry at the time of initial recognition. Honestly speaking, at your level only, this much will be asked, but I will tell you something else also. Entry at the time of initial recognition. See here, loan, right, financial asset. When you are giving a loan, your financial asset is increasing. But what value you are going to actually put up here? At what value you are going to recognize it initially? This is what exactly you have computed. 14,6272. But how much actually you are paying as loan? 16 lakh. That means you are having a loss. In case if in the examination you get confused. In case if you get confused. For a while we presume that can happen to anyone. At least this difference you can think it is a loss to you. Simply write profit and loss account. Nothing else. You can write at least profit and loss account. But if if you want to give a mature answer, you know actually this is we are giving loan to our employee. Whatever an entity does for its employee, here loan is being given to the employees at a concessional rate because market rate is 10%, we are giving them at 5%. So this concession will be considered as a staff welfare expense. Ultimately, staff wel welfare expense will be debited to PL, no doubt about that. So in bracket, if possible, you can write, then do write staff welfare expense or you can simply write employee benefit expense. So this is how under amortized cost method we have to do the accounting in the initial stage. Although it will be not be asked at your level, I'm quite sure about that. But it's still, if we have taken efforts to do this much, we should take a little bit of more efforts to understand the entire complexities. Next is, at the end of each year, at what value I'm going to reflect the loan amount in my balance sheet? Indirectly at what amount financial asset under amortized cost method I should recognize. In order to know that, what you have to do, see here. Once again, you write here 2015. Now this time, you have to take into account the opening balance. That means when you are computing the amortized cost of the loan, first think on such line. On the opening date, of the year that where when you did the transaction, you have recognized your financial asset at this particular value, at this particular value, correct? That means this is the opening balance. I have also written here opening balance. 14,6272. I have given a loan to somebody and I have recorded this loan now at this value, 14,6272. Is it clear to you? Now I, now I will record my income in the form of interest. But here you have to be very, very alert because he, this is the area where mistake could creep in. Correct? Reason being is that now you will have to compute the interest because NDS stresses upon this particular fact that you compute your income on the basis of fair value. 
So in days states that you have recorded it at fair value and market rate of interest is 10%. So compute your income at the rate of 10%. That is why we have to take the market rate of interest. Are you getting my point or not? So at the end of the year, now interest will become due to me because I have given the loan and interest amount will be as you can see 1,40,000, 1,40,627. So by adding these two, what does it suggest? In the beginning, your asset was this much, but interest payment will be recorded at the end of the year. That means by the end of the year, your financial asset has moved to this value. It will increase by the amount of interest. And at the end of the first year, at the end of the first year, value of your asset will move up from this value to value by this much. That means now total of this is nothing but the total amount of financial asset. But at the end of the first year, you will receive back rupees 4 lakh. So how come 4 lakh? 3 lakh 20 your installment which you have already computed earlier. This is the 4 lakh. Correct? From the party you will receive 4 lakh. So from this total you subtract this 4 lakh. Is it clear to you? From this total, now you subtract this 4 lakh, you will get this figure. Is it clear to you or not? That means at this value, you will have to reflect the loan amount. What does amortized cost is? If somebody asks you, amortized cost is nothing, but it is the cost after adjusting the interest payment and the repayments of the installment. The value which we get is nothing but amortized cost. Why, why this cost is called as amortized cost? Because generally the value will be lower than what you have recorded initially. Because other party has made some payment. That is why it is called as amortized cost. Is it clear to you or not? So in the beginning, your asset was this much and it rose up. It gone up by 1,40,627 at the end of the first year. At the end of the first year, it will get reduced by 4 lakh because you will receive back 4 lakh worth of payment and amortized cost will be this much. If question will ask you the entry, see here, entry for interest payment. When interest will become due, I told you, your financial asset will increase. So you will have to increase the financial asset. And obviously, two interest account you are going to write because interest is an income for you. Then at the end of the first year, you are going to receive the first installment of 4 lakh as I told you. And this interest ultimately will be transferred to profit and loss account as you know. So this is how you will have to do question under amortized cost method. And there is only one more topic you need to do under this. I told you in one session, we will finish it up. Now, next discussion is only with respect to compound financial instrument. Either you are going to get question from amortized cost or you are going to get compound financial instrument. Besides that, you can get MCQs, which I have already talked in the initial stages. Is it clear to you? So we may get a question on compound financial instrument that I will do in the ne not next session, today itself. And I will also take up this question correct question from recent examinations. So I will do one question and I will make you understand thoroughly the intricacies which are related to compound financial instrument. So you will have to give me five minutes as usual. Correct. So when you speak for such a great length of time, you do tend to get tired. And remember one thing, I'm taking your class almost at 9 p.m. And I this is, I think, the fifth session of the day. So you can understand the tiredness which is associated. So try to uh, be a little bit more cooperative. Five minutes, I will not waste your much time. So, welcome back. Now, this is the last topic which you need to stress upon from the examination point of view. I've already marked two topics, correct? And this one is compound financial instrument. You know what is a compound financial instrument? A financial instrument where elements of financial liability, that mean debt elements are there and also equity elements are there. Now, I have written some practical steps also in my regular classes. I discuss them also, but here I'm going to discuss them directly, what we call through this case study, correct? So first have a look over this particular case study. SXM Limited issued 5,006% debentures of face value of 100 each. Correct? How many debentures have been issued by this particular entity? 5,000 debenture. What is the face value of the debenture? 
that is 100 each. What is the worth of the debenture? Sir, 5 lakh. What is the rate of interest of the debenture? That is 6%. Correct? Further, it is given. And company gave an option to the debenture holder to get their debenture holders converted into equity share at the end of the third year in the ratio of 1 is to 1. What is the length of the time for which the debentures have been issued? 3 years. This is the length of the time. Is it clear to you? As I just told a moment ago, correct, in the earlier part of the session, that whenever a company issues debenture, at the time of issue itself, company has to actually very clearly mention out what will be its redemption policy. So here company has stated at the time of issue itself that at the end of the third year, that is the maturity period, debenture holder will have an option, will have an option, will have an option, will have an option to get their debentures converted into equity or they can demand cash or they can demand cash. Remember one thing, any any financial instrument which is convertible at the option of the debenture holder is always considered as compound financial instrument. Why? Because if they wish to get their debentures converted into equity, then entity will be escaped of the obligation to repay the amount in cash. Isn't it? So it will be equity otherwise. However, if they would demand cash, then it will become an obligation. So that is the reason any financial instrument which is uh, which, which uh, wherein the option holder holds the right as far as conversion is concerned, in that particular case, you can safely assume that it is a compound financial instrument. Number one. So this is the scenario in this particular question. But the important point is that entity has told the debenture holder that for one debenture, we will offer you one equity share. That means it is convertible into equity share, but it is the option of the debenture holder. Remember one thing, it is not mandation. It is an option. So you have to look under such questions very carefully what exactly is the redemption policy, whether it is mandatorily convertible, sometime it would be written in the question. That debentures are mandatorily convertible into equity instrument. Under such a situation, that scenario will be a little bit different, which I will explain also, don't worry about. But here the scenario is that debenture holders are having the option. Now, this is yet another important line and many among us actually fail to understand the replication of this particular line because your institute will never elaborate upon all the all the such things. If SXM Limited would not have issued the debenture with conversion option, these debenture have been issued with a conversion option, correct? Then rate of interest on these debenture would have been 10%. What does this line suggest? This line suggests if this entity would have issued the debentures without any conversion option, we in that case we would have had issued the debenture at 10% because market rate of interest is 10%. In the market, debenture which are being issued without any conversion option companies are offering 10% interest to the debenture holder. But because we have attached a conversion option, correct, we have given a little bit of leeway to the debenture holder, perhaps that is the reason we are able to issue the debenture at 6%. So the point is that coupon rate is 6%, but market rate of interest is 10%. Tomorrow when you will go into the interviews, it's then a question you may face sometime, and often it is faced, a company is issuing the debenture at 6%, market rate is 10% in account. What exactly is the term for used for that? Sir, concessional rate. No, 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 no. It is not called concessional rate. It is known as off term, off market terms, off O double F, off market terms. Correct? So these debentures are being issued on off market terms. On off market terms means your rate of interest, your coupon rate of interest is deviating from the market rate of interest. It could be higher, it could be lower, but generally it is lower. Now, generally the question at your level would ask only this much, entry at the time of initial recognition. And what exactly we have to do in the entry? 
because it is a compound financial instrument we have to segregate into what we call financial liability part that means what amount we are going to allocate to the what we call financial liability and what amount we have to allocate to the equity that is the main part correct so first of all what you are going to do first of all as usual take into account the length period of the debentures then take into account because your company has issued the debenture quite obviously interest will have to be paid each year total amount of the debenture is 5 lakh interest is always computed on the face value of the debenture 5 lakh is the face value 5000 into 100 and interest will always be computed at coupon rate of interest correct in the initial stages 30000 30000 each year you are going to pay the interest at the end of the third year problem is this in this particular question and in most of the question which you will face in the examination it will be given that debentures are being issued with an option to the debenture holder whether they want to get it converted or they want to take cash so should i write at the end of the third year five lakh or not because at the end of the five lakh there is a possibility that we may have to pay 5 lakh or there is also a possibility that we might not have to pay 5 lakh. For example, if the debenture holder would opt for what we call conversion option, in that case, we need not require to pay 5 lakh. Whenever option will be given to the debenture holder, you will have to solve the question as if debenture holder will go for conversion, will not go for conversion option. Because ultimately we all are human and our first priority is towards cash. Isn't it or not? Are you getting my point or not? I hope this point is clear to you. Whenever in the question, the venture holder would be given option, you will always presume that they will opt for cash. And that is why in the third year, your total outflow interest 30,000 and principal amount 5 lakh you will write here. However, if in the same question, it would have been written debentures are mandatorily convertible into equity shares. Suppose if in this question it would have been written this way around, in that particular case, your outflows would have been only 30, 30, 30 and at the end of the third year, as I told you, your last year repayment would be 30,000 only and no 5 lakh would have appeared. If the question would have stated mandatorily convertible, is it clear to everyone? If it is clear, everyone say yes. I wait for one minute. If it is clear to you, I also want to know how many are actually present. Remember, those who are attending the classes, they will get supreme amount of benefit because I will open India's classes only for those actually who are watching with watching regularly. We are keeping a track of it now. Correct. So it is important whosoever is watching kindly actually put up your name, write down the message box so that we can get an idea. Anyway, so hope that it is clear to everyone. Thank you so much. Now the first message I got. So if it is clear to everyone, I hope the point which you need to stress upon is mandatorily convertible or option holder. In case of option holder, you will presume as if these, as if the company will pay them cash. But in case of mandatory option, you will have you will not write here the principal amount now once you have written that now next point is that whenever you will have to discount under under entire index not only in financial instrument whenever you need to compute the discounted value or present value always take the market rate of interest this is as simple as that so if the confusion arises in the examination you can take that into that clue into account correct Discounting factor will always be taken on the basis of rate of interest 10% because in the examination when you will be given, you will be given all these discounted figure but they will give you to confuse you both at 6% and at 10%. Correct? So keep this in mind. So at market rate of interest you will compute the discount factor for 3 years. And then ultimately you will compute the what we call value. So your ultimately this value is 4,50,263. Now you tell me actually what exactly these things are for you 30 30 30000 you are paying these are obligations so basically you have computed the present value of obligations isn't it so that mean after having computed the present value now you can safely say that at the time of initial recognition you have received rupees 5 lakh in absolute terms because your company has issued 6% 5,000 debentures of 100 each in absolute terms you have received 5 lakh. But out of that 5 lakh, 
your financial liability portion will be 4,50,263. You will recognize financial liability at this value and remaining will be considered as equity. That means your first task should be to segregate initially the financial instrument into financial liability and equity instrument. This is how you have to do that. You will have to compute the what we call present value of your outflows. Is it clear to you? And if entry question would have asked, you would have write, written the entry like this bank account debit 5 lakh. This is exactly the amount which you are receiving. But how to write the entry? See here, two debenture. You will write two debenture right in bracket financial liability because you are issuing the debenture. Out of total debenture which you have issued, this much is being considered as liability. And then again, you will write two debentures, but this time you will write equity, the balance amount 49,737. Till up to this stage question will ask you in the examination, correct? However, just to make you a little bit understand further, actually before I move into step number four, just have a look over here, move into venture liability, just have a look over here. Because in the on the initial date, I have passed this entry bank account debit to venture account, venture account that is financial liability account to venture equity account. And I'm trying to note down the movement in debenture financial liability. That means I'm trying to note down the what we call movements in financial liability. So at the time of initial entry, we have credited the what we call debentures that is financial liability by this particular amount. That is why I will write here where I will prepare the account. I will write here by bank year one in the beginning. Correct. Why I have written bank? Because we have passed this entry bank account debit to financial liability account. So obviously in the financial liability, I will write by bank. Correct. Now I will re I will come to the end of the year. At the end of the first year, this is the liability for me. I am the entity. Obviously we have recognized this much of liability. Now I will compute the liability. But wherever I am going to compute the interest rate, I have already told you that we have to take it at the initial stage. When we compute interest, we take what we call coupon rate. But for accounting purposes, for present value purpose, that's a different thing. For accounting purposes, in the accounts when we are going to record them at the end of the year, I will always consider the market rate of interest. So on this amount, this much of interest will become due by the end of the first year. Is it clear to you? When interest will become due, what will be your entry? From the perspective of the end, from the perspective of the entity, you let me know when interest is becoming due, is it a loss to you or it is a gain to you? Is it a loss to you or is it a gain to you? If you are the entity, you are the issuer entity, correct? You have a liability of 4,50,263. On that liability, now interest has become due. First of all, your liability will increase and this interest is a loss to you. That is why at the end of the year, interest is a loss to you. You are going to write interest account debit and your liability, that is financial liability, will increase by the interest amount 45,026. Is it clear to you or not? Then at the end of the first year, how much outflow is there? Obviously, at the end of the first year, you are paying only 30,000. So your entry will be debenture financial liability account debit to this amount. Bank account, you have written this. So this is the amount at which you are going to reflect the debentures. Is it clear to you or financial liability, should I say? Is it clear? Right, sir, it is clear. Now, when your second year will start, you will bring down this amount. Again, you are going to make the entry for the interest due, as I have written here. For the second year, this will be the entry for, actually here figure is written, misprinted. This is four lakh, this is 46,529. Uh, suddenly there is a problem. I hope so, internet jagging. Sometime it happens, I can't help it. Correct, balance brought down because I'm taking classes since last almost 10 hours, you can say. That is why this ma machine, which is, the panel on which I'm writing, that is near about 32 inches. It is not just a what we call 16 inch or something like that. It is 32 inches panel where I'm writing and it becomes uh, after almost 10 hours, it becomes lots of heat is there generated and even to put up my hand on it gives me a little bit of jerks. Anyway, this is the interest. Then again, you are going to pay the amount and so on. And finally, your this liability will become finished. 
correct at the end of the third year your liability will become free that mean in the inter alia period that mean in the beginning you will pass what entry you know bank account debit to debenture financial liability to debenture equity then in between at the end of the first year second year and third year you will have to pass two entry interest account debit to debenture financial liability and debenture account debit to bank account so with these amounts now debenture liability is finished that mean your financial liability account is already closed then what about the remaining amount debenture equity account debit what about the because your liability is finished so what about the remaining amount this remaining amount you will be taken to the retained earnings account retained earnings indirectly means oci is it clear to you so debenture equity account debit will be taken because now it is a gain to you the 49737 you are going to take it to your retained earning this is how actually one more question is there but here mandatory option is given mandatory option that is why here i have written 1 lakh 1 lakh only and you will take the discount factor and all this you can manage it through the notes no problem and this what this is the question which came from the recent examination i have picked it up correct this is the question and you can easily do this question after after this particular discussion as you can see this is the same question which which is available here moon limited issued 1 lakh in the earlier question 5000 debentures are there this time 1 lakh debentures of 100 each coupon rate is 8% debentures have been issued on 1st of january 2023 redeemable these debentures are redeemable at 12% premium at the end of 2026 only thing is that when you are going to redeem when you are going to make the final payment 1 lakh into 100 plus 12% of that that will be the principal amount which you are going to repay but interest will always be computed on face value that is 1 lakh into 100 so this time you have given an option that either you are going to pay cash or exchangeable for ordinary shares of moon limited on one is to one basis so you are going to solve this question on similar basis because i have already solved the question so you will not confront any difficulty in understanding this question i have given a thorough solution notes will be available to each one of you by tomorrow to those only who will provide their what we call email addresses on the link boxes which i am going to attach a uh, correct or uh, and so often you must have noticed you are already aware of that or you can simply whatsapp correct at the phone number which is given in the description go to the description phone number is there and simply email your address you must write your email very clearly so tomorrow itself or most probably today itself you are going to actually receive is it clear to you the mail now one point before i finish up somebody actually asked me by way of message somebody asked me by and here there is a test paper also i have attached in the notes kindly do this test also i have forgotten to tell this there is a test paper and you must attempt this particular test also now the another important point is that somebody asked me the treatment of abnormal loss under ndas handed in check See, it is very simple. For example, let us say my opening, my closing balance, my closing balance in profit and loss account is let us say four lakh. Correct? Closing balance is four lakh, and my opening balance in profit and loss account, presume for a while, is equal to one lakh. Because I promised that I will explain it in the class. So, if there is an abnormal loss, first of all, I can add the abnormal loss to the closing balance. or i can add the abnormal loss to the during the year profit for example there is an abnormal loss net abnormal loss of 50000 let us say i add it to closing balance after adding to closing balance now my closing balance will become 4 lakh 50 and my opening balance is 1 lakh that mean during the year i must have earned a profit of 3 lakh 50000 isn't it or not i told you abnormal loss can be added back directly to closing balance or you can directly add it to during the year profit for example suppose if i take directly difference of 1 lakh and 4 lakh during the year profit will be 3 lakh if i will add 50000 abnormal loss again i will get the same figure so step number 1 either you can add it to during the year profit or you can add it to closing balance then you will have the profits which you have earned during the accounting year divide it into pre acquisition profit and post acquisition profit once you have divided the amount now you have to see when abnormal loss has taken place if abnormal loss has taken place in the pre acquisition period then subtract the abnormal loss from here if it has taken correct 
If it has taken from post acquisition profits, then you simply subtract it from post acquisition. This is the only treatment. Is it clear to you? Either it will be subtracted from pre or it will be subtracted from post acquisition depending upon the fact when actually abnormal loss has taken place. If it has taken place in the pre acquisition period, did subtract it from pre acquisition. If it has taken place from the post acquisition, then subtract it. And as you know, pre acquisition profits when we prepare analysis table, if you have taken classes from us, we prepare analysis table, we take what we call this amount over there, similarly this amount over there and nothing else and no further treatment is needed. Is it clear to you? I think some uh, Satya Priya asked this particular question. I hope Satya it is clear to you. And in this particular session, we are going to cover a value added statement to be very honest with you. It's not a very tough chapter. It's pretty simple, but its importance cannot be neglected cannot be neglected were you to actually scan the papers of the last three years almost in every paper we found questions were there and even question of 14 marks could strike from this particular chapter anyway so today we are going to start in the meantime says signal is also on and lovely good evening to all those who have just connected with us so in this particular chapter what we are supposed to do value added statement what exactly the value added statement if you are going to scan your slivers you will find that this particular chapter is given under recent developments recent developments in accounts now with the passage of the time we know that accounting is changing there was a time when every corporate house was only interested in giving information regarding their profitability to the various parties whosoever were having any interest in the what we call concern are you getting my point or not? What I said, there was a time, there was a time when the entities or the organizations or for that instance, any corporate business house is interested only or was interested only in providing information regarding their profitability because they knew that investors take only profitability criteria to invest their hard earned money into the concern. So that means you can say, during earlier phases of time, there was a very narrow what we call mindedness with respect to accounting that in narrow mindedness in the sense that when concerns were interested only with the profitability, their prime motive was only profit motive. Similar is the situation from the investors angle. At least 10, 15 years ago, investor used to actually pick up only that particular companies whose profitability was higher. But of late, because of the changing scenario all over the world, you must have noticed actually, so many conferences nowadays are being held all over the world with respect to save planet, save environment, save the pollution, etc. Correct? So because of these situations, of late, now entities and investors both are realizing one important aspect. That investors basically they have forced the entities to think beyond what we call profitability criteria. I'm trying to just give you a little bit of background story of value added statement in spite of the fact actually it's a, uh, we are doing the revisionary session but as I told you my motive is to give you the maximum possible even, the, even in the shortest possible time. So investors of late actually they are not picking up entities for the investment purpose only by looking at their profitability. That means the viewpoints of the investors and the various other interested groups in the concern of an entity is now changing. They are simply not giving any weightage to the profitability. Besides profitability, they are also taking into account what this entity is doing for the environment, for the society, for the planet, to reduce what we call pollution, correct? To reduce the carbon dioxide. So that is the point which you need to understand. That is why because of all these situations of late what we are actually watching very closely if you would if you would ever take time to actually see the annual statements or the fi financial statements of a particular company especially the big five big companies in India like Bale, Bharat Heavy Electricals Limited, Infosys, Tesco etc. So or the Steel Authority of India or any uh, any um, financial statement of company Tata. You would find actually besides the normal financial statement, profit and loss account, balance sheet, director's report, etc. They are also supplementing their general purpose financial statements with all sorts of statements. For example, companies are telling to the investing group that what our entity has done for the society, what we have done for the what we call planet, what we have done to actually reduce the uh, what we call emission of pollutants, that means what we have done to reduce the pollution and how, how uh, in which sector actually we are helping the government especially in the field of corporate work. So my point is actually of late entities have realized 
that simply by providing information with respect to profitability, they cannot attract the they cannot attract the investing group. Remember one thing: in India at this particular moment, there is neither any standard nor any particular law which makes it mandatory for the companies to actually prepare the value added statement. Entities are preparing value added statements simply because of the force which is exerted by the investing group. You can say so. So even though there is what we call no mandation, there is no compulsion, no boundation, neither from the law, neither from ICI Institute's standard board. So there is no no guidance note at this particular moment. But in spite of that, entities are nowadays, especially the big corporate houses, are supplementing their financial statement with value added statement. And through this particular statement, they are trying to actually tell, correct, besides profit motive, what exactly they are doing for the society, for the planet, for the environment. That is the that is the what we call background story of value added statement. I have been telling you so often, kindly, kindly, for God's sake, pay attention. I do not want your hard efforts and the money which you have also taken from your money to actually uh, do this particular course. That should go waste. So pay attention. Ultimately, think of the fact that you have to appear in the interviews. Your male qualification will not land you up with a, what we call high profile job. You need to be prepared for everything. Questions from value added statement, lots of questions from a th your theoretical chapter would be tossed up in the interview. So that's the reason actually you need to know actually all these things. Anyway, now coming over to the real part of this session. This is just a general part. Now coming over to the value added, added statement. I know you are not having the note, but you need not require to worry. I have already told you those who are interested in having the revisionary note simply actually on the phone number which is flashing on your screen. You simply WhatsApp your request, you will receive the notes. Now, we come over to the point. Correct? Mm -hmm. What is happening? First of all, just pay attention over here. Here, actually, I have given you a profit and loss statement of a particular concern. If you are going to look at this particular statement, what you will find here amount which is written in lakhs, correct? And I have given you a very simple statement. Here I have written sales and sales are 100 lakhs. Then I have written here some expenses like raw material, purchases, rent and rates, insurances, advertising, auditors, expenses, etc. worth rupees 75 lakh, correct? These are normal expenses, no doubt about that. Even wages and salaries, provident fund, staff welfare, bonus, etc., worth rupees five lakh. It is on. It is also an expense. Directors' remuneration or fee. Obviously, it is an expense. You are going to debit it to profit or loss account. Then income tax. And besides that, I have written one more item: interest on long-term loans and dividend. Now, after subtracting all these expenses, quite obviously, I am not going to ask of you actually what exactly is the profit now. Within a flick of second and within a blink of eye, you will be able to let me know that the profit of the entity will come to near about 10 lakhs. Correct. It's a very simple general financial statement, but we are trying to find out what exactly the value added statement. Let me tell you in 45 minutes, this particular revisionary session will be over. Now, in order to know the concept of value added statement, now see here what I am doing. Although I have already prepared and given you the income statement, now once again, I will take the same figure. See here, I will note down sales once again, correct? And out of this various list of expenses, now see here which sort of expenses I am picking up. I will pick up raw material, purchases, rent and rates, insurance, advertising, auditors, expenses, etc. 75 and I will deduct that. After deducting this, I'm not going to deduct again wages and salary. I'm not going to deduct director's remuneration. I'm not going to deduct income tax. Also, I'm not going to deduct interest on long term loans. That been under the concept of value added statement. Whenever you are going to prepare the value added statement, remember one simple thing. Any expense which is related to employees, for example, wages and salaries, provident fund, staff welfare, bonus, these are the expenses which are related to employees. Is it clear to you or not? Similarly, then we have director's remuneration. These expenses obviously are related to the directors of the entity income tax. To whom actually an entity pays income tax? To whom entity pays income tax? Government. Government. Similarly, interest on long-term loan and dividend I have written here combinedly, but you let me know to whom interest is paid. Interest is generally paid to 
डिवेंचर होल्डर्स और फाइनेंशियल इंस्टीट्यूशन फ्रॉम होम वी हैव टेकन लोन एंड जनरली द लोन इज टेकन हेयर फॉर ए लॉन्ग पीरियड ऑफ टाइम इज ए क्लियर टू एंड टू होम वी आर गोइंग टू पे द डिविडेंड डिविडेंड इज पेड टू द ओनर्स क्वाइट ऑब्वियसली कंबाइंडली वी मे से द डिवेंचर होल्डर्स फाइनेंशियल इंस्टीट्यूशन दे आर बेसिकली प्रोवाइडर्स ऑफ फाइनेंस दे आर प्रोवाइडिंग फाइनेंस टू आर कंसर्न so if somebody ask you what exactly is the value added statement and how it is prepared your answer will be very simple under the concept of value added statement we are not going to subtract any expense related to employee any expense which is related to director any expense which is related to government any expense which is related to what we call providers of finance in that is interest or dividend is it clear to you or not we are not going to subtract it i hope i am clear till up to this particular point and in a very simple layman's language i have given you the meaning of value added statement just in order to in order to prepare value added statement what you have to simply do take the sales figure subtract all those expenses but you will not subtract any expense which is related to i told you employees which is related to directors which is related to government which is related to providers of finance and later on we will see which is also related to entity actually profit is definitely kept by the entity is it clear to you or not i hope so it is clear to everyone till up to this particular point why an entity actually prepares a value added statement is there any law at this particular moment or any what we call a standard at this moment in india answer is no that in spite of that why entities are preparing value added statement because investors and various other parties who are contributing in the form of finance or what we call in the form of any other contribution they will contribute only if they will find that your entity besides earning profit is also doing something for the society as a whole so that is the main reason actually now it is why almost all the entities are supplementing their general purpose financial statement with the value added statements is it clear to everyone okay if it is clear to you besides that that mean we will see later on when we prepare value added statement first of all we try to find out value added in order to find out value added i have already told you from the sales figure you are going to simply subtract all expenses barring the expenses which i just mentioned so after subtracting all these expenses we find actually our value added is 25 then what about those expenses which we haven't subtracted but we which we have debited to profit and loss account what will be the treatment now generally in the value added statement we there is a lower part actually this format has been given by icai correct this format of value added statement has been provided by icai but i have been telling you time and again till up to this particular moment there is no standard no note no what we call compulsion from any side from any regulatory body for, upon the entities to produce what we call value added statement after having found out value added now you will try to tell to the various interest group how you are utilizing this value added now you will tell to the entities that out of 25 we are providing to the employees in the form of wages in the form of their contribution in the form of their welfare expenses rupees 5 lakh you must have seen in the profit and loss account we have written wages and expenses 5 lakh is it clear to you similarly then you will write here those expenses which are related to directors actually you can simply put any expense there is no need to make you so many categories you can directly write employees and any expense which is moving over to director you can you can write it over here itself no problem then you will write your government out of your total value added 25 you are paying to the government in the form of actually 2 lakh as tax so when you are providing your financial statement in such a manner actually in that case all those who are scanning your financial statement they will definitely come to know about the contributions which you are making to the what we call society in the form of payment to the employees correct and in the form of what we got payment to the director and to the government because ultimately whatever government is going to receive from you that will, that will be invested in the welfare of the society isn't it or not and then towards providers of capital towards providers of capital i have already told you providers of capital or providers of finance under it you are going to write interest on borrowing and dividend i hope you got a fair bit of idea now regarding value added statement it is very simple to prepare 
you need to take into account only such expenses which are related to employees which are related to directors which are related to government which are related to providers of finance and of course later on we will see which are related to entity you are not going to touch such items simply subtract all such expenses barring these subtract all those expenses from the sales figure to get the what we call value added and all those expenses which you haven't utilized here you will have to put up a separate statement and under the category value added applied you will tell to the world that how this value added which you have generated has been applied you will tell to the world that some portion has been applied in the form of payment to employees and similarly to the directors and to government and to the providers of the funds and some portion has been kept by the entity and generally entity keeps some portion of the fund simply to actually reinvest it into the business or for expansion program etc is it clear to you or not i hope till up to this particular moment i am clear although i am going a little bit fast i know let me know from you first of all so that so that i can get an idea actually are you able to actually hear are you able to actually grasp or not and are you finding the class and a which of which i has written best faculty for cf are so nice to hear of you and it would be better if you can spread such word among your what we call all the groups among your friends and that will help me a lot also and no doubt about that that it will help the student fraternity that's exactly my intention is by the grace of god i have been given lots of thing and i just want to actually repay uh, in the form of some contribution to the student is it clear till up to this particular moment i'm not virat goswami it's okay i'm not talking about uh, i'm talking about the concept is it clear to everyone this particular chapter concept is clear upendra rajwar gave the first answer okay this thing is clear is fine now as i told you what exactly the value added statement is i just told you under the concept of value added statement we are going to arrive over the value added or profit without subtracting expenses related to employees directors government providers for finance and amount which is kept by an entity with itself correct now important point is that it means when you are going to see because ultimately you will be given a what we call a statement pnl statement out of that you should be in a position to know which are the expenses which you are not going to subtract that is important and i am giving you a bit of idea here see this is how you are going to prepare the value added statement i just told you in case in the question there is any sales or turnover just remember one thing whenever you are going to write here sales or turnover always write the net amounts of sales net amount of sales means sales less returns if there is there are any bad debts you can also su directly subtract it that means generally when we write under the value added statement as the first item sales or turnover we write sales net of any provision for doubtful debts net of bad debts and net of any sales return this is the only point which you need to return need to actually retain is it clear to you obviously there is if there is any increase in the inventory you are going to add it if there is any decrease in the inventory you are going to subtract it this is another point and generally we, <coughs> guidance note i have already told you a guidance note in this particular format has been issued by icai in the guidance note icai has written actually cost of bought in material and services cost of bought in material and services that mean whatever cost which your entity has incurred in what we call uh, buying the material and in providing the services but i have already told you it is just a heading all you have to remember that you are going to subtract all the expenses except all those one which i just talked about earlier correct so generally raw material purchase printing and stationery auditors remuneration rent and taxes other expense insurance telephone all expenses you are going to try, going to actually write over here then you will get what we call total value added total value added is it clear to you once you have found out the value added then you are going to write here under the lower portion how you have applied this value added i have already told you you have applied this particular way, particular value added in the form of payment to employees now you need to understand which are the items generally which you are going to put under this particular category any expense related to employees like wages and salary like employers state insurance like provident fund even what we call if there would be any bonus you will write over there 
if there would be any staff welfare expenses staff welfare expenses sw is staff welfare expenses so you are going to put it under this particular category regarding government you need not require to exercise much actually you can easily find that income tax is related to government similarly interest on long term borrowings if in the question ever interest on short term borrowings will be given then what will be the treatment you are not going to put it over here in that particular case interest on short term borrowings will be considered as a normal business expense generally it is considered as normal operating expense just pay attention over this particular point is it clear to you generally when we write here we always write here interest on long term borrowings similarly dividend and then there is another important point under the category of entity when we say entity it means amount kept by entity with itself and why an entity keeps the amount with itself that means some portion of the profit entity is going to keep with itself but why the purpose of the entity to keep the profit is to further reinvest it into the business or to do any expansion programs see here problem is that what sort of expenses or item which you are going to write it under this particular category it is very important to understand obviously retain profit is one and there is no problem in understanding it because profit is retained by the entity for a particular purpose but there are some items which could confuse you for example if i will tell you in the profit and loss account there is depreciation where you are going to write it now you let me know where you are going to write it if suppose in the profit and loss account i have given you there is depreciation will you subtract it for computing value added or will you reflect this item as an application of value added and if you are using this item as an application of value added where you are going to put this particular item Simil some items could confuse you for example suppose i have written here loss on sale of asset loss on sale of asset where you are going to put it again similarly suppose if here i have written patents written off trademarks written off goodwill written off these item could actually confuse you correct and to many such items can confuse because they are not aware of the concept of these items problem is this actually i'm taking a bit of time but i told you today's session will not be more than 40 minutes in total correct but i just want you to understand things in a proper uh, spectrum just pay attention here you tell me suppose if i am going to pay rent or salary what will be my entry please keep on delivering me the answer my entry will be salary account or rent account debit salary account or rent account whatever expenses there or telephone expenses to cash account this is the first entry i am going to write isn't it or not after passing this particular entry generally there is another entry which we are less acclimatized to pass actually generally an entity when it pays any expense or incurs any expense first of all and if the expense has been incurred by way of cash over this particular entry will find and then we will follow it up with another entry profit and loss account debit to salary or rent account are you getting my point or not in more technical words we call it cash expenditure we call it cash expenditure in your earlier phases of education you have studied cash flow statement but no one at the time would have told you that way actually what we mean by cash expenditure see here try to understand the implication of the cash expenditure obviously when i have paid any expense i am going to debit it to profit and loss account when i am debiting a cash expenditure because it's a cash expenditure why it is a cash expenditure because we first pass this entry and then we pass this particular entry an expenditure is con considered as cash expenditure when you are going to put it towards the debit side of profit and loss account and simultaneously and simultaneously it reduces the cash that means your cash will also get reduced on account of this particular expenditure this is the point which you need to understand if somebody ask you what is the cash expenditure it means it reduce in one sentence you should be in a position to deliver the answer a cash expenditure is one which in real sense reduces reduces the profit of the concern because all such items which we write towards the debit side of profit and loss account in reality all those item 
never reduce the profit in real terms. Only cash expenditure would reduce the profit in real terms. First of all, you need to understand what I am saying. When I am saying that from the opposite side, cash is also getting reduced. That means this is a cash expenditure and it is really reducing our profit. Correct? Number one. Now suppose, suppose my entity decides to transfer some part to general reserve. What, is, what will be the entry you are going to pass? If you are going to transfer some amount to general reserve, you will sim write simple entry profit and loss account debit to general reserve. Similarly, if you are going to make any depre depreciation provision, what will be your entry profit and loss account debit to provision for depreciation? Similarly, if you are going to write off any intangible assets, let us say patent, copyright, trademarks, etc. Then what will be your entry? Your entry will be profit and loss account debit to debt item which you are writing off. You must have noticed in all these cases you are passing only one entry. When your entity is writing off any intangible asset, number one, when your entity is transferring some amount to the general reserve and when you are creating some provision in, in all these cases, cash element is not coming into play. Are you getting my point or not? Are you getting my point? In all these cases, there is no cash element, but the factuality is that later on when I'm going to prepare profit and loss account, I'm going to write all such items whether they are cash expenditure or non-cash expenditure because actually these items where only one single entry is passed where no, no cash element comes into play such items are known as non-cash expenditure. So we are going to put up here non-cash expenditure and cash expenditure both. So quite obviously cash expenditure and non-cash expenditure ultimately will reduce the amount of the profit but the fact is that non-cash expenditure which we are putting up on the debit side of profit and loss account actually are not in reality reducing the amount of the profit. This is the point which you need to understand. I hope you got actually the point which I am trying to insert into your mind. Are you getting why these, why these expenses non-cash ex expenditure will not reduce my profit in real terms? Because from the opposite side cash is not getting reduced. You will understand it better actually. First of all, you understand the meaning of profit in accounts. In your class 11th, your madam used to tell beta, the first thing in accounts you need to learn is this. Asset is always equal to liability plus capital. Then your madam used to start with this way. Suppose owner has started a business with 10 lakh worth of capital, how it would be written. Then you would be made to understand it will be written this way around. Isn't it or not? Now, Taking a cue from your madam, from your first accounting class, now I stretch it to this level. Suppose I say, this business house has received a rent of rupees 1 lakh. Received a rent of rupees 1 lakh, where I should put it in the accounting equation. What you are receiving, rent. That means your entry is cash account debit to rent account. Obviously your asset is increasing, you are going to add to your asset. This is one part of the game. Where else 1 lakh will be written now? You let me know of that. Where else, what will be the impact on the other side? What will be the impact of rent received? I have already told you, you because when we are receiving the rent, I am going to add it to what we call asset side, obviously. But what will be the impact on the other side? Where I should write here? And why I should write here? I have to teach accounting equation to make you understand the things thoroughly. I know it is consuming, consuming a wee bit of time. But this is where we are deviating from other revisionary classes. Yes, let me know what will be the impact. Why so much of delay is being created, I do not know. I have received some answers from those who are connected with us through SAS system. But uh, I am not getting the answer. Now the first answer comes from capital. Satya Rai say profit and loss account. Actually, both you are correct. Somebody told it, it, will, it will be added to profit and loss account or, and it will be added to P capital. Actually, that is correct. We are going to add here. Could anyone to let me know why it will be added to capital? Why it will be added to capital? Because you have given the correct answer. Both the answers are correct. Capital or profit and loss account. You are right. Ultimately, profit and loss account will go to the owner. No doubt about that. 
Now somebody came up with Remy Reddy told me it's an income. But actually what I want to know from you is because that is the reason. I'm not casting any aspiration. Aspirations means doubt. I'm not casting any aspirations over your ability. Problem is that we have been taught that way around and that is what exactly we have carried us with that particular knowledge still up to this particular movement. And that is why sometimes we found uh, we find ourselves in such doldrums. You must understand in simple word, any increase in cash, you are receiving cash and something physical is moving out. There is no physical thing which is moving out. If you are receiving cash and no physical thing is moving, I am not telling any benefit. If you are receiving cash and no physical thing is moving out, always consider it as a profit. Because you are receiving the cash, an increase in cash means increase in profit. An increase in profit will be credited to capital account. Why actually I brought this into play during my this discussion, the point is this why I took this particular case to make you understand. Now you will understand. First of all, when I'm time and again, I'm telling cash is reducing or cash is not reducing. Now you should be in a position to understand. When I am saying that any expenditure which carries cash element, obviously that expense will be written towards the debit side or profit and loss account. But in reality, it will, in reality, the profit will decrease only when from the opposite side, cash will also decrease. This is the point actually I just want to make you understand. Now the point here is that under profit and loss account, you must have noticed actually we write every type of expenditure, cash expenditure and non-cash expenditure. But you must now, at least after having entered into this particular level, must understand that non-cash expenditure which you put on the debit side of the profit and loss account actually are not reducing the profit. Then what does it mean? It means this part of the profit is being kept by the entity with itself. This is the point I wanted you to learn. Is it clear to you or not? Because we are not paying off this part of profit to anyone. There is no cash. So that means this part of profit, whether it is in the form of depreciation, whether it is in the form of amount uh, written off, that means this portion of the profit directly or indirectly is kept by the entity with itself. And that is the reason why, if suppose in the question you come across any non-cash expenditure under value added statement, that will be taken to the entity. That means this is that portion of the profit which is kept by the entity. It is not paid to anyone else. This is the point I wanted you to understand. I hope so. I, I have been successful in this regard. Correct? So this is the only area of concern. Otherwise, rest of the things are absolutely simple in this particular chapter. Now I will make you understand how easy this particular chapter is because now concepts are absolutely clear you can without without my help also do this chapter now once the concept is clear we pick up the first question to make you understand better this is profit and loss account of a particular concern is given to you and correct here figures are in thousand just pay attention and don't worry even though you are not having the notes i will say to you that you understand everything comprehensively here i have written sales net of sales return and discounts correct it is given in the question itself whatever sales figure is there it is net of sales return and discount this is this much in this question other income is also given as you know what is other income any income received by business house without not set any income which a business house receives without selling what we call its product or, pro or providing services is known as other income for example dividend received rent received etc so total income is this much and some expenses are given here operating expenses the interest on bank overdraft now interest on bank overdraft instead of bank over overdraft they could have written interest on working capital or they could have written temporary interest Correct. So interest on bank overdraft or temporary interest or interest on working capital will always be taken as interest on short term loans, interest on short term loans. So you will not commit a mistake of taking any interest on short term loans to the what we call providers of finance category. It will be treated as normal operating business expense. This is the point which you need to understand. Then you are being given here interest on 9% debenture. Obviously, 9% debenture holders. You will take this item to the providers of finance. Duties and taxes. Obviously, if there are some duties and taxes, you are going to actually separate. Correct? So, and then we are given profits before depreciation. No problem. Now, see here. Here it is written depreciation. 
And just a moment, I told you, now you should be in a position to understand that when I will tell you that this will be taken to the entity, so you must understand why it is why it will be taken to the entities. It means depreciation. It, that means this much of profit has been kept by entity to meet the replacement purpose of the asset. So it will be kept by entity. Then we are being given provision for tax. Obviously, this item will be taken to the government. No doubt about that. Correct? And then profit after tax is given. Then proposed dividend is given. Proposed dividend. It is also a non-cash item. If it is a non-cash item, it means this part of profit has been kept by entity, of course, for the purpose of delivering dividend to the what we call shareholders. That's a different point. So far, so far, this particular point is given in this particular question. Correct? Now, the point here is that this proposed dividend, we will see later on, the treatment will be slightly different. But I will talk about it later on. Let me go through the question. Operating cost, 82,50,000. Now, operating cost includes 82,50,000 as wages, salary and other benefits of the employee. What does it mean? See here, you have been given operating expenses equal to 21250. Actually, all these figures are in 1000. Is it clear to you? Now, below it is written operating cost include some amount that is 8250. If I will restrict it to 1000, it will become 8250. And this amount is actually related to wages, salary and other benefits of the employee. That means this amount is related to employees. So that means out of total operating expenses, I will have to subtract 8250, correct? And only this much I will have to reflect it in the upper part. That means I need to only subtract this, I, this much of expense to compute the amount of goodwill. Com sorry, compute the amount of value added. So this is the only point and ultimately this figure will be taken to employees later on under the application part. Now we can easily prepare this particular statement. First of all, we will take into account sales, correct? In this question, there is no changes in inventory given. So total will be equal to 24,400, correct? Now, although if, if you can retain it, it is always better to write cost of bought in material and services. Here you are going to write off such expenses which we normally subtract. As I told you, operational expenses were given, but first I will have to subtract that portion of the expense which is related to employees. So I have subtracted this portion and only this much of expense I have written. In this question, there are duties and taxes. Duties and, subs, duties and taxes, there is an alternative treatment also. You can subtract it also or you can subtract it directly from sales also. Correct? Then interest on bank overdraft, I told you, it will be considered as an operational expenses. So total operational expenses will be equal to this much. By subtracting this, you will get value added from operations. Value added from operation. If ever, if ever in the question, there is given other income. If ever in the question there is given other income, I've already told you what we mean by other income, correct? You used to prepare your statement of PNL, you used to write revenue from operation and other income. Do you remember? Other income means any income which you have earned, not what we could not through sale of your products or provision of services. So this is your other income. By adding it, you will get total gross value added. This is exactly what we are interested in. After having computed the gross value added, now all I have to do is to show the application. That means this value added must have been applied towards employees, as you know, towards directors, towards providers of finance, towards government, and some portion will be kept by the entity. We have already seen that out of some expenses, total operating expenses, expenses worth rupees 8250 are accruing or flowing towards the employees. You can also write the name of the expense, salary, wages and benefits. Actually, in the other column, I have written percentage. At your level, it is not given. You need not require to compute the amount of percentage. You can simply show the figure. That's all. In this question, your second category is director's remuneration. But in this particular question, there is no director fee, no director's remuneration, no director's charges. Then you will write here government. As we know, whatever income tax is given in the question, we are going to write it over here, 320. Then, providers of finance. Now, whatever interest on long-term loan, remember in this question, interest on debenture is given, isn't it or not? No, no, actually, when whenever we use the word, what we call duties, 
that mean these are these are sort of expenses which are reducing our turnover so that is the reason either we can subtract it from sales or we can show it separately but when we say government when we say government that mean the direct taxes which we are paying to the government that is the point which you need to understand providers of finance providers of finance interest on long term loans here debenture is given 1200 i was talking about proposed dividend only one point is important when we are talking about actually proposed dividend no doubt about that it's a non cash non cash expenditure correct but whatever amount has been proposed that is generally paid to the shareholders immediately in the form of dividend that is why rather than showing the proposed dividend under the category of retained earnings we reflect it as a payment to the what we call uh, owners that is providers of the finance so it is always better to take proposed dividend as dividend paid over here is it clear to you so this is how you are going to write then you will write another entity and when we say entity it means entity is keeping some portion with itself for the purpose of replacement of an asset or for the purpose of expansion etc generally in case of entities some such items will fall although in this question it is not given loss on sale of fixed asset all non cash non cash expenditure barring proposed dividend because proposed dividend we presume that entity will pay preliminary expense return off depreciation return off in this question there is depreciation any transfer to reserve etc and finally the net profit which is given in the question will be written over there retained profit 500 this will be written over here so this is how now by adding all these items which are accruing to the different parties that must must strike a balance with what we call your gross value added which you have arrived at in the upper section of the part is it clear to you now i'll pick up one question which is struck in the examination in your december 23 new syllabus so this was the question you must have noticed correct and this question i think came for 12 marks or something like that or even i do not know i think it was for 14 or something it carried very high figure of marks in the examination from the following information provided by sun limited prepare a value added statement or uh from the financial statement for the year 2022 23 now you let me know and i will keep on asking the question so that i will figure out how well you have understood the concept i am not going to ask where you are going to write sales obviously you know we are preparing value added statement under two sections first part we compute gross value added under the second part we show the application so sales obviously in the upper part you will write now you let me know where you are going to write plant and machinery next item is plant and machinery you will ignore it because while preparing value added statement we are not concerned with assets and liability depreciation on plant is given where you are going to write it depreciation on plant just a moment ago i told you depreciation on plant that mean this is the amount kept by entity dividend on shares it will be considered as value added portion accruing to owners correct providers of finance we are not concerned with debtors we are not concerned with what we call creditors is it clear to you now in this particular question you are being given opening stock of raw material and closing stock of raw material what you do simply take the difference first right closing yeah vijay kumar you are absolutely right i think you gave the answer for plant and machinery you are absolutely right now as far as opening stock closing stock is concerned always from the closing stock subtract the opening stock always from closing stock subtract the opening stock correct from closing subtract the opening if figure is positive you add if figure is negative you subtract from to sales so it will be changes in inventories then raw material purchase this is an expense which you are going to subtract cash at bank you are not concerned with that because it was such a long question many many student ignored it at that time didn't attempt only those student who had subscribed to our course i think were able to actually attempt this question printing and stationery it's an expense you are going to subtract it as i told you raw material you are going to subtract auditors remuneration you are going to subtract retain earnings at the beginning of the year sometime it may be given in the question you will have to ignore it because this opening balance of retained earnings shows the amount of earning which the entity must have kept with itself last year correct we are not concerned with the what we call opening balance of retained earning this is the point which you need to understand then retained earnings for the year we will take into account obviously this amount will be kept by entity it is not an expense actually 
this is the amount which will be kept by entity no doubt about that then we are being given here rent and taxes so rent and taxes 170 and other expenses also you are going to subtract ordinary share capital issued we are not concerned with the amount of share capital interest on borrowings is written if question does not state whether uh, interest is long term or short term always presume interest is long term and you you will carry it to what we call providers of finance is it clear to you income tax for the year needless to add where it will come to the government wages in see these are the items very vital actually wages in salary employee state insurance provident fund these items are related to employees regarding employees you need to be a little bit careful so how easy it is to do correct even though such a long question i think it is stuck in the examination for 14 marks and this is how i have prepared i need not require to now actually elaborate it but just for your sake first i have written here sales then i have taken increase in stock whenever i am going to compute increase or decrease in stock i will subtract from closing balance first i will write closing balance then i will subtract opening balance if figure is positive i will write here then total amount is equal to this much then you will subtract all expenses raw material printing and stationery rent and taxes other expenses auditors remuneration then you will get what we call this is total of these expenses so 1350 will be your gross value added and then ultimately you have to show that distribution or application of value added so your value added towards employee will be equal to 400 that is all those expenses which are related to employees that is wages and salary employee and insurance pf contribution in this particular question but there could be many more for example canteen expense for example staff welfare expense for example bonus correct take care of employees expenses only this is this is the only gray area where you need to be a little bit more stronger then income tax of course to government providers of finance interest on borrowings and dividend and ultimately depreciation and current years retained profit will be will fall under the category of entity so this is the question and this is the question of mtp june 24 and mtp december 24 actually in both the entities same question has been uploaded and this is similar to the one which i just did just did you can easily do this question of your own once you have done this chapter only till up to this particular point, you can rest assured you will be able to do any question in the examination if it would strike from what we call value added. Besides that, I have given a test. Correct. So this was the only part I told you today's will be a little bit shorter session. Uh, but these chapters are very important. You must have noticed. I do not know how many among you have subscribed to our courses. If some of you might not have subscribed to our courses and you might have taken classes from others, you must have realized folly of neglecting what we call such chapters. Howsoever minute or for surficially irrelevant chapter, but you must actually read every chapter, must study actually every chapter with equal intensity. To take up a very fine chapter that is economic value added. Along with that, we are also going to talk about market value added. Uh, from the examination point of view, uh, generally we have seen that under MCQ, one or two questions are striking and besides that, actually even under the long long format questions, we are getting questions from this particular uh, chapter. So it is important for you and uh, moreover, I've already told you, whenever you are going to pursue a professional degree, you cannot be what we call selective. You have to do intensive, high quality, what we call preparation to come out with flying colors. And for that, we are trying to actually contribute to your learning process. So on that particular account, as I said, we are going to now actually start this particular chapter, economic value added. I have already told you now this accounting scenario is changing in the last session we talked about value added statement that when entities all over the world nowadays besides preparing their general purpose financial statement they are supplementing those general purpose financial statements with several other statement and one among them is was actually value added and today we are going to talk about economic value added. What exactly economic value added is? Suppose today you are going to start a particular business. And let us say you have invested 100 crores worth of what we call amount in this particular business. Quite obviously, your business will be considered profitable when your return, let us say your, your return is 
and cost of raising this capital is near about let us say 12 percent so then it would be said that you are in a profitability position it is as simple as that whenever we are going to make investment into the business we expect some return out of it but at the same time we know that whatever amount which we have invested a cost is involved in it and you have studied about that in your what we call financial management or sfm paper as you know sources of finance carry along with them what we call some cost so cost of raising this amount let us say is 12 percent and if your return is more than 12 percent quite obviously it means it means you have created the value that mean in simple words this three percent will be termed as economic value added that mean in order to find out economic value added all we simply have to do is to compare the return with the cost of the capital correct and you know better than i actually how to compute the cost of capital is it clear to you so this is yet another way and one in one of the examination a question was asked actually who was the propounder of this particular concept propounder means who first time started this so your answer should be stern steward and company this this is a usa incorporation correct so economic value added is developed by stern steward and company what exactly is this this is yet another way of measuring the value created by the corporate enterprises now quite obviously we have to learn as far as accounting is concerned how we how, how we need uh, we shall be able to actually compute the economic value added of a concern so it is simple very simple actually these are the practical steps for solving the question under the first step first of all you have to simply take into account what are the sources of the entity sources of finance of the entity for example you have to look into the question whether entity has raised what we call finance through equity share capital preference share capital debentures etc these are the most possible what we call sources of finance company might have taken some long-term debts also debenture is also a long-term debts also sometime instead of debenture you will be given debts debts encompasses both debentures and long-term loans is it clear to you so your first step is to simply note down actually all the possible sources of finance which are available in the question once you are able to find that out and once you are very sure that which are the sources of finance presuming that these are the three sources correct now what we have to do we, we shall have to find out the specific cost as you know whenever an entity raises any what we call finance through various instruments equity instruments or debt instrument company or the entity has to incur some cost isn't it or not and you know better than i actually now as far as then your next step will be to compute the specific cost a specific cost means cost of particular source of finance that is what we mean by actually specific cost even though you are very well aware of this how to compute the specific cost you have studied that in your what we call earlier phases of education and also in your sfm you must be actually computing that so cost of equity as you know cost of equity can be actually found out either through applying this particular formula ke is dividend divided by market value if in the question only we are given what we call dividend and market value then obviously we are going to apply this particular formula sometime in the question it would be given dividend at the end of the year and you will be given growth rate so in that particular case in order to determine the cost of equity you will have to apply this formula d1 divided by market value and g stands for growth rate <coughs> is it clear to that mean depending upon the information we shall have to apply the formula to compute the cost of equity and sometime the question will not give you dividend now if the question will not give you dividend quite obviously that means either of these two formulae you cannot actually use to compute what we call k so under such circumstances you will have to find use this particular method in this method we will take the risk free return plus beta rate and then we will write in bracket long run market rate and from long run market rate i will subtract the risk free rate that mean in order to solve this first of all i will have to actually subtract the risk free rate from the long run market rate in fact in the question if market rate is given always presume it is a long run market rate by subtracting the risk free rate from the long run market rate you will simply get as we call it equity market risk premium it is also known as what we call equity market risk premium correct actually the difference between the long run market rate and risk free rate is also known as equity market risk premium 
is it clear to you anyway whatever difference is there you first multiply it with beta factor then add it to risk free rate to get what we call your cost of equity so either of these what we call three methodologies you will have to adopt one to determine the specific cost of the equity this should be your what we call under step number one is sub step a then then you will obviously have to find out the cost of the debts as far as cost of debts is concerned it is very easy to find it out correct first of all take into account the interest or total interest on the long term debts then multiply it with 1 minus tax rate suppose tax rate is 70% then 1 minus 70% that will be equal to 30% is it clear to you so interest or long term debts multiply it with 1 minus tax rate divided by total long term debts and obviously you will have to find the specific cost in percentage you will simply multiply it with 100 to get your cost of debts you can also find cost of debt simply by writing interest less tax divided by value of debts in fact both these things are same but you can also apply this rate for example suppose if it is given in the question rate of interest is 10 percent if it is given in the question the rate of interest is 10 10 percent on debts and tax rate is given let us say as 30 percent i can directly compute the cost of debt also in order to compute directly i will take the percentage of the interest that is 10 percent i will simply multiply it one minus tax rate tax rate is actually 30 percent tax rate is 30 percent that means 0 0.30 so i can directly get seven percent as cost of debt this is yet another way so here i have written interest percentage my multiply it with one minus tax is it clear to you so either of these two you can use any method to find out the cost of debt so once you have determined the cost of the equity and cost of the debt obviously if in the question there is source of finance in the form of what we call preference share capital then obviously you will have to find out the cost of preference share capital also actually cost of preference share capital you need not require to do anything for example it is given in the question that preference share capital is 10 percent because as you know preference share capital carry a fixed rate of dividend coupon rate of dividend will always be given in the question that coupon rate itself will become the what we call cost of equity although if mathematically you want to compute the, you will have to take into account total preference dividend divided by total preference share capital then you can multiply it with 100 to get what we call uh, preference share capital or simply you can take the percentage of dividend as the cost of preference share capital so no problem as far as preference share capital is concerned now coming over to the next step <laughs> once you have determined first of all you have noted down the various sources of finance now you have computed what we call cost of each element of source of finance now your next step will be to find out the weighted average cost of capital in order to determine the weighted average cost of capital whatever finance source of finance are there first of all note them uh, note them into account for example equity share capital now sometime in the question you may be given retained earnings or reserve if reserves and surplus or retained earning is given combine it with equity because they are part of equity we know that equity comprises of equity share capital plus what we call reserve and surplus so it is always better to combine them correct and write their amount similarly if there is preference share capital write the total amount of the preference share capital and likewise the ventures now whatever is specific cost which you have just computed write that particular cost over here and then multiply the total amount of the source of finance with the respective what we call a specific cost correct once you have determined the specific cost in absolute terms then total them up this total will tell you total cost of capital once you have determined the total cost of capital sum of a specific cost this is your sum of a specific cost in absolute terms this is some this is specific cost in percentage is it clear to you so sum of a specific cost divided by total capital employed what is the total capital employed the total of your sources of finance is it clear and simply multiply it with 100 to get your weighted average cost of capital so once you have determined the weighted average cost of capital your final step will be to determine economic value added here although it is not very complicated one but still you will have to exercise a bit of caution in the sense first of all ebit ebit as you know better than i actually stands for earnings before interest and tax so first of all write earnings before interest and tax is it clear to you from there on you will obviously have to subtract the interest because these are the earnings before interest and tax so first of all you will have to subtract interest then you will be left off with now 
earning before tax. That means now you have subtracted interest also. So now your earnings are before tax. Obviously now you will have to subtract the tax also. After subtracting, subtracting the tax, now you will get EAT, earning after tax, better known as profit after tax PAT. Now this is your profit after tax, no doubt about that. But you must have noted, in arriving over this particular profit, in arriving over this particular profit, you have subtracted interest also. As we know when we prepare a statement of profit and loss account. You might have not noticed, but you must notice henceforth. So many times in your earlier phases of education, you have prepared statement of profit and loss account. In the statement of profit and loss account, the last item, correct, there is an order actually. As a rule, depreciation, interest, first of all, besides what we call all operating expenses, correct, we need to subtract depreciation, interest, and then only we will subtract tax. And generally, as we, as you know, after preparing the statement of PL, we get net profit after tax. This is the order of last three, last three items. Is it clear to you? Now, if I am telling that we have already arrived over this particular figure, net profit after tax, it means we have subtracted uh, what we call all the expenses, relate operational expenses and interest also and tax and tax also because now we have arrived over net profit after tax that is profit after tax once you have determined the profit after tax actually problem is that here we are more concerned with operating profit as we know interest is not considered as what we call your operational expense but problem is that you have already subtracted it so in order to arrive over the operating profit, not only we are interested in finding out operating profit, but we are finding out operating profit after tax. We are interested in finding out operating profit after tax. So quite obviously, after arriving over this particular, that is profit after tax, I will have to add interest again. I will have to add interest again. Now, the point here is that if I am going to add interest in interest at a gross amount, because here we are going to write the in total interest that is at gross figure. If I am going to add it back at gross figure, then again, the things will not be very clear in the sense because you know that in arriving over this particular figure, you have already subtracted some portion related to interest also, because we, you know better than I actually, when we write interest on the debit side of statement of PNL, correct? Our tax liability get reduced. Quite obviously, because interest is a deductible item. Isn't it or not? So that is the reason actually, once you have arrived over profit after tax, you will have to now add back interest, but net of tax, net of tax. You are going to add back interest, but net of tax. That means you will take the total interest, subtract the tax related to interest and net amount again you are going to add. If you are adding it back again, it means now what is happening? Now what is happening? What figure you are getting? You are getting net profit before interest because you have added back interest, but after tax because you have added the net amount of interest. So still this is a profit after tax, but now it has become net profit before interest, but after tax. Correct? And it is better known as NOPET. NOPET means net operating profit after tax. We call it net operating profit after tax, but actually it is net operating profit before interest, but after tax. Is it clear to you? So in order to get our operating profit after tax, we have to take care of this particular item of adding back interest net of tax. This is the only area where you need to be a little bit more cautious. Is it clear? So once you have determined this particular amount, obviously the, then you will have to subtract your cost of capital, which you have already computed earlier. And after subtracting the cost of capital, the difference between these two, if positive, then we may say entity has created wealth that is economic value added. Is it clear to you? So basically, in order to find out economic value added, what you need to do, you have to take the difference between the NOPET. NOPET stands for net operating profit after tax, although it means net operating net operating profit after tax, but actually it is net operating profit before interest and after tax. But in the examination, you will always write net profit, uh, net operating profit after tax. Is it clear to you? So these are the simple steps which you need to actually take care of. Let's begin with some... Uh, what we call basic question before we move into the higher groove, correct? Now here in this particular question, you 
it is given following information is given to you by SQM Limited. Now there is an entity by the name of SQM Limited and the information which is given to you is it's earning 350,000 earning before interest in tax EBIT is given and most of the times you will always be given EBIT. Now what exactly is the capital structure? That exactly is the point which I was stressing upon when whenever you are going to go through the question you need to actually take care of what we call all the sources of finance very clear very minutely. For example in this cap in this case there is equity share capital to, to the extent of 4,25,000 besides that we have reserve and surplus to the extent of 3,25,000 isn't it or not? And then <clears throat> 10% debentures are also there. That means in this question, as far as sources of finance are concerned, we are having equity share capital. Reserve and surplus are also given. We will combine both these items to get the amount of equity. And besides that, there is only one more source of finance that is in the form of 10% debentures. Now, in this question, as I have written here, dividend at the end of the year and dividend at the end of the year is generally denoted by D1, correct? And it is given to you as 35 per share. Besides that, market value of share is also given 1,400. So I need not require to tell you actually which formula for computing cost of equity you need to apply. Further in this question, growth rate and here growth rate stands for growth rate of dividend. Actually, it will be always written in the examination growth rate, dividend, dividend growth rate. Correct. And further, tax rate is given. That means as a first step, you have noted down it. What are your sources of finance? Obviously, now you will have to compute the respective cost. Now, computation of cost of debenture is not a very tough task. As I told you, as far as cost of debenture is concerned, I can use the direct method. For example, I know that percentage of interest of debenture is 10%. I will take that. I will multiply it with one minus tax rate. Now, tax rate is 30%. So, 10%, one minus 0.30. Correct 1 minus 0 0.30. That means 10% into 0 0.70. So ultimately it will be equal to 7%. So I can directly straightway compute the cost of debt. No problem involved in it. Now I need to actually find out the cost of equity. In order to find out the cost of equity, because dividend at the end of the year is given, and besides that growth rate is given, obviously I am going to apply this particular formula. That is D1, dividend at the end of the year divided by market value plus growth rate. As you know, dividend at the end of the year given is 35 divided by what we call 1400 and then add the growth rate. Now growth rate is 15%. You better write it in this manner 0.15. 15 percent 15 divided by 100. Now sometime I have seen a student commit folly actually in doing the computation of this. First of all always divide 35 by the denominator whatever figure you get then add 0 0.15 to it you will get ultimately this figure and in order to convert it into percentage multiply it with 100 you will get 17.5 percent so this will become your cost of equity is it clear to you and as i told you calculation of cost of debt is a very simple task simply you take into account the percentage of the debt which is given 10 percent multiplied with one minus tax rate so you will get actually seven percent after having computed a specific cost, that means cost of each element or source of finance. Now, next step is to do your this particular working. That is calculation of weighted average cost of capital. Here, as far as your sources of capital are concerned, first of all, write equity. And in order to write equity, simply add equity share capital and reserve in surplus. So, combinedly, it will be equal to 7,50,000. Note down your debenture, 10 lakh. So, your total capital employed is 17,50,000. Now, specific cost of equity, you just computed 17.5%, 7% is cost of debt. So, now you multiply 17.5% with 7,50 to get what we call this figure. Is it clear to you? Actually, I have, I think it is, these figures are in thousands. Let me check it up because 17.5% of 7,50, 7,50,000, just wait, into 17.50. That is equal to, I think this figure, some mistake is created over here because 7,50,000 into 17.5% is something else. 7,50,000 into 17.50%. I think some mistake has been created here. Kindly write here 131, 131,250. 131,250. And then I will write here 10,00,000 into 7%. That will be equal to 70,000. Actually, sometime 
what we do, we simply actually do the copy paste of earlier question and we forget to write print here the new figures. So that is why such sort of mistake creep in. Anyway, 131250 and 70,000. Now I will add it. So 131250 plus 70,000. So that will be equal to 201 201250. This is my total cost of capital. In order to compute the weighted average cost of capital, what I need to do now, 2,1250, this is your total cost, divided by your capital employed, that is equal to 17,50,000, and then you are going to multiply it with 100. Let me check actually what exactly is this figure, divided by 17,50,000, 17,50,000. Percentage. The percentage is 11.5%. That is correct. Is it clear to you? Percentage is correct. 11.5%. So some printing mistake was there. So in your notes, because I must have revised this figure. So in your notes, the figures will be given in correct manner. Don't worry about that. So 11.5%. So it is not a very tough task. Only thing is that first you will have to actually note down the sources. Their total will be your total capital employed. Note down the specific cost. Multiply it. Total them up. Divided by total capital employed to get your weighted average cost of capital. Now, final step is to determine the economic value added. <coughs> In order to determine the <coughs> economic value added, First of all, I will have to note down the EBIT, which is given in the question as 350,000. Yes, it is 350,000 given in the question. And then I will have to compute. See, remember one thing, because sometimes what happens in the examination, because we have to do lots of subjects. So it is not possible and we cannot expect the student fraternity to be very deft in every area. So that in the heat of examination, sometimes we tend to forget some even minute and basic things. So that's the reason actually what you need to take into account. Kindly stress. I know where the mistakes actually are committed. That is the reason actually I'm cautioning you. I have seen most of the time a student commit mistake over here. In the heat of anxiety, they simply subtract what we call interest net of tax. Don't do that. Here you will have to subtract total interest. Now your debentures were 10 lakh and 10% was the rate, so gross interest will be 1 lakh. After subtracting the gross interest, you will get earning before tax, EBT. Now you subtract the amount of tax. Now because your earning before tax is equal to 2 lakh 50,000, multiply tax rate on 2 lakh 50 to get 75,000, so your profit after tax is 1 lakh 75,000. Once you have determined the profit after tax, here again, time and again I am costing you, you will have to add back interest. But you will have to add back interest at net of tax rate. That means not 1 lakh, but only 70,000 you will add. So this figure, this is the most important figure, no bet. Net operating profit after tax. Is it clear to you? Now all you have to do, simply subtract the cost of capital. Honestly speaking, you have already computed your cost of capital. This is 201250, you have already computed. But still if you want to show, you can show it this way, your total capital employed 17 lakh 50, a weighted average cost of capital 11.5%, 11, 11 so 201250 zero will become your what we call uh, total cost of capital and difference will be your economic value added. You must have noticed it is not a very tough nut to crack. We take yet another question just to equip you a little bit better in a, and you know we are simply not doing revision for the sake of revision. I want you to have a sort of feeling as if you have done the entire chapter as you, mo as you do most of the time in your regular classes. The following information is available of a concern. And we have to compute the economic value added. This time we are being given debt. And this time amount of debt. First of all, note down the percentage that is 12%. And amount is obviously 2000 crore, which you will have to note down. Equity capital, 500 crores. Reserve in surplus is also given. So total 7500. And here the questioner is very generous. He has also given you the total also. So total of all this will be known as capital employed. That is 10,000 crores. Now you must have noticed in this particular question and why I'm doing this particular question. We are being given risk-free rate. Further, we are given beta rate, correct? And then we are being given market rate of return. I just told you a moment ago, market rate of return basically stands for long run market rate of return, correct? And here we are given equity market risk premium. Coming back just to come back over this particular point when I was explaining this particular point I told you actually formula is risk free rate plus beta rate and multiply it with what we call long run market rate and risk free rate and actually the difference between the market rate and risk free rate is nothing but your equity market risk free rate 
is an equity market risk premium. Is it clear to you? It is known as equity market risk premium. Now, indirectly in this particular question, you are being given equity market risk premium. Now, equity market risk premium is nothing but market rate of return minus, as I told you, risk-free rate, risk-free rate. Now, if you will see here, your risk-free rate is 9%, risk-free rate is 9%, and market rate is 19%, 19% market rate. So difference of these two will be 10%. So 10% is your equity market rate of rate which is given to you as 10%. Is it clear to you or not? So you must understand this particular point also if you have understood the formula. Here you will have to do a little bit of what we call working. So now operating profit after tax is given to you. Now in this question, you are already given operating profit after tax because that is exactly what we need. Operating profit after tax is given to us. That means in this particular question, all I need to do is to find out the weighted average cost of capital because no pet is given. Operating profit after tax is nothing but your net operating profit after tax. Correct? That is no pet is already given to you. So, in order to do that, first of all, calculation of cost of equity. Obviously, I need not require to tell you in this particular case, you will have to apply this formula, risk-free rate plus beta factor. Correct? Beta factor is a market index rate. Correct? And it actually, it is very tough to explain it at this level because generally you study it under portfolio management. Correct? Which is not a part of your syllabus. But anyway, you simply take beta factor and we have to multiply it with difference between the long run market rate and risk free rate and the difference of market rate and risk free rate is also known as equity risk premium equity risk premium is it clear to you now in this question risk free rate is given clearly beta rate 1.05 is given and here i would like to just stress one point sometime to confuse you in the examination they will tell you beta rates of last five years six years seven years something like that Whatever beta rate, beta rate is there of last year, correct? Suppose seven years beta rate is given. You pick up the latest one only. Is it clear to you? If ever it is given in the question, just to caution, caution you. Because we want to be prepare for every eventuality which we may have to face in the examination. So at that time, we should not be at a doldrum and indeliment at which rate we need to actually pick up. You have to pick up the latest one. Is it clear? So in this particular case, 9% is your risk free rate and obviously beta factor is 1.05. And then in this question, risk free rate, sorry, market rate is this one and 9% is this one or you can directly, you could have taken 10%. Anyway, now you will have to solve it. Obviously, in order to solve it, first of all, how I'm going to solve? I will subtract 9% from 19%, 10%. Then I will multiply it with 1.05. I will get 10.05%. And then... <coughs> Here, actually, it is 9%. These are the printing mistakes. So, 9% plus 10.5% will be equal to 19.50%. Is it clear to you or not? So, this is another point. And now, in order to compute the de cost of debts, actually, to compute the cost of debt is very simple, but just to acquaint you how you can com how you can compute in this manner also, interest less tax on interest. Now, total interest is 12% of 2000. <clears throat> Correct? Because amount of debt was 2000 crores. So, 12% of 2000 is total interest. And then, and if I'm going to compute 12% of 2000, then I will subtract what we call 30% of 12% of 2000. That means I'm going to take into account my total interest 12% of 2000 will be equal to 240. And then I will subtract what we call interest and interest rate in this case is given as 30%. I think so, 30%. So you will subtract 30%. Let me check this 30% is correctly subtracted or not because the staff has committed a little bit of printing mistake over there. 30% is coming to 72 and minus 240. That is 168. So it's fine. It's okay. <coughs> so 30%. So 240 less 30% of 240, 168. And now you will have to divide it by what we call total value of total value of debt. That is equal to 2000. Multiply it with 100 to get 8.40. This is one way of computing. 
or another way of computing is you simply take the percentage of the debt that is 12 percent and multiply it with one minus tax rate it is easier tax rate is 30 percent so you have to multiply 12 percent with what we call 0 0.70 ultimately you will get 8.40 percent directly you could have actually applied this also correct this is shorter method or if you want to use this it is entirely your prerogative <clears throat> So once you have determined the specific cost, cost of equity and cost of debt, now the next step is to find out your weighted average cost of capital. In order to determine the weighted average cost of capital, what you need to do, first of all, write the total amount of equity, that is equity share capital plus reserve. So total amount of equity, equity share capital plus reserve is equal to 8,000 and debenture is equal to 2,000, total capital employed 10,000 and you have just computed the specific cost now, a specific cost which you just computed was 19.50, 19.50, 19.50. It seems staff actually has done the work very fast and lots of printing mistakes were there. 19.50 percent, I will multiply it, figure is correct, 1560. <coughs> anyway, if there will be mistake that will be brought to your your account don't worry about that so now debenture amount is 2000 into 8.40 percent 168 is the total cost so your total cost ultimately is 1728 but it's still in the examination you have to reflect the weighted average cost of capital as you know weighted average cost of capital is generally denoted by ko so 1728 total cost divided by total capital 17.28 percent now in this question <coughs> For computing economic value added, added, I need not require what we call earning before interest and tax. That means I need not require to do this process because I have already in this particular question, I have this figure of 2100. Is it clear to you? Because we are having this figure of 2100, now we will subtract the cost of capital 1728, which, which we just computed. So 372 will be your economic value added. Now, once you have computed the economic value added, obviously, if it is positive, indirectly, it means this entity has added to the wealth of the shareholders. Correct. Now, we pick up a question which came in the examination. And is, as I told you, your institute escapes off liability by simply giving you the net answers. And I was the only faculty I need not require to actually mention it time and again, actually, who gave you the very complete comprehensive solutions. And the name of the company itself is very interesting. Karai Patta Tulsi Limited. It seems actually institute is very caring for you. You keep on telling institute is not caring. Institute is very caring. They are telling you use Karai Patta Tulsi. Very good for health. Anyway, Karai Patta Tulsi Limited provides you the following data to calculate the economic value added. Now, institute has given you following data. But everything is missing in the question. Equity share capital 10 figure is missing. Correct. 15% preference share capital is given. No amount is given to you. Correct. Hide and seek game is being played by the institute with you. Reserve and surplus. Oh, thanks God. Figure given. 50 crores. All figures are in crores. 15% debenture. Once again, we are very thankful to the institute. At least 800 crores. This figure is given. However, institute is generous enough to tell you that debt equity ratio and institute has also given in the examination that debt equity ratio you will calculate by using this formula long term debts divided by shareholders fund shareholders fund stands for equity as you know it is given in the question 2 is to 1 further in this particular question capital gearing ratio is also given and how capital gearing ratio should be applied by the student correct for solving this question institute is generous enough to tell you that you although we know that capital bearing formula is funds bearing fixed payment funds bearing fixed payment correct i will ask you that uh, uh, and funds bearing interest divided by equity shareholders fund that mean equity and this is also given to you as three is to one now this question when it struck in the examination many students felt as if they were tortured to the hilt quite obviously correct correct no one expected that this sort of question could strike in the examination because this question is not only testing your knowledge of what we call accounts, economic value added, but they are testing you once again how you have retained your knowledge of your earlier phases of education. That means, why I am say saying so? Because generally financial leverage, if I am not wrong, you study in your financial management. So financial leverage was also given in the question, tax rate and market rate of return and equity market risk premium. Time and again I have been telling 
what we mean by equity market risk premium actually equity market risk premium is difference between market rate of interest and risk free rate risk free rate is it clear to you so if you will take the difference of these two because we know that equity market is it flashing on your skin or not equity market risk premium is difference of these two equity market risk premium is market rate of return minus what we call a uh, risk free rate now because equity market risk premium 9% is given in the question and market rate of return is 15.5% so i can find out in this question what will be the figure of risk free rate so the difference will be equal to 6.5% if i am not wrong correct 6.5% will be your risk free rate so in this question risk free rate was not given so you extracted this figure because you are aware of this particular fact that equity market risk premium is nothing but it is the difference between market rate of return and as i have been telling you time and again and risk free rate now as i was telling you earlier in this question to confuse you beta rate for last 5 years is given and which one is the latest one you will ignore the earlier one you will simply take the last year beta rate which happens to be 1 is to 1 is it clear to you or not so all in all quite obviously this question is struck in the examination i do not i don't remember exactly but i think it came uh, it uh, came for i think near about 14 marks or something like that pretty long question correct but anyway those who had subscribed to our courses this question almost a question similar to this one was present over there already so they didn't feel any difficulty even though most of the student in spite of that felt little bit uh, problem little bit uncomfortability for solving this particular question anyway now if suppose such a question strikes in the examination the first thing which we feel actually how to begin the question and from where to begin the question because we have learned only two things so far in the session we have to note down the sources well we can note down that it is equity share capital there is preference share capital there is reserve there is 12 percent debentures and we know nothing besides that correct now coming over to that we have to find after that generally what we are supposed to do we have to find out the cost of the equity now problem is that how to find the cost of the equity when equity is missing in the question correct Although preference share capital cost will be considered as 15% and cost of debt we can also find because tax rate is given. So no problem. And in order to determine the cost of the equity, we will have to use this particular formula, which we used in the last question. But the point is that before computing this time cost of equity, we need to find out the what we call equity. That is the only problem. So how to actually begin this particular question? When you will look into the question, you will get a clue that in this question debt equity ratio is given so this should be your starting point correct so first of all it is given in the question debt equity ratio debt divided by equity of obviously is debt equity ratio and in the question it is given two is to one two is to one it is given in the question and thankfully in the question we have the amount of debt so i will simply write in front of debt 800 so what will be the amount of equity if debt equity ratio is 2 is to 1? Quite obviously half of this, that is 400, the figure which is written in red. Is it clear to you? This is the figure you have now extracted. That means now you have at your disposal equity. Equity means equity share capital plus reserve and surplus. So now you have at this figure at your disposal. So you have determined the amount of what we call equity shareholders fund or reserve or equity. Is it clear to you? Next point in this particular question is given to you is with respect to capital gearing ratio now capital gearing ratio in the question is being given to you as funds bearing fixed payments first of all you need to understand what we mean by funds bearing fixed payments you have studied that in your financial management funds bearing fixed payments could you give me some example which are the funds or sources of finance which an entity raises and on which entity has to pay a fixed rate of payment funds bearing fixed payments as we know preference share capital carries a fixed rate of dividend correct so preference share capital is one such type of fund which entity raises where entity has to make payment regularly at a fixed rate 
And similarly, any long-term loan, here in this particular question, debentures are also given. Are you getting my point or not? At this moment, we are not having the amount of preference share capital. At this moment, we are not having the amount of preference share capital, but we do have the amount of debentures. Their total will be considered as total of funds bearing fixed payments. Are you getting my point or not? I hope I am clear to you, each one of you, till up to at least this particular point. So first of all, you need to understand carefully which are the sources of finance or funds which carry fixed rate of payment. Equity shareholder never carry fixed rate of what we call payment, as you know. So preference share capital and debenture holders carry fixed rate of payment. And in this particular question, amount of debenture is 800. So capital gearing ratio, which shows the relationship between funds bearing fixed payment and equity shareholders fund. So first of all, what I do, I simply put the formula over here. Capital gearing ratio is equity shareholders fund. Actually, it, it should be funds bearing payment divided by equity shareholders fund. Because although in practical life, numerator, denom denominator can be exchanged. But what is given in the question, you have to write it as it is. Is it clear to you? So first you write funds bearing interest and then divide it by equity share capital. Equity shareholders fund. Okay, funds bearing because this way in the examination it was given. So you will carry the same what we call figures, uh, same wordings. Funds bearing fixed payment divided by equity shareholders fund. So first you will write fixed interest bearing because it is written first and it is written second. So fixed interest bearing funds divided by equity shareholder fund and question has also stated the ratio 3 is to 1. That means if your equity shareholder is 1, total of funds which carry fixed payment is 3 times. Is it clear to you? That is what we mean by actually this ratio. 3 is to 1. That means whatever my equity shareholder fund is there three times are what we call your total of fixed bearing funds now in this question you have through step number one determine the amount of equity that is equity shareholders fund multiply it with three to get this figure that mean now you have determined total of total of funds which are carrying fixed what we call payments so total of the funds is 1200 so that means now you have determined this figure because which was missing. So now you know that you have preference share capital of 400. That means in this particular question, you have extracted equity. You have, you have got the preference share capital. You have got the debentures. So that means all the sources of finance are now at your disposal. Is it clear to you? I have also written here fixed interest bearing funds 1200 and debt is 800 so quite obviously your preference share capital will be equal to 400. Now at least you are in a position to compute the weighted average cost of capital isn't it or not. So your equity amount is actually 400 and preference share capital you just determined and total amount is equal to this much and respective cost you just computed cost of equity we have computed cost of equity or not so far. So far we haven't computed but I have shown you here. In order to determine the cost of equity, see here, first of all take the risk-free rate. Remember in this question risk-free rate was not given. So I have given here equity risk premium is market rate less risk-free rate. In the question equity market risk premium is given market rate is given so this figure which i have written in bold now you have extracted it so your risk free rate is 6.5 percent so now you are in a position to find out cost of equity so risk free rate is 6.5 beta factor the latest one is 1.1 and market rate is 15.5 and risk free rate is 6.5 so you will determine what we call your cost of equity as 16.4 preference share capital cost we need not require to do anything so their rate of dividend itself will become the cost and debenture you can easily actually find the cost 12 percent into 1 minus 3 is it clear to you so your total amount is 1600 and total cost of capital is 197.60 this is your cost of capital now after this we have to find out economic value added but problem is that in this particular question we are not having a figure of ebit earning before interest and tax or for that instance we are not even having a figure of profit after tax this is the problem in this particular question so what you are supposed to do in in this particular question see here 
in this particular question it is written you are given actually financial leverage correct and you know better than i actually financial leverage is profit before interest and tax divided by profit before tax i hope i am correct correct profit before interest and tax divided by pbt now i can write this figure because we have financial leverage 1.32 it is given in the question now profit before interest and tax divided by pbt i have simply substituted the figure now what i have done kindly pay attention financial leverage is given to you profit before interest and tax in short form can be written as pbit is it clear to you now you tell me this is profit before tax profit before tax so profit before tax basically means this is the profit after subtracting interest isn't it or not so this figure pbt can be written also as pbit minus i it can be written this way because profit before pbi pbt stands for profit before tax is it clear to you and if i'm subtracting again what we call interest it will become pbt that mean pbt can be written this way or not first of all let me know pbt is nothing but profit before interest and tax less interest so it will become profit before tax so that mean you will have to learn this art in order to solve this question you will have to write this figure in this manner is it clear to you now i will tell you why 1.32 is your financial leverage profit before interest and tax we are not given so pbit we will write as it is but we know the amount of interest how we know the amount of interest because your total amount of debts given in the question were 800 correct and rate of interest uh, rate of interest is 12% so 12% of 800 will be equal to 96 correct so now you have this particular figure now what you have to do multiply this denominator with this one so ultimately you will get 1.32 into pbit minus 96 which is equal to pbit now you can solve this so ultimately you will get 396 now what is this 396 obviously pbit because pbit was the missing figure so profit before interest in tax is 396 first i will subtract the interest i will get the profit before tax i will subtract the tax now i will get profit after tax profit after tax is this this much now i will have to take care i will have to add the interest but on net basis so 96 is the amount of interest and 25% is 25% is the rate of tax in this question so 25% of 96 you subtract from 96 to get 72 by adding 225 and 72 you will get 297 so ultimately your net operating profit after tax will be equal to 297 and cost of capital is 197.60 and finally your economic value added will be equal to this much is it clear to you as you know simultaneously we are also solving the questions which have struck in the recent examination that been the latest one june 24 so we are also picking that up correct so to finish up in fact now you should be in a position to do this question remember one thing i told you in my earlier phases of revisionary session i think this is the 12th session correct in your earlier phases of uh, sessions i have already told you that sometime when a question of tougher nature appears in the examiner and suddenly they find that a student have committed lots of mistake in this question such question get repeated in the examination and best example is this one same question has appeared in june 24 examination soro limited provides you with the following data based upon which you are required to compute the value added although this question is slightly easier than the one which is given what we call earlier correct here you are being given equity share capital 42 crore share of rupees 10 each this figure is not missing and here in this question it is given 15% preference share capital is also given as 2140 besides you are being given 15% debenture 1120 income tax rate is also given 30% beta rate is given 1.5 market rate of return is also given equity market risk premium this will help you to determine the risk free rate correct uh, 
and once again your risk free rate will be equal to 6.5 only thing is that you should be aware of this particular fact that equity risk premium is difference between market rate of return and risk free rate and accordingly you can find the risk free rate once again financial leverage is given that mean once again you will have to find out the pbt and to confuse you it is also given land and building as investment we are least concerned with this particular figure correct equity market risk premium market rate minus risk free rate market rate is given and uh, actually equity risk rate is given market rate is 15.5% difference will come 6.5% so first of all you can determine the what we call cost of equity as follows correct cost of debt also you can find out no problem cost of preference share capital is also not a big problem only thing is that you have to find out in this particular case what we call profit before tax similar is the approach which you will have to apply first write the financial leverage correct and then break this denominator figure pbt as i told you earlier correct profit before interest and tax is profit pbit in short form and profit before tax now i have written in this manner pbit minus tax this helps me in actually solving this equation correct and your interest will be 168 that is percentage of debenture is given amount of debenture is given you will get total interest of 168 when you will solve it you will get pbit 504 and once you have determined pbt as 504 then rest of the process you can easily do here i have done the computation of economic value added so you will not confront any problem i know now besides that in this session i will talk a little bit about market value added correct market value added also what exactly is the concept of market value added i have already told you of late several new concepts are cropping up this is yet another way of measuring the what we call value which is being added by the entity to the shareholders wealth is it clear to you if the entity is having a positive market value we always presume that entity is actually benefiting the shareholders correct so this question came in june 23 examination i will simply tell you first of all we need to understand what is the market value the market value added in order to determine the market value added what you have to do you will take into account the book value of your share cap of your capital employed correct book value means the amount which you have written in the books then you will take current market value of those item that mean current value of your capital employed so market value added will be positive only if your current market value of your capital employed would exceed the book value of your capital employed then we would say that you have added to the wealth of the shareholders is it clear to you in other words you have created the value so in order to determine this giloe tulsi limited has the following capital structure on 31st of 3 2023 various sources of finance have been given to us equity share capital rupees 300 crore 15% convertible preference shares we are given 15% secure debentures of 100 each we are given 800 crore a retained earnings also given 300 crores obviously if i am going to total it up this total will give me book value of my capital employed basically what i am interested in i am interested in determining my what we call market value of capital employed correct in order to determine the market value of your capital employed something else will be given in the question generally the current market prices for example in this question you are being given currently quoted market price in stock exchange currently the market price of equity share is 10 60 sorry although the face value of your share is 10 but actually market value is 60 preference share is having a book value of 100 you can see here face value is 100 but its market price is preference share capital right now is having a market price of 90 whereas debenture is having a face value of 100 but its market price is 95 accordingly now you can easily determine the market value how you can find out for example in order to determine the market value added first of all i will take into account the market value of respective item for example equity share capital see here all figures are in crores correct my total equity share capital at this moment is 30 crore first of all you separately compute the number of share your total number of share will be equal to 30 crores 300 crore divided by 10 correct if i am having 30 crores of share 
obviously their book value will be 30 into 10 that is 300 crore but their market value will be 30 into 60 that is why i have written here 1800 and similar is the situation with respect to preference share capital. Preference share capital is given as 100, as 100 crore. And divided by face value, that means you have got 1 crore preference share capital. Now, 1 crore is the number of preference share capital multiplied with 90. So, the market value of preference share capital is 90. Similarly, you will compute the number of debentures, multiply it with their market value. So, you can get the total value. Only area is that while computing, while computing current market value added, never ever take retained earnings. Reserve and surplus will not be taken into account to determine the market value. So market value will be equal to 2650. This is the point which you need to take care of. And then book value, you will have to add all the sources of finance, including reserve and surplus 1500. So your market value is 1150. Is it clear to you? So this is how you have to do so, and besides that, some of your test is also given. You must attempt this test. And this is the question which struck in your latest examination. It is almost similar to the one which we did. So, on this count, we have comprehensively, I hope so you would agree to me, agree to it, that we have covered your market value added and what we call your, obviously, economic value added. So, what about the chances? Definitely, you are getting, you are going to get a question from this particular chapter also because you are getting lots of questions. So, obviously, almost they are going to cover every chapter. So needless to add that. So, hope so that it must have come up to your expectations as always. On that count, we take leave of you uh, and it's time to say then good night. <laughs>